Her name was Claire Smith. She had the prettiest blue eyes in addition to a very nice smile. We had matched the night before on Tinder, and after talking for a while, we decided to go on a date. It was a great restaurant, and I arrived early. I waited for about 30 minutes before she finally got there, and as she walked up to me, I smiled because she looked exactly like her pictures. I had always been wary about first dates, as I had been a victim of catfishing numerous times in the past, so I was usually relieved when my date looked like the person they were claiming to be in real life. When she finally arrived at our table, we exchanged pleasantries before we ordered what to eat. We spoke extensively as the date went on, and as she told me about her hobbies, her likes and dislikes, and her plans for the future. I really enjoyed the date and her company, but after a while, I realized that there was something off about her. She had a very strange aura as I could tell by her facial expressions that she wasn't really comfortable. It looked like she was worried about something. After a while, I decided to ignore it because apart from those little strange details, she seemed like a really nice person. The date eventually came to an end and as I made preparations to leave, Claire looked at me and said, hey, this was really great. I really enjoyed it myself and I actually don't want it to end. I hope this isn't too forward, but I would love if we continued this date at my apartment. Now, this was a bit strange to me as most people normally waited till after the second date or third date before inviting someone over. But even then, I still wanted to accept the invitation as I really enjoyed the date too. So I agreed and we made our way to her apartment. When we arrived, she offered me a seat before she asked the question, do you drink? So I replied with, yes, I do. I then saw her smile as she said, that's great. Wait here while I go whip up something really nice for us to drink. As she left for the kitchen, I found myself taking in my surroundings. She had a really nice apartment and nothing seemed out of place. I waited in the living room for a while as she took her time in the kitchen. I could hear her making the drinks from where I was sitting and after a while, she came out with a homemade cocktail and two glasses. She poured out two drinks before handing me one. And as I took the drink from her, Claire looked at me with a smile and said, Now before you try the drink, I'd like if you could, truthfully, tell me what you really think about it. I found her statement a bit odd as she was now looking at me with so much excitement. I was a bit confused, but I didn't want to seem rude as I knew she put a lot of effort into making it. So I smiled and took a sip of the cocktail. It tasted amazing as I found myself drinking the whole thing. When I was done, I looked at her and said, Wow, that was delicious. Did you actually make this cocktail by yourself? Claire then smiled and said, Yes, I did. I'm in my final college year, but I bartend on the side. So I always like creating delicious cocktails in my free time and getting people's thoughts on them. As she said that, I finally realized why she was so enthusiastic about me tasting the cocktail. After that, I had a couple more glasses as we continued talking into the night. After a while, Claire looked at me and said, I'm really glad this is going well. I don't know if you noticed, but I'm not really good at this online dating stuff. I've been told I put off a really weird aura because I get really anxious and nervous on every first date. Most of the time, I don't know what to do, so I'm really glad I didn't scare you off. I remember letting out a small chuckle as I replied with, I won't lie, I actually noticed that, but I like you too much to care. Claire then smiled as she reached out and gave me a kiss. After that, Claire got up to get more of her homemade cocktail in the kitchen, but I couldn't take it anymore. I knew I had to do it, as it was now or never. So I reached for one of the glass bottles that were on the table, and I broke off its base. Shocked, Claire turned around to see what happened, and I started to apologize as I explained it was an accident. But as she bent down to pick up the broken glass shards, I used the head of the now broken bottle to stab her in the gut. She started to scream, so I immediately forced my hands over her mouth to stop her scream. And as she bled out, I calmly whispered in her ear. When I was a boy, Claire, my father used to take me hunting. We mostly hunted the game in the forest, animals like deers and rabbits. And even though I thoroughly enjoyed it, I've always wanted more. So, when I was 14, 
I decided to hunt something better. I waited for a particular woman who used to hike in our forest every morning. And during her hike that morning, I shot and killed her. Claire started struggling and screaming now, but I held her down as I continued with. That was the beginning of something really beautiful in my life, Claire. And I wanted more of it, so I kept hunting down women. I moved to the city to get my hands on more game, and after a while, I realized something amazing. In this modern world, hunting animals like you has never been easier. Because dating platforms like Tinder do all the work as they bring my prey right to me. I then removed my hands from her mouth as I threw her body to the floor. She had lost a lot of blood now, so her screams weren't as loud anymore. I then looked at her and said, I consider myself a modern hunter, Claire, and you should be grateful because you have the pleasure of seeing me. Women like you are so desperate for love, and I know you to do anything to get it. That alone makes people like you my perfect target. I mean, it only took a pretty face like mine to get you to invite a stranger into your home. I then watched as she tried to crawl towards the door before continuing with. But you know the best thing about hunting, Claire? It's the look of despair in your victim's eyes as they try to get away from you. That, my dear Claire, is the thrill of hunting. Looking on as your game puts up a futile struggle before you take that hope away by slowly putting them out of their misery. And with that, I repeatedly stabbed her with the broken bottle. She struggled, but it didn't take long before she was dead. When I was done having my fun, I calmly went outside to get the tools from my car. I then went back into Claire's apartment and I got to work. I put on my gloves and I cleaned up the place with bleach. I carried her bloody corpse and I put it in the bathtub that I had already filled with high-grade acid. The apartment now looked cleaner than ever, and the carcass was safely locked away in the bathtub. It'd take a couple of days before her remains are found, and I'd be long gone by then. So with a smile on my face, I made my way out of the apartment, and I congratulated myself on another successful hunt. That night after dinner, I found myself using the Tinder app again, it didn't take long before I had quickly matched with another woman. She was called Abigail Dawson. She had beautiful brown eyes and amazing black hair. She lived in Los Angeles. And as we started texting, I began to smile as I said to myself, let the hunt begin. I am a travel writer. My job is to visit places and write articles about them. The website I worked for often paid for my accommodation. Needless to say, I, <laughs> I loved my job. Being a single man in his late thirties, I was living a life full of adventures. But this one incident changed everything. A few years back, I, uh, I went to visit a place named Crooked County. It was a small countryside town in Arizona. Road trips have always been my favorite. So I, I packed my bags and got onto the road. The refreshing country air accompanied by vast green fields drove all my stress away. My accommodation was done in the town motel, which happened to be the only stay for outsiders. After five hours of driving, I, I was exhausted. As I reached the motel and got inside, I, I saw a young boy standing at the counter, talking to a woman in her late forties. I walked to the counter and introduced myself. The old woman looked at me with a smiling face and said, Welcome, Mr. Astor. I am Mrs. Jammy Fright, the owner of the hotel. We have arranged room number 204 for your stay. I smiled back and said, Thank you. Please, call me David. She smiled again and told the young boy, Ted, take David to his room. I realized Ted is her helper. The motel seemed old, but its decoration appeared new to me. It feels like the place has been renovated recently. I looked at Ted and asked, Has this place been renovated recently? Ted said, Yes, sir. After the death of our previous owner, Mrs. Fright bought this motel at an auction. She did all the renovation. I nodded and said, So, 
How many guests are living here right now? Ted replied. There are four people, including you, sir, Dr. John Wayne, and Mrs. Cooper with her ten-year-old son. Ted opened the door of room 204. It was a mid-sized comfy bedroom with a large window giving a view of the vast green fields nearby. I unpacked my luggage and went for a shower. It was close to dinner time, so I, I got ready to go for dinner. <laughs> I was hungry, too. I was just about to step out of my room when I heard a small group of people talking. I opened the door and saw a man with a stethoscope on his neck sprinting towards the end of the hallway. He almost rushed towards the room on the left at the end of the corridor. I saw Ted coming in the same direction with a fearful face. I stopped him and asked, What happened, Ted? What's going on? Ted replied in a shaken voice, Our gardener, Boris, has been found dead in his room. I was beyond shocked. There have been only a few hours I reached here and all of a sudden someone died? I followed Ted to Boris's room. I saw Mrs. Fright sitting on a chair and weeping in a low voice. The man with the stethoscope was probably Dr. John Wayne. He was checking the man lying on the bed. Another woman was standing next to Mrs. Wright and trying to console him. I guessed her to be Mrs. Cooper. After inspecting the man on the bed for a few minutes more, Dr. Wayne looked at Ted and said, I will write a death certificate so that you can conduct the necessary rituals. Mrs. Fright started to cry loudly now. The most terrifying thing was Boris's face. His eyes were wide open, filled with fear. It felt like he saw something horrible before his death. His face was pale and his entire body seemed bloodless. There were so many questions going through my mind right then. What happened to Boris? How did he die? I looked at Boris once again. His body seemed really pale and bloodless. Dr. Wayne came to me and said, You must be the travel writer. Ted told me about you. I am Dr. Wayne. This is really an unfortunate incident. I shook hands with him and then said, If you don't mind me asking, what exactly happened with Boris? I mean, how did he die? Dr. Wayne replied, His death seems really mysterious to me, too. I mean, I knew he was suffering from acute anemia. I actually came to know about it when I came here two days earlier. Each day I saw him going pale. The weird thing is, he often woke up not remembering last night, uh, as if he was having some short-term memory loss, too. Mrs. Freud got up and said, I will call the town sheriff. He should be involved in all this. After all, he died in my motel. She then left the room sobbing like before, and Mrs. Cooper went with her. The local sheriff came and did a routine inquiry. The sheriff talked to Dr. Wayne about Boris's health condition and death. I was sitting in the lounge near a small wooden table. Ted brought me a cup of tea and placed it in front of me. I could tell from his face that he, he was equally shocked and terrified. I said, Ted, are you okay? Ted replied, I'm sorry, sir. I just can't get the picture out of my mind. I went to call him like every other morning. He was a bit sick since last week, but I never thought he would actually die. Mrs. Cooper came to us and looked at Ted with unhappy eyes. She said, What happened at the motel is enough to scare my little son. Can we all just stop talking about Boris's death out loud like this? If Willie hears it, he will start asking me questions again. I was a bit disgusted with Mrs. Cooper's words, but I let them slide. After all, she was worried for her little son. Ted got back to work immediately, and Mrs. Cooper gave me an annoyed look and left too. After finishing my morning tea, I decided to go for a walk. I saw Dr. Wayne standing on the porch and smoking his pipe. I went to him and asked if he'd like to join me. He happily agreed. After all, we were shocked by this incident. We started to walk following the rusty road lying ahead of the motel. The motel was supposedly at the end of the town. I tried to make casual conversation to lighten up the mood, but I couldn't help but notice Dr. Wayne's doubtful face. I said in a hesitant voice, Is there something bothering you, doctor? He suddenly looked at me with a surprised face as if I'd read his mind. Then he said in a shaken voice, Something is not adding up, David. 
I am a doctor. I can tell the difference between natural death and unnatural death. Boris's death is not making any sense to me. I replied in a confused voice. Everyone said he had anemia. Then what is so unnatural? Dr. Wayne replied, Even with acute anemia, it is highly unnatural to die in just two nights, you know. When I came here, Boris was skinny, but perfectly okay to go on for more than a year. Now he suddenly lost all blood in just two days. Then what do you think happened to him? I asked tensely. Dr. Wayne looked around and said in a low voice, I think he was killed. Maybe by an animal or a... I don't know. I was completely shocked. Nothing but the tension came out of my mouth. What? What are you saying, Dr. Wayne? I asked in a shocking voice. Dr. Wayne said, Look, there was something I didn't tell the cops today. When I was checking Boris's pulse, I noticed a wound on his neck. Wound? What kind of wound? I said. There were two small holes on his neck. Looked like a snake bite. Dr. Wayne replied. So, he died of a snake bite. That's nothing strange, I said in a confused voice. Dr. Wayne came closer and said, Oh, God, David, you are not getting it. Those wounds seemed like snake bites, but they were bigger in size. There wasn't any sign of poison in his blood because he had no blood. Honestly, I, I was actually not getting a single word that was coming out of Dr. Wayne's mouth. I took a deep breath and said, I don't understand what you're trying to say. Dr. Wayne paused for some time, then said, David, I don't think Boris's death was a mere accident. Something led him to death. What happened to all the blood in his body? Doesn't it appear suspicious to you? I realize Dr. Wayne got a point. Anemia is a condition in which you lack enough healthy red blood cells to carry adequate oxygen to your body's tissues. In that case, the red blood cells decrease, but a body must have some sort of fluid in its veins, whereas Boris's body was completely dry. Dr. Wayne said, I think this loss of blood happened with time, like something sucked the blood out of him slowly, but not too slow to make him listed as anemic. I laughed this time and said, Dr. Wayne, <laughs> mosquitoes can't do that. Dr. Wayne laughed in a mocking tone and said, I am sure we are dealing with a much bigger animal than mosquitoes, David. We looked at the watch. It was lunchtime already. We decided to head back to the hotel. After reaching near the gates, Dr. Wayne suddenly grasped my hand and said, Please don't mention all this to anyone here. I'm going to find out what happened to Boris very soon. I wasn't going to tell anyone because no one is going to believe it anyway. I was walking down the corridor when I saw Mrs. Fried locking the door of Boris's room. She looked at me and came over to talk to me. I smiled and said, How are you feeling, Mrs. Fright? She smiled with an upset face and said, I am fine. I hope Boris's soul rests in peace. After all, he had no one in this world except us. The more she went on saying how unfortunate this entire incident was, I, I couldn't help but notice her hands. I mean, she's a woman in her late forties, but her hands looked strikingly young. While we were talking, we heard Mrs. Cooper scolding her son. A boy came out of the room, crying. He was ten to twelve years old. The boy ran to Mrs. Fright and said, Please tell Mom. It wasn't a dream. It was real. The boogeyman was real. Dr. Wayne was coming towards us and he overheard the child. He asked, What boogeyman, Robin? The child replied in a sobbing voice, Last night I woke up and saw him standing in my window. His eyes were red and his face was covered with long hair. Dr. Wayne and I immediately exchanged looks. Mrs. Cooper came running and said, Oh, Robin, it was just a dream. Come on, let's go now. Mrs. Fright said, Get him some sleep, Mrs. Cooper. The boy seems really scared. God knows what's happened to my motel. She left towards the dining hall, inviting all of us in for lunch. Mrs. Cooper left with her son, Robin. Dr. Wayne looked at me and said, We have to find the truth. I have a plan. I will tell you after lunch. I went to my room. 
What was Robin talking about? Did he really see a boogeyman last night? Is there any connection between this boogeyman and Boris's sudden death? After lunch, Dr. Wayne and I went to the garden. We could see black clouds crowding in the sky. Suddenly, the atmosphere changed drastically. Dr. Wayne looked at the sky and said, It's going to rain heavily soon. We sat down at the garden table. Robin was sitting on the swing at some distance. Mrs. Cooper was standing beside her son. I lit a cigarette and then looked at Dr. Wayne. What was the plan you were talking about? I asked. Dr. Wayne's face turned serious. He said in a deep voice, According to my theory, a vampire is living in Crooked County. I laughed so hard, saying, Please, enough, Dr. Wayne. What the hell are you saying since this afternoon? There's no such things as vampires. Dr. Wayne looked at me with tensed eyes and said, I can bet my life someone sucked Boris's blood every night and led him to death. Only a vampire can do that, David. There is evil in this town. I can feel it. We were going on with our discussion when a voice came from a close distance. I see you believe in vampires. Do you think they are real? I looked and saw Mrs. Cooper standing in front of us. Dr. Wayne said, I believe there is something evil and ominous about Boris's death. No anemic patient can die like this. She sat close to us. Mrs. Fright came over and said, What are you all talking about? Mrs. Cooper looked at her and said, Mr. Wayne thinks there is something supernatural about Boris's death. Mrs. Fright looked at him with big, surprised eyes and said, Really? Please, tell me why you think that. Did you see something? Dr. Wayne explained everything that he told me so far. Considering the spooky weather, I saw Mrs. Fright's face turning pale in fear. A flash of huge lightning struck the vast field and raindrops started to pour heavily. We all got up and went inside. Mrs. Cooper took Robin and went to their room. Dr. Wayne, Mrs. Fright and I went to the dining hall. There was nothing much to do in this small town. We all sat at the big dining table. Ted came over and poured us three glasses of wine. Dr. Wayne looked at him and asked, Ted, what time did you go to sleep last night? The question came so unexpectedly that Ted fumbled at first. M me? me? Uh, oh, I was... I actually, I, I went to sleep around twelve. Why do you ask, sir? Dr. Wayne replied, Did you see or hear anything unusual last night? Ted replied, N No, sir, n nothing much. Mrs. Fright was quiet all this time. She then looked at Ted and said, Go prepare the dinner now. There is going to be a heavy storm tonight. We spent the entire evening chatting and relaxing in the dining hall. I tried to shift the topic from Boris's death, just to lighten up the air in the room. Mrs. Cooper came and joined us too. After dinner, I bid goodbye to everyone and went to my room. As I lay on my bed, Sleep came to my eyes automatically. Don't exactly remember what time it was, but a crying sound woke me up. I looked at the watch. It was 3 a.m. The cry stopped for a while. Then, suddenly, I heard a loud scream of a child's voice from outside. I ran to the corridor. As soon as I came out, I saw Robin was lying in the corridor, unconscious. I went close to him and lifted him up in my arms. Suddenly, my eyes went on his neck. There were two small holes on his neck. Drops of blood were still on them. Mrs. Cooper came rushing from her room. She screamed, saying, Oh my God! Robin! What happened to my son? Dr. Wayne came running too. We carried Robin to the bed. He slept the entire night. The next morning, we all gathered in the hotel lobby. Mrs. Cooper asked Dr. Wayne, What is happening to my son, Doctor? Robin never leaves the room without asking me. I don't know why he came out in the middle of the night. What's that scar on his neck? Mrs. Fright said in a calm voice, 
Dr. Wayne, please help us. What's happening to my motel? I stood quietly and watched everyone. This time, I was really scared. Dr. Wayne looked at me and then said, Robin lost some blood last night. I don't know what bit him on the neck, but the blood loss took place from that wound for sure. I am going to call a friend of mine, and we will take Robin to the city for his treatment by tomorrow. Let's just all stick through this night, and then we will leave this place. He then looked at Mrs. Fright and said, I am sorry, Mrs. Fright, but I don't think I can offer any help apart from medical governance. Dr. Wayne's behavior felt a little bit weird to me. He was the one talking about the animal attack, mysteries behind Boris's death, and even the vampire thing. Now, suddenly he just wants to escape from here? Everyone went to their room. I went to the garden to smoke a cigarette. Since the moment I've stepped into this county, nothing's going right here. I was feeling messed up. Suddenly a hand touched my shoulder and out of shock I turned back immediately. Dr. Wayne was standing there and gesturing me to keep quiet by putting his finger on his lips. He then told me to follow him without asking any questions. I followed him to the vast field. He stopped and said, David. I need your help to catch this demonic creature. I said, But you just said you won't be... He didn't let me finish, and said, I have set a trap for this demon. I am sure it is hiding among us. My eyes got wider. I said, What? You mean a vampire is living among us? In this very motel? Dr. Wayne said in a low voice, Last night, I thought a lot about Robin's description of the boogeyman. Around midnight, I heard footsteps outside my window. As I peeked outside, I saw a woman moving towards the back of the motel. Her hair was floating in the air. Robin's boogeyman is not a he, but a she. I replied, Then why didn't you say something a few moments back? Dr. Wayne looked towards the setting sun and said, Because this demon was standing among us. Mrs. Cooper took time to come out of her room that night. I am sure she went to wash off the blood from her mouth. I said, What? You think a mother will hurt her own child? Dr. Wayne replied, The day Boris died, she was the only one who felt disgusted about the death. Don't you remember how she told us to drop the matter off? I don't know why, but for a second I couldn't fight any more with Dr. Wayne's logic. Dr. Wayne looked at the motel standing in the distance and said, Tonight, we will sneak into Robin's room and hunt this demon to finish it forever. Be ready after dinner. He then walked away. I stood there alone in the empty field. Mrs. Cooper, is she really a demon? She's the one sucking blood from innocent people? And now she wants to take the life of her own son? Whatever the truth is... I will find it tonight. Today is the day, I said to myself while washing my face in the washroom. Yesterday, Dr. Wayne and I made a plan to catch this demon, or whoever is responsible for the murders happening in this motel of Crooked County. After lunch, I saw Dr. Wayne talking to Mrs. Cooper. I couldn't imagine she is the one doing all this. Suddenly, I heard a voice. You seem worried, David. Is everything all right? Mrs. Fright said to me. I replied hesitantly, Oh, I, yeah, everything's fine. She exhaled a deep breath and said, Everyone is going to leave tomorrow. I'm thinking of selling this place and moving really close to the town. It's probably my time to retire. I asked, How long have you been running this place? Mrs. Fright replied, Well, the owner was an old friend of mine. After he died, I decided to take over his business, but I don't think I can save it anymore. She then got up and left with a sad face. With the sun setting and the darkness taken over, I started to feel even more anxious. Dr. Wayne and I talked for a while and spent the entire evening playing chess in the dining hall. After finishing dinner, everyone went to their room. I saw Mrs. Fright offering a glass of wine to Mrs. Cooper. I said to myself, Tonight, 
your true identity will be revealed, Mrs. Cooper. Around 2 a.m., I heard a soft knock on my door. I was awake, waiting for Dr. Wayne's signal. I came out of the room. Dr. Wayne was standing outside my door, holding a sharp wooden stake in his hand. I didn't say a single word. We tiptoed to Mrs. Cooper's room. Dr. Wayne slowly twisted the key. I knew he took an extra key from the counter secretly. The entire room was dark. The moonlight coming from the window helped us to make our way. Robin was lying next to the window. Mrs. Cooper was not in her bed. Dr. Wayne and I hid behind the closet door and started to wait for the vital moment. A few moments passed, but nothing happened. Suddenly, the big motel clock rang three times. We realized it's 3 a.m. The time has come. Just at that moment, we heard a sound and saw the room window opening on its own. A dark, womanly figure with messy long hair stepped into the room. My heart was beating like a wild horse. Dr. Wayne grasped the stake tightly in his hand. The woman then leaned on Robin's face. But suddenly the bathroom door opened and Mrs. Cooper came out while rubbing her eyes and seeing the vicious creature sitting near her son. She screamed. I ran towards the window without wasting a single second and locked it from the inside. Dr. Wayne jumped from the corner and turned on the light, terrified to our core. We all saw Mrs. Fright standing with a vicious face. Her eyes were red. Freshly drank blood was dripping from her mouth. She tried to attack Mrs. Cooper, but Dr. Wayne stabbed the stake through her heart without giving her a single second. A spine-chilling scream woke everyone up. Robin started to cry out loud. Ted came running too. And in front of all our eyes, we saw Mrs. Fright catching fire and then burning into ashes. I couldn't believe it was Mrs. Fright. She was the vampire of Crooked County. I came back the next day. Dr. Wayne later sent me a letter saying he saw Mrs. Fright putting sleeping pills in Mrs. Cooper's drink that night. She wanted to drug the mother so that she could kill the child and the mother on the same night. She realized it was difficult for her to quench her bloodthirst living in the middle of nowhere. This is why she told me that she's thinking to shift to the town, finally. It would have been way easier to catch prey if she lived in the town. And not just that, Dr. Wayne also told me that the previous owner of this motel also died of anemia. No one knows who this Mrs. Fright is or what her real identity was, but... I still get nightmares that she's standing near my window, staring at me with her red, demonic eyes, while blood drips from her mouth. It happened when I was 17 years old. I didn't have a great family, and almost everything else in life was crappy. My parents fought all the time, and I witnessed screaming matches almost every night. Most times when I had the courage, I would try to butt into their arguments and de-escalate things, but my parents would always reply with, Go to your room, Matt. It didn't take long before they eventually got a divorce, and I was sent to live with my aunt, so I won't see things get ugly. Now, my aunt was a good woman, and I loved living with her, but there was something I enjoyed even more, and that was staying with her old neighbor, Lady Cassie. I know, stereotypically, old people are seen as boring individuals who stay inside knitting all day, but Lady Cassie was very different. She was an agile, interesting woman who was into a lot of things, and since I didn't have anyone my age living around the neighborhood that I could talk to, I always found myself having conversations with Lady Cassie, and talking to her was great. Her house was decorated with skin pelts, as she told me her husband was a dedicated hunter who had hunted every animal known to man. Now, even at a young age, I knew this statement was far-fetched, but I let it slide as her husband was dead and I didn't want to speak ill of the dead. During one of my occasional visits to her place, after we had talked for a while, I asked Lady Cassie if I could go to the bathroom. On my way back to the living room, I noticed a room with its door slightly ajar and I walked in to see something odd. It was filled with what seemed to be skin pelts and, while some were on display decorating the walls of the room, Others were used to design book covers and other things. I then heard the words, They're beautiful, aren't they? And I turned to see Lady Cassie walking into the room. She then continued with, My husband brought them home from a hunting trip. 
and he never told me what animal he got the pelt from. As she spoke, I realized that I, too, couldn't guess what animal it was from, as the look and the texture of the pelt felt different. After looking around for a while, we left the room, and we began to talk about other things, as Lady Cassie always had some great stories to tell. After a long afternoon and numerous interesting conversations, I finally decided to leave. Lady Cassie walked me out of the house, and as we were on her front porch, I noticed a shady, lanky man walking down the street. It was one of our neighbors who everyone called Shady Jeremy, as the man never spoke. He also had a really scary aura around him that made people generally avoid him. Lady Cassie noticed me looking at the man, so she said, Stay away from that man, Matt. Some neighbors are meant to be avoided. I then quickly replied with, You don't need to tell me twice. After that, I said my goodbyes, and I quickly headed home. It was a bit strange, but when I arrived at my doorstep, I could feel someone staring at me. My eyes started to dart around, and it didn't take long before I noticed Shady Jeremy standing on his front porch and staring at me intensely. It seemed like his eyes were trying to tell me something, but I wasn't waiting to find out. Scared now, I rushed into my aunt's house and locked the door. It was really difficult to sleep that night as all I could see was Shady Jeremy staring at me every time I closed my eyes. The next day, my aunt told me that I would be going back to the city during the following week to stay with my mom, as things had finally settled down between her and my dad. She then told me to get my things in order, as I'd be leaving soon. That afternoon, I went to Lady Cassie's house to tell her the news. She wasn't in her living room, but I could tell she was still at home as her front door was open, so I let myself in. When I had finally settled down, I noticed a diary that was decorated with a special pelt I had seen in that room. It was sitting on the table next to me, so I picked it up and started to admire it. Curious, I opened the book to read what was inside, but that's when I heard Lady Cassie say, Each pelt is more beautiful than the last. I really need to collect more. Confused, I wondered what she meant by that, as I knew she couldn't get any new pelts without her husband. But I quickly ignored it as I told myself that it was probably just an old lady mumbling to herself. Besides... I was there for another reason, as I came to tell her I was leaving soon. The look on her face was a mixture of sadness and disappointment, as Lady Cassie said. That's very sad to hear, Matt. You're the only person here who's nice enough to visit and talk to me. I hope this isn't too much to ask, but I'd love it if you could come over tonight so that we can have one of our amazing conversations just one last time. I immediately agreed as I wanted to see her one last time before I left. On my way home, I didn't realize it yet, but the news of my leaving made me forget about the shady Jeremy incident that had happened the day before. I had started walking with caution ever since it happened, but at that moment the only thing that was on my mind was my abrupt departure. After dinner that evening, I made my way down the street to Lady Cassie's house, and as I was nearing the front porch... I felt a strong hand grab me by the wrist and pull me away. Alarmed, I looked back to see Shady Jeremy, violently pulling me away. I started to scream, but he quickly held his hand over my mouth. In an effort to free myself, I bit down on his palm. The pain made him release me for a second, so I immediately ran towards Lady Cassie's house. I quickly entered the house, and I slammed the door, breathing hard. I then started to scream. Lady Cassie, please call the cops. Shady Jeremy just attacked me. Nothing but silence responded to my pleas, and that's when I finally realized that something was wrong, as Lady Cassie's house was now completely dark and it was lit with strange candles. Before I could do or say anything, I heard Lady Cassie's voice say, You have been given the privilege to be the ultimate beast, and for that I promise... I will only hunt you for 30 minutes. Bear in mind, child, that you have the right to run and defend your privilege. If you win, I will spare you. But if you lose, I'll take what makes you beautiful. Confused and afraid, I racked my brain hoping to find a feasible explanation for what was going on. I didn't understand a single word Lady Cassie had just said, and I was still shaken up from being attacked by Shady Jeremy. It took me a while before I managed to stutter the words. 
What the hell is going on, Lady Cassie? But before I could get an answer, I felt a sharp pain sear through my arm. I fell to the floor, writhing and screaming in pain. I looked down to see the cause of the pain, and that's when I saw an arrow sticking out of my arm. Before I could do anything about it, I saw Lady Cassie lunge at me, wearing an African-themed mask, and she was holding a machete in her right hand. I managed to dodge the attack before running away. I then frantically looked for an exit out of the house. I quickly headed for the back door, and I ran out through there. In front of me was nothing but the forest, and with no other options, I decided to run into it. As I ran through the forest, I heard Lady Cassie scream out what seemed to be a war cry. I felt my heart beating fast, and as I looked behind me, I saw a 60-year-old woman bolting after me like she was in her 20s. It didn't take long before she caught up to me, and with no hesitation, she brought her machete's blade down on my shoulder. Immeasurable pain filled me as I fell to the floor. Lady Cassie loomed over me now, and I could hear her breathing hard through her mask. A lot of emotions ran through my head as I watched her lift the bloody machete to land the finishing blow. I felt fear, pain, and anger. But the major thing I was feeling was confusion, as even in those horrific moments, I had no idea why I was consecutively attacked by both of my neighbors. I made my peace with God as I watched Lady Cassie bring down her machete. But before the blade could connect with my neck, I heard a gunshot, and I watched Lady Cassie slowly drop to her feet. Numerous people rushed towards me as I breathed a sigh of relief. I had lost a lot of blood now, but I managed to see what was going on, and standing over me were my aunt, the cops, and Shady Jeremy. I was taken to the hospital after the morbid incident, and my wounds were treated. When I felt a little bit better, I asked my aunt how she found me, and she told me that our neighbor, Jeremy, had come to the house and how he was aggressively gesturing towards Lady Cassie's house. She then explained how she finally knew something was wrong, as Jeremy proceeded to write the words, Your nephew is in trouble, on a piece of paper, and that's when she called the cops. It was then I realized that our neighbor Jeremy couldn't speak, as he was dumb. A lot of things made sense to me after I was told that, like... What happened in front of Lady Cassie's house? I really didn't know he couldn't speak, as I always thought he just didn't want to. After a couple of weeks, I was taken back home. The incident with Lady Cassie had been on the news, and my aunt told me that I had just survived a huge ritualistic serial killer. The cops had revealed to her that Lady Cassie had murdered and flayed several human beings, as numerous pelts of human skin were found at her house. That's when I had a horrific realization as I finally knew that the skin pelts I couldn't identify were human. I was also told that she carried out the same ritualistic 30-minute hunt with all of her victims, and how she skinned, preserved, and made human pelts of all the people who lost. Things began to die down after a couple of months, and I remember going back to my aunt's house and speaking with Mr. Jeremy. I apologized for misjudging him, and I thanked him for saving my life. I then asked him how he knew what Lady Cassie was going to do, and Mr. Jeremy then revealed that he too was a victim who had survived Lady Cassie's attack. He wrote all the details on a piece of paper and explained how he had survived the 30-minute hunt. It also said how she had let him keep his skin, but to keep him from talking, she morbidly cut his tongue out and she threatened to kill his family if he said anything. He was too scared to talk after his own horrific experience, so he decided to avoid everything and everyone, but he couldn't stand by when he saw me going there that night, as he knew something was up and he didn't want me to die, so he did something about it. I ended up staying in touch with Jeremy, even after I went back home, and while I had some serious trauma due to the ordeal, talking to him helped me get through it. It's been a very long time now since it happened, but this morbid experience has left me with a bad attitude towards neighbors. Nowadays, every time I see someone who's supposed to be my neighbor, I try my best to avoid them, as you can never know if one of the most prolific serial killers is the same person who tells you good morning every time you walk through your front door. We have this urban legend in my city called the Wrong Way Man. Supposedly, you might see him standing on the side of the road when you're driving. 
Some say it's always when you're on your way home. I've seen pictures of the wrong way, man. They circulate among us by text message. They circulate among students, workers, friends, and family here. Oddly, I'd never seen any of those pictures posted online. I'm not sure if it's because of fear, because those who have taken the pictures want to perpetuate the mystique of our local urban legend, or because of something else. I was pretty sure that those pictures had been a hoax, just someone dressed up as the wrong way man. Maybe it was the same person every time. As far as what the wrong way man looks like, he wears his tattered clothing backwards, usually a flannel shirt and jeans. His painted smiling face looks eerily realistic until he turns to the side and you could see it's a smooth surface. It seems that he shaves his hair off, paints a face over the back of his head, and puts a shoulder-length wig on that covers up his real face. Those who I've met who have claimed to have spotted the wrong way man say they waited a week before driving home, staying over at a friend's house or a hotel and not even bothering to go home to pack a suitcase. I've also heard, though, that you need to wait a month. The common consensus seems to be if you see him while driving home, don't finish your drive home. Turn around and go somewhere else, and wait for at least a week. I personally thought it was a bunch of nonsense, until my date and I saw the wrong way man when we were going back to my house from the movies. It was Katie who spotted him. Slow down, she said. I think I see the wrong way man you told me about. Katie had only lived in my city for half a year, so one of the things I had told her on my quest to share with her as many interesting things as I could had been our local urban legend about the wrong way man. I'd never seen someone dressed as the wrong way man in person. Pictures, sure, but never in person. My foot was shaking as I eased up on the gas. It was dark, nearing midnight dark, and there were either no street lights or they were off. My car's headlights lit him up. On the side of the road, he was facing us. Actually, he had his back to us. That painted face was facing us. The jeans and flannel shirt and wig were all turned our way as well. His arms and legs looked wrong. They were shoved down in his clothing the opposite way. I wanted to be amused, but I was alarmed. When we got to be about 10 feet away in my car, he turned his painted head towards us. Those painted eyes, realistic but forever held too wide, seemed to be staring right into mine. As we drove slowly by, I waved to him and laughed to try and ease some of the tension. He didn't wave back. I looked at Katie and she was waving too, but she wasn't laughing. I glanced back in time to see the slick side of that person's shaved, painted head and the optical illusion of a real face being there was shattered, shattered but somehow worse for it. Also, when I peered into the rearview mirror as we increased our distance, I thought I saw something glinting beneath the shoulder-length wig he wore. Then, he was gone, lost to the darkness. I picked up speed. He hadn't been walking, but somehow I was worried he would come after us too quickly. So what do we do now? Katie said. We can't go to your home or mine. I glanced at her, and soon we both started laughing. Well, I said, after tonight we'll be able to tell everyone around that we saw the wrong way man and went immediately home. I wonder who was pretending to be the wrong way man, Katie said. I wonder why they were doing it. Do you think we should turn back around and try and talk to him? I'd rather we didn't, I said. They could be dangerous, but I'm sure it's just someone looking to keep the urban legend alive. It's your car, Katie said. But if it was mine... All right, I said. We'll turn back around. My grandpa used to say if you're in doubt which turn to make, you can always take a U-turn until you figure things out. He used that as a metaphor for life. But as I did my U-turn, my heart was thrashing in my chest. We drove down the entirety of that dark street without seeing that person again. It was a couple of miles long in that direction, so there's no way they could have walked or run the distance so quickly. Katie and I decided that the person dressed as the wrong way man must have left the shoulder of the road for the surrounding woods. The idea of them hiding in the woods as we drove by again made me feel like I had spiders crawling over my flesh. 
We did another U-turn, and during the whole time I kept glancing around in case that person jumped at us from out of nowhere. But soon, we were headed back in the direction of my house with no second look at the wrong way man. Katie and I tried to laugh it out, and we tried talking about other things, but both of us were pretty scared. We couldn't stop chatting about everything and nothing, or glancing out the windows or into our side mirrors. We turned into my subdivision, then we turned onto my street, and everything changed. As soon as we turned onto my street, we started to go backwards instead of forwards. Did you put it in reverse? Katie said. Her hand was gripping my arm. It was cold as ice. I stopped the car. Both of us were looking down. The car was in drive. I took my foot off the brake and put it onto the gas pedal again. The houses, familiar houses I saw every day when coming home, were moving away from us. Maybe something's wrong with my car, I said. But when I tried driving forward again, I looked to the side, and then in the rearview mirror, we were not moving. Not according to those views. In front of us, the houses receded every time I put my foot on the gas, but from the side and rear, it appeared that we were standing still. On my street, everything was well lit. There were tons of street lights so we couldn't argue it away as if it had anything to do with limited visibility. Let's get out of here, Katie said. Her voice was almost a whisper. Yeah, I said, in a similar way. But how are we going to leave? Put it in reverse. When I put my car in reverse and tried that, we actually moved forward. But to the side and rear, once again, we seemed to have not moved, like we were caught just past the entrance to my neighborhood. It was when Katie and I had stopped the car and were debating getting out that we spotted someone coming towards us on the sidewalk. They were approaching us from the front of the vehicle, so I'm not sure how accurate the distance was. It seemed like they were already about 20 feet away. I don't know why it took me so long to realize this. Maybe it was because I didn't want to, but I recognized my neighbor by the back of his head and by his body shape, which was somewhat atypical. I'd seen him often stooped working in his garden while I was driving by. He was walking backwards towards us. When he got closer, he stopped. Then he began shouting, Empla, Empla, over and over again, standing stock still, his back to us. Only later would I realize he had been saying help me in reverse. I rolled down the window. Mr. Nelson? I said. What's the matter? He stopped shouting. Now that my window was down, I could hear his body creak and snap. Blood poured out of fissures as the joints of his arms and legs changed drastically. When Mr. Nelson's head twisted all the way around towards us, I was sure that I saw the lights go out of his eyes. Then, whatever had taken over Mr. Nelson made a first step forward with the new architecture of his body. Katie and I both began to scream at that first step. I rolled up the window as Mr. Nelson loped around on strange, inhuman legs. His kneecaps and elbows had become stretched and exaggerated from being reversed. I put my foot on the gas with the car still in reverse, and through the front windows we seemed to be careening forward. Even though a glance out the sides or in the rearview mirror showed us to still be stationary, we slammed into Mr. Nelson. Blood slashed across the windshield. The car rose and fell as we went over his body. To the sides and rear, there was no indication of the car rising and falling. I didn't see a lump appear behind us either. I kept my foot on the gas, still going forward in reverse. I saw a window of a neighbor's house shatter. A couple I barely recognized crawled out like baby spiders out of eggs, leaking blood and more blood as they scraped themselves against the shards in the window frame. When the wife paused in the window, she smiled. She intentionally rubbed her scalp against a particularly sharp-looking piece of glass. Meat and blood came away. I think I could see the white of her skull. By then, her husband was already on the ground running towards us. I sped forward. They and their houses vanished in the sides and rear of the vehicle, which were, again, still stuck near the street's entrance. More people were coming out of their homes. They came out all twisted and broken, 
damaging themselves further as they exited. They ran towards us on backwards legs, churning their backwards arms. Everything about them was the wrong way. Before long, I found myself slamming on the brakes. What are you doing? Keep going! Katie yelled. They're gonna catch up with us! Ahead, I saw my own driveway. Someone that looked like me was talking to another person with a painted face. The painted face nodded. Up and down, it nodded like a real face would do. Then, when I saw the wig shuffle and move seemingly on its own, I realized that the true face under the wig was talking, moving its lips, breathing. The wrong way man was talking to me, or someone who looked like me. At the same time, Katie was reaching over me, trying desperately to put her foot on the gas. A couple of twisted pieces of bone and meat collided with the windshield. Two faces with bunched up bolts of neck leered at me out of glazed eyes. These were faces I should have recognized. Their twisted arms continued to beat at the window, even though their eyes told me that no one was home. A spider's web of cracks spread across the windshield, and its grooves caught blood. I slammed my foot on the gas while helping to steady Katie back into her seat. We flung those two off, and right after we ran over an entire family in quick succession. I didn't have time to feel guilty. Those were not my neighbors. They were not my neighbors. These were not. Katie and I both began to change. I heard some of my bones break. I felt it a moment later, like the reverse of lightning before thunder. Katie and I started screaming, almost in unison and about in the same tune. It was like a choir of pain and fear, and fear and pain had risen up with us as instruments. Keep your head back! I yelled as I strove to keep my head pinned against my seat. Don't let it twist around! No matter what happens to the rest of our bodies, we can't let it kill us! I know! Katie said. Just get this car out of here! Make a U-turn or something! Still in reverse, yet still going forward, I wheeled the car, screeching around. I didn't glance out the sides or rear. I just gunned it, heading back towards where we had come from. The wrong way man waited. He waited for me at the juncture of my driveway and the street. His painted mouth grinned forever. His painted eyes were too wide and incapable of blinking. We passed him and drove out of the neighborhood. Katie and I weren't out of the woods, though. I was able to get us to a nearby gas station before my legs and arms, which were partway reversed and leaking blood, completely gave out. We crawled out of the vehicle and onto the cold, hard concrete of the gas station. I blacked out almost immediately, but Katie tells me she retained consciousness until the ambulance arrived. I don't envy her. We spent months in the hospital with broken bones and torn ligaments and muscle. I think the only thing that had saved us permanent damage might have been the seats of our vehicle resisting our changes. We told the doctors we had been in a car accident. They shook their heads at us and kept asking questions. I did go back home eventually. We both did. The reason I went home was because one of my neighbors that we had run over with my car came to the hospital to visit me. They seemed completely fine, as if nothing had happened and the wrong way man had never changed them. But damage was done to my vehicle and to Katie and me both physically and psychologically. And while our bodies are on the mend, I don't think we'll ever be the same. I feel the wrong way inside. Flame broiled beef on a Whopper is what put Burger King on the map since 1953. Hi, I'm Dylan, and I've been a regular customer of Burger King since I was on solids. And now I have just been promoted to manager at the one I work at. My coworker Tracy is much older than me and hates that I am the manager, and she isn't. She's been trying to sabotage my position for weeks, but she went to an extent none of us could have imagined. 
Looking back now, I feel like I should have seen it coming. Tracy was angry, but she wasn't dangerous. At least, that's what I thought. She made comments and threats, but never followed through. One night, my other co-worker Kyle and I were working the late shift with Tracy. Kyle was on drive through duty while Tracy and I made the orders. She cooked the food and I wrapped it. Everything was going normal and we were flowing as a team. The dinner rush had settled down and we took some time to clean the restaurant. The lobby was near closing when two customers, a man and a woman, walked in. They appeared to be a couple. Tracy was mopping the lobby when she looked at them. We're closing the lobby. Get out of here. The man shot her a menacing look. It doesn't close for another 15 minutes. You don't have to be so rude. You need to leave. I came out from my office. Tracy, you can't talk to customers that way. Are you the manager? Yes. I apologize for the manner in which my employee has spoken to you. I don't take orders from you. Tracy, if you think this behavior is going to get you sent home early, you've got another thing coming. Kyle came from around the counter. What's going on out here? Tracy is trying to chase off customers before we close the lobby. The woman looked at us. Excuse me, we would like to order now? Kyle nodded and went behind the counter to take the order. As a bit of a punishment for Tracy, I made her go to the kitchen and put their order together, which turned out to be rather hefty. They ordered six triple whoppers with extra cheese and pickles, six orders of french fries, and six Oreo milkshakes. As I expected, she was pissed at me, but I didn't care. She's lucky I didn't fire her for talking to customers like that. She did what I told her to do, cursing me the entire time. I gave their order to them, and they went out the door. We cleaned up, and Tracy left while I gave Kyle a ride home. The next day, I was called to come into work and talk to my boss face to face. When I got to work, I was surprised to see the crime scene tape was wrapped around the building, and the police were there. My stomach dropped as Mariah, my boss, approached me. Dylan, the office, please. I nodded and followed her in where she closed the door. You had two customers late last night just before closing. Dylan, those customers were in an accident last night. An autopsy was performed this morning and traces of rat poison was found in their system. They were dead before the car crashed. I fell to my knees in shock. How did... what? Rat poison? As manager of this Burger King, they are holding you responsible and they're questioning Kyle and Tracy. Tracy, could she have really stooped so low? I put Tracy in charge of making their order last night. She had to have done it. She's been trying to sabotage me ever since I got promoted. I'm sorry, Dylan, but that doesn't prove anything. This is part of the heavy responsibility that comes with being a manager. We discussed this. I understand. Until this is resolved, I have no choice but to shut down the location. I left the office and agreed to go to the police station for questioning. After a series of questions that I answered to the best of my knowledge, Kyle and Tracy were brought in for questioning too. A few weeks had gone by and we were able to open up the restaurant again. There was still no knowledge of who put the rat poison in the food, but the owner now has a mandatory bag check as employees go in and out. I wanted to apologize to Tracy and hopefully come to an understanding. Her favorite item on the menu was the bacon whopper and a chocolate milkshake. I bought them for her and even made them myself to give to her. When she was on her break, I invited her to sit with me in the lobby and we could eat together. Tracy, I know that it seems backwards to be working under me. I want to know how I can earn your respect as a boss. She took a large bite of the burger and let out a sound of delight. <laughs> Buying me lunch every day is a start. I laughed. I want to apologize for making you handle that big order that night by yourself. That was petty and unfair. Thank you. I forgive you. She smiled and took a sip of her shake. She went to say something else when she began foaming at the mouth. Tracy started coughing violently and fell to the floor puking her guts out. Tracy! Oh God! Somebody call an ambulance! I looked around and to my horror, all of our guests in the lobby were on the floor like Tracy, puking and foaming. What the hell was going on? Kyle called the cops and we were shut down once again. Because of the food I prepared for Tracy being poisoned, I was framed and arrested for the murder of that couple, Tracy 
and all our guests who ate our food that day. Kyle came to visit me in prison. We sat out a window and talked over the phone. I'm sorry you got arrested, man. It's not your fault. I swore it was Tracy who put rat poison in their food that night. Until she died, right in front of me. Tracy was mad about answering to you, but she wasn't a killer. Neither are you. Who do you think did it? Kyle suddenly got really quiet. I did. My eyes went wide. You? Yes, me. And to think, you are the one behind bars, not me. He began to laugh maniacally. I sat there shocked. So many questions. Yet, I couldn't speak. The police monitored the phone lines, and Kyle was immediately arrested. He confessed to slipping rat poison into the food while Tracy went to grab more pickles from the fridge that night. When he failed to frame her, he used me to poison her and admitted to slipping rat poison into the food that day. I wanted to apologize to her when he came in with me to open the restaurant. Kyle admitted to wanting to know what it felt like to kill people. I was released from prison and I cannot bring myself to set foot inside another Burger King anymore. What happened to me yesterday was the most horrifying experience I faced. I, as a person, who some people may consider as a workaholic, worked in two different jobs. I worked as a recruiter during the day and as a waitress at night. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I spent more time at my house as I was working remotely as a recruiter. The second job I have mentioned was a part-time job, so I was able to work and have some time to spare for myself. The only difficulty I was facing was the fact that I had to take a bus to the coffee shop I was working in. My shift would begin around 6 a.m., so it was not difficult to go there, but my shift would end at midnight. Thus, I would have to rush to the bus stop to return to my house. Even though I hated rushing to catch a bus, I liked my job. And I liked the fact that I would be outside even though it was midnight. Enjoying the chilling breeze of the night every night was therapeutic. Yesterday was just like the other days. I worked full time as a recruiter at my house and went out when I finished my work. The coffee shop was not really crowded and I spent most of the time chatting with my colleagues. As my shift ended, I quickly went to the bus stop. The bus stop was on a road that few cars or people would pass by. It could hardly be called a bus stop as it was just an area with a bench and a sign. The metal bench was rusty and the movement had graffiti on it. Considering that this bus stop was in an isolated location where only a few would wait, I could understand the dirtiness of it. I checked the time and realized that I had run faster than usual as I was there five minutes earlier than I usually am. As I started to wait for the bus to arrive, I saw a shadowy figure walking towards the bus stop. When he passed under the flickering streetlight, I was able to take a good look at him. He had his hoodie on and his hands were in his pockets. He seemed young. He had a slight hump back, and he was strolling. I began to feel goosebumps as he approached the bus stop. It was the first time I saw someone else would take the bus from there. Around that time was enough to scare me, and his posture was only making things worse. As he came to the bus stop, he sat on the bench. I walked a little bit further to avoid being too close to him. Another minute passed. He began to whistle this unnerving melody. He whistled the same melody over and over again. After whistling for a minute, he stopped. At first, I was relieved that he had stopped. But the silence started to bother me. I felt like it was the silence before the storm. After several seconds of torturous silence, the man got up. He stood there still his hands in his pockets, opened his mouth, and started to let out a mournful well. He looked at me as he made the sound, slowly lifting his hands and pointing toward me. I was petrified. A drop of cold sweat fell from my forehead to the ground. He raised his other arm towards me and started to speak. The bus will not arrive. His low voice sent shivers down my spine. I was so scared that I could not move a single muscle. 
He started to approach slowly. The way he walked resembled a zombie. As he came right next to me, he began to observe me. Without touching me, he started to smell me. I can still remember the high-pitched, inhaling sound he made as he continued to smell me. You are one of us now, he whispered, while I could do nothing but experience that terrorizing moment as he held my shoulders. Very quickly, my survival instincts kicked in, and I could move my muscles again. I pushed him as hard as I could. From the impact, he lost his balance and fell to the ground. Still making the horrible wailing sound, he grabbed my ankle. I panicked and kicked his head. My reaction made him angry as he tightened his grip. His fingernails stabbed my ankles as his grip got more forceful. I kicked for several times until he let go. He lay on the ground, holding his head while crying. You betrayed us, he said with a disappointed voice. I heard the sound of the bus coming closer, and I turned around to see if it was coming. I could not have been much happier to catch a bus quickly coming closer. We shall see each other again, the man whispered. I turned around to see him, but when I turned around, I could not see anyone. The bus stopped before me, and with a calming, whistling sound, its doors were open. As soon as I got on the bus, I started to speak with the driver and tell him what had happened. I could see the horror in his eyes as he said, You have seen the night whisperer. People that live here hear the welling sound of this creature, and some believe that it was coming from a ghost. It became an urban legend around here. So you are saying that the night whisperer was a man in a dark hoodie? I do not believe he was a man, dear. I think you have encountered a spirit. Obviously, I did not believe him, but I was still shocked by the recent incident. My body did not stop shaking for a couple of minutes. The driver tried his best to comfort me, and realizing that there were no other passengers on the bus, he offered to take me to a police station. I thanked him and accepted his offer. When I got off the bus, I rushed into the station. Officers saw me, and realizing my frightened state, directed their attention to me. They listened as I told them about the night whisperer, including the folk tales the driver told me. After listening to my story, they gave me a glass of water, and one of the officers began to speak. We started to receive complaints about the wailing sound around that area two months ago. At first, we did not focus on it as it seemed less important considering the other duties we had. But after a while, the complaints began to pile up and we knew that we had to check it out. We tried our best to find the source of the sound, but we could not find it. Then, we began to hear that children and women were disappearing. Another officer came next to us with some papers and a pen. She placed them on the table and listened as the other officer continued a speech. We started an investigation in the area. We have found some people like you that claim to be witnesses of the Night Whisperer, as they called it. The investigation is still ongoing, but we believe that a suspect is a man in his 20s with a mental disorder or a drug addiction. Either way, your report will be helpful for the investigation. I wrote what I went through in detail and left the station. As I was walking back to my house, in a shadowy corner of a back alley, I saw the figure again. I know where you live. They cannot save you, he shouted, and started to make the wailing sound. I ran back to the station and asked for protection. They told me that they could escort me to my place. They left me right in front of my house. As I went inside my house, I called my employer and told him that I wanted to quit my job as a waitress. Upon hearing what happened to me, he understandingly accepted my resignation. After that incident, I could not sleep nor go outside. I know it has only been a day after it, but I am scared that this trauma will haunt me for years. Even now, I can still hear the uncanny wail of the man. Looking out of my window, I sometimes see shapes shifting inside the shadows and feel in utter disturbance. 
I am getting more and more paranoid every hour. I cannot get rid of the feeling of being watched. I hope the police find the suspect as soon as possible, or I won't be able to survive going through these challenging days. I grew up in a single-parent household. Just me, my sister, and my mom, with my grandpa occasionally lending a hand with parenting duties. And when I was about four or five years old, we were broken into, twice. I didn't know all the details of the whole thing until years later, like I have vague memories of moving apartments and some cops coming over to the house, but I was pretty much kept in the dark until I was old enough to handle what had gone down. For the first break-in, we were all out grocery shopping, so my mom didn't realize anything had happened until we got home. There was an open window, open drawers, the way my grandpa tells it. It's like my mom interrupted them in the middle of doing something and they climbed out of a second floor window as soon as he'd heard us arrive. That, or whoever it was, just didn't care about people knowing he'd been there. The second break-in happened three months later, only this time the guy broke in at nighttime while we were all asleep. I had to get all this from my grandpa because understandably my mom hates talking about it, but the way he tells it, she basically woke up in the middle of the night and sensed a presence in the room with her. Not like a spirit or anything dumb like that, like an actual person. Then when she opened her eyes, there was someone standing next to her bed with something shiny in his hand. She told grandpa she was literally frozen with terror, couldn't move, couldn't talk literally petrified in the very sense of the word. Apparently the guy was mumbling something, but mom couldn't remember exactly what. Then by the time she started begging him not to hurt her, she couldn't hear anything at all. My sister remembers walking into her room, thinking that she was having a nightmare. She asked mom if she was okay. Mom threw the covers from over her head, saw the guy was gone, then noticed the second floor window was open where the guy had used the same escape route as the first break-in. She put my little sister back to bed. I obviously have no memory of this because I was asleep. She called 911, then she called my grandpa. Grandpa said the cops found faint, muddy footprints all over the house, including in our bedrooms, so he'd obviously taken his time exploring the place before he'd woken my mom up. Only, this guy hadn't just been exploring. He'd been very, very busy, and it actually took us a few days to uncover all the bizarre little things he'd done, things which spoke to just how insane this person really was. The next day, when we noticed that the cat wouldn't touch her milk, Mom poured it out into the sink, thinking that it had gone sour, then got the distinct smell of bleach as she did so. She can't be certain, but she thinks the guy poured bleach into the cat's milk, wanting to kill it. Then, there was the cracked empty eggs in the fridge. Not like cracked all the way, just little holes in the top with all the yolk and egg white missing. It's possible he just poured them down the sink, but Grandpa thinks the guy might have been sucking them raw. Not all that scary, I know, just freaky, you know? Mom says some meat was missing from the fridge too. Raw meat. But I know Grandpa used to feed our cat from the fridge too, so we can't rule that out. A few days later, Grandpa came over in the evening for some dinner and offered to help prep for garbage day. He says one of the garbage cans spilled right as he got into the driveway, complains to my mom about tin cans in the garbage or whatever, and then goes on to clean up and finds what spilt it. Someone, presumably the guy who broke in, had thrown a pair of scissors in the trash along with a clothing catalog he'd been cutting up. He cut the heads off almost every single motto in that catalog, and the little paper heads were nowhere to be found. My grandpa thinks the guy took them as some kind of trophy, but who knows what he really did with them. Then there was the salt in my mom's work shoes, the knife missing from her knife block in the kitchen, obviously the shiny thing he'd been holding when she woke up to him in her room. Anyways, the cops got plenty of fingerprints, but whoever it was didn't have a record and other than the muddy boot prints they found, there was nothing much to go on. So to this day, no one's been arrested for it, but my grandpa thinks he knows who it was. Years later, after we moved apartments twice in a bid to avoid the guy, a friend of a distant relative ended up getting locked up in some kind of psychiatric hospital. The guy had become obsessed with Alice in Wonderland, 
had all the books, multiple copies of them too, and all he ever talked about was the looking glass or Wonderland and all this stuff. It might just be a complete coincidence, but the thing is, that's my mom's name, Alice. She's over the whole thing now. It's been more than 20 years since all of that, but I know that if she doesn't like talking about it, even today, it had to have messed her up for a while. After breaking up with my boyfriend, I tried to find some distraction. Being in a five years long relationship makes you adapt to your partner. He had become a part of my life, which caused me to adjust to him and arrange my time considering our relationship. Now that I was alone again, I felt the urge to fill the emptiness of time that I would usually spend with him. Thus, as a distraction, I focused on my career. I left my previous job and found a position where I would work harder but get rewarded with better salaries. After a couple of months, I realized that I missed the feeling of flirting with someone. I downloaded a dating app that was quite simple to use and efficient in finding the best match for, at least that is what I thought back then. I started texting with a guy named Travis. He looked very attractive, and I enjoyed our conversation. We arranged a date in a small coffee shop close to where I lived. When I sat in the coffee shop for the first time, I remember feeling nervous. It was going to be the first time flirting with someone other than my ex-boyfriend since our breakup, and I feared that I might have forgotten how to flirt. My nervousness got even worse when I realized that Travis had missed our date. Even though I was devastated, I decided to enjoy the coffee shop as it was a charming place. I let myself be lost in the coziness. I listened to music and read a book. I read my book for hours, but I would close my book and look at the entrance whenever a new person entered the shop, hoping to see Travis. Of course, none of them were Travis. After a while, I noticed that a fat man in his 50s was sitting at another table by himself. He would watch me whenever he thought I was not looking at him. At first, I thought he was just a man who found me attractive, but then I realized that he looked like someone I knew. At that point, I stopped reading and looked at the man for a long time. It was Travis. Not the same man in the pictures that he sent me, but it was him. After a couple of seconds of looking at this man, I understood that he was using the images from his young times on the dating app. He had told me that he was 27 years old when we were texting, but seeing him, I realized that he was at least 50. In his pictures, he looked fit and healthy, but instead, there stood a fat man. I figured that in his youth, he was this handsome man, but now, he was a person who had lost his attractiveness. At first, I felt anger toward the man because he tricked me. But then, I remembered our conversation and how much I enjoyed it. He did not look like what I thought he would look like, but his thoughts were similar to mine. He wanted the same things as I did, and he seemed like a nice person with a good heart, but a lack of confidence. At that moment, I decided to talk with him. Of course, it was not going to be a date that ended with me inviting him to my flat, but at least I could have a pleasant conversation with this man. I walked to his table and very gently asked, Are you Travis? I could see the instant fear in his eyes as I approached him. He was shocked to know that I would be the one who came. He stuttered when he tried to speak, and after confirming that he was Travis, he started to apologize for deceiving me. I pulled a chair and sat with him. After a while, his lack of confidence got restored, and he began to speak more clearly. We started to have a lovely conversation. While we were talking, he would try to flirt with me, 
but not seeing a positive reaction from me would make him upset and try to change the conversation. As mainly being focused on my career at the time, I started to talk about my job, and after finishing my rather long speech about how much I loved my new job, I asked what his job was. He told me that he had a very important job, but he did not want to talk about it in the coffee shop. He seemed bored of sitting there. That is why I asked him to have a walk with me, with a smile on his face. He said that he was glad to hear this, and he went to pay the bill quickly. When we left the coffee shop, he said that there was a park nearby and asked if I wanted to go there. I was surprised to see him know these places even though he was not living around here. When we went to the park, he started to behave strangely, but I thought he was just nervous because of our little date. I felt sorry for this guy as his hopes of being in a relationship with me were about to be crushed. He murmured a question very silently. Do you want to know what I do for a living? I was intrigued by this question and told him that I would love to know. He was whispering at first, telling me how he was telling other people that he was a code developer, but he was a hacker who would hack into many people's bank accounts and steal their money. He said he would only steal from people who committed a crime and got away with it. Then he said, I am the good guy here. I steal from sinners, from people that have bad hearts. Being a hacker helps me in other ways as well. He paused for a moment. I could understand whether he thought he should tell me more or not. With a confident smile on his face, he continued, For example, it helped me to find my true love. You, Fiona, are my true love. I hacked into the system of the app to find my best match. As you can understand, their system is not efficient when finding the love of your life. I hacked into it, and I found you. For our love, I put a lot of effort into this. After that confession of his, a great sense of fear conquered my body. I had to leave. I had to run away from this creep. As I instinctively turned around to run away, he held me by my shoulders and continued his twisted speech. I found your address. I spent my days walking around this area, trying to find good places for our date. The coffee shop was the first place where we would see each other, and this empty and dark park is the first place that we will make love. He grabbed me and started to drag me into the forest side of the park. I tried to fight back, but he was a massive guy. I felt so hopeless. I started to scream, but he closed my mouth with his hand and said that no one could hear me there. He found a bush and pushed me into it. He jumped on me, and with his heavy body on me, it felt impossible even to lift a finger. As he started to unbutton my shirt, I began to cry. I do not know how, but in the darkness, I saw a stone near me. I gathered my strength and grabbed the stone. I hit him as hard as I could. I hit him on the head again and again. He grunted in pain and tried to take the stone from my hand. At that moment, I stabbed the sharp edge of the stone into his eye. He screamed and finally got off me. I sat on him and continuously hit his face with a stone. After I realized that he was unconscious, I ran to the nearest police station. I told what happened, and as the officers listened to my story, they understood who Travis was. Travis, as the police told me, was a mentally ill serial killer who had recently escaped the mental health facility he was in. He had killed six women before. He would go on different dating apps and find young women like me. He would hack into their computers, find their locations, and find a spot to rape and murder them. After giving me this information, the police sent a group to check the body, but the body of Travis was not in the park. This happened a week ago. The police are still looking for Travis. 
I will move out from my flat as soon as I can find a new place to live, but until then, I have to walk the streets with fear. Whenever I see the coffee shop we went to, I feel Travis's monstrous hands grasping my body. But the worst part of living a paranoid life is the times that I have to stay alone in my house. I can still hear his disgusting breathing and panting sounds whenever I lay down. It all started back when my father, John Baylor, was a Marine. My whole childhood, I remember waiting for him to get home from his deployment and spend time with me and Mom. He was a brave man and served the country with the utmost dignity and honesty until he no longer could. You see, on one of his deployments to Afghanistan, a hand grenade exploded near his legs, no longer leaving him capable of service. So, he retired as a war veteran and permanently returned to me and mom back home. I was in school back then and remember how tough it was financially to support my education and cope with my dad's injuries. He had a permanent limp in his left leg after the surgeries. Soon, he started taking up small, odd jobs to support our family. I and mom worked too and somehow managed to keep a roof over our heads. However, soon things took a turn for the worst as my mom's health started to deteriorate due to stress and too much work. We were tight on money and could no longer afford to live in the big city we were living in. I was in my senior year of high school back then, so we decided to move to the countryside and start anew once I graduate. We could afford a simple country lifestyle rather than the expense of living in a city. Later that year, I moved to a small town called Rivers Bay. It was a completely different province but fulfilled our expectations. We signed a deal on a property there by selling our old home. In the middle of this property was a big two-story house with five bedrooms, a big living room, and a well-furnished kitchen, and our amazing porch surrounding the entire house. It was our new home. We were so happy to find a home we all loved so much, and it cost us only a fraction of the selling price of our old home. However, amidst all our joy and the stress of moving in, we ignored the fact that our seller was selling the property at a great loss and was very eager to get the property off his chest as soon as possible. If only we had asked him why. A week after we moved into our new home, Dad and I already made friends with the locals. It was a tight-knit community of a few people. I got a job at the local grocery store, and Dad was working as a full-time mechanic at the only auto repair shop in the small town. Mom was mostly at home, but sometimes took small part-time jobs if she was feeling all right. Soon, everyone in town knew about us. Life was smooth. Money was no longer a big issue, and Mom was definitely healing in the country air. One day, as I was stocking shampoo in an aisle, a young man around my age approached me. His name was Ben, and he needed help with something he wanted to purchase for his granddad. Ben and I hit it off instantly, and after a few initial dates, I was dating Ben Anderson, the grandson of one of our town's founding members. Ben loved our home and my parents. We usually hung out on our property when neither of us was working. He was four years older than me and worked from home after his graduation. Almost every evening after my shift, Dad picked me up while returning from the auto shop. Once we were back home, my parents would have their evening tea on the porch overlooking our property. This had become sort of a ritual since we moved in here. Sometimes, Ben and I joined them, and sometimes we just took a walk through our property or the surrounding areas, catching up on each other's day. Now, I have to mention, our new home was very close to the forest, and whenever Ben and I went for one of our walks, we mostly walked on the dirt trails in the forest itself. Ben was an adventurous guy and often convinced me to ditch these trails and wander a bit deeper into the woods. On one such walk, I clearly remember we had walked a few meters away from a dirt path and were busy chatting. Suddenly, Ben put a finger on his lips and gestured for me to stay quiet. What happened, Ben? What did you hear? 
I ask, to which he just guided me to walk a few steps with him. Soon, I could hear what my boyfriend must have heard mere seconds ago. There was a low-pitched, growling sound, like that of a wolf or a big dog snarling at something. It was as if the animal was warning us to go away. The only problem was, we never saw any animal. We frantically looked around to see which animal lurked so close to my home, but couldn't find anything. Until Ben spotted a large sinkhole in the ground beyond the chopped tree. It was mostly covered by fallen branches, dried leaves, and weeds. None of us had ever ventured into this part of the woods, as we were completely new and did not get a lot of time to explore the area completely. The sinkhole looked like an entrance to some sort of cave where the growling noise originated from. As Ben and I were at the mouth of the hole, we peeked inside and saw nothing but pitch blackness. Barely any light entered the hole, and the growling sound intensified. Ben flashed his phone's flashlight into the hole and tried to sneak a look at the animal within. But as soon as the light fell on whatever was in there, the animal shrieked so loudly it scared me and my boyfriend shitless. Ben and I exchanged a look of pure dread and decided to leave the woods and return home. As soon as we entered the door, we both narrated the incident to my parents and asked them to not go out in the woods alone, especially after dark. My mom thought it might be a lone wolf taking shelter in the abandoned sinkhole, but Ben knew a thing or two about animals and ruled out the possibility of it being a wolf. He said, Mrs. Baylor, I don't think it was a wolf, as the sinkhole was too deep for a wolf to climb out of. This left us with no answers as to what was in the hole. We pondered over this topic. A few days passed and nothing suspicious occurred on my walks with Ben. We refrained from entering that part of the forest, but kept on exploring other parts. Until exactly a month later, something terrifying stole our family's peace once again. That evening... My parents sat out on our front porch, overlooking the thickets of trees, around our home as usual. And suddenly, my dad comments, Roma, don't you think it's rather quiet today? Usually it's bustling with life at this time every day, with all the animals going back to their homes. Why is it so quiet? Mom noticed this and confirmed it was quite odd. Being the ex-marine that he was, my dad knew. All the animals in the forest go quiet only when an apex predator was around. No sooner than this thought passes through his head and he saw a sudden movement in the tree line right in front of them. In a stern voice, he asked mom to get in and shut all the windows. My mom was a bit worried as my dad was always very polite. John, what's the matter? She asked. Roma. I need you to go inside right now and do as I say. He replied. My mom rushed inside and started shutting the windows. When she came up to my room, I noticed the worry on her face. Hey mom, what's up? Why are you shutting all the windows? I asked. I don't know kiddo, your dad asked me to shut them. I think he spotted an animal in the trees. My mom told me and went to another room to close the windows. Hearing her statement, I immediately knew what dad must have seen. I rushed downstairs and saw my dad loading his hunting rifle. The look on his face confirmed my fear. The creature from the pit was outside. Meryl, go upstairs and stay in your room. He told me. Dad, did you see what it was? I asked. No, Meryl, but whatever it is, it's quite big and there are several of them. He confirmed. Maybe it's just a pack of wolves, as Mom said earlier. No, it's not. Whatever it is, it doesn't have fur. Rather, it has extremely pale white skin like humans. I could only see its back before it slipped between the trees. As I was going upstairs, we heard the cry of a stray cat. It was so high-pitched as if someone had strangled it. Dad and I moved the curtain off a nearby window and the sight we saw was something I will remember even in my grave. Standing there was a pale white humanoid creature 
It must be easily seven feet tall, bald head and hands, and legs like that of a human. But its hands were so long they crossed its knees. It had long, sharp teeth, clearly visible when it opened its mouth to devour the dead cat. Looking at the creature had paralyzed us. As we kept looking, another similar creature came out of the tree line, followed by another and another. Soon, there were five humanoid creatures gathered in front of our home, and we had no clue what to do or what they were. Dad's training kicked in first, and he shut off all the lights and took me and my mom to my room. It was dark inside, and he asked us to stay away from the windows. We could hear movement from below. Dad peeked from a window and could see the creatures surrounding our home. They were on our porch and scraped their nails on the wooden panels. Mom was terrified, and I was huddled on my bed. Soon the roof started to creak, and we knew one of the creatures was on the roof. They were walking on it and making noises as if trying to communicate with one another. Dad held his rifle and pointed it at one of the windows. The creature on the roof walked closer to the edge of the roof, just above the window, and then bent over to look into my room. Fortunately, it couldn't see inside as the curtain was down, but the moonlight cast its big shadow on the opposite wall, almost ripping a scream from my throat. The banging, scraping, and screeching went on for what felt like forever. That was the worst night of our life. As they were trying to find a way in, but Dad's quick actions had worked. Finally, the first rays of the sun appeared in the sky, and the creatures retreated into the forest. Once we were sure that the humanoids had left, Dad drove us to Ben's home to speak with his grandfather. What he revealed forced us to abandon our house and relocate immediately. Turns out, the town was cursed by an old witch that lived on our property years ago. The humanoid creatures were the witch hunters who had tried to kill her. In the last attempts to save herself, she had turned the witch hunters into these terrifying creatures that ate humans who roamed anywhere near the forest. So, creatures still haunt anyone who lives in our home as they think we were there to kill her. Town folks believe that the witch lives deep in the forest, even today. What do you think would have happened to my family if Dad hadn't acted in time? And could the witch be still alive? Hi, I'm Julian, and this is the story of my encounter with the scariest teacher I've ever met. So, this was back when I was in my freshman year of high school. My family was new in town, as my dad's job often transferred him to new places. I started school as soon as we settled into the new town. Back then, I was a bit of an introverted, shy, nerdy guy, like the ones you usually see in films. I did not have friends, as I was new in town and struggled to make some in my new school. I mostly kept to myself and barely exchanged a few words with my teachers and classmates when necessary. My parents encouraged me to make new friends, but... I guess I was just happy in the company of my books, comics, and schoolwork. However, my quiet and happy life changed when the school bully set his eyes on me. You see, I was easy prey. I was a freshman, which means new in school, plus new in the town with no friends to support me. Alex was your typical jock in his junior year and loved to torment the weak and loner students. I guess I fit both the categories, and so... It started. He and his friends would often corner me in the hallway and stick notes saying rude stuff on my locker. They even keyed my car once. I tried complaining to the principal, but to no avail. One morning as I entered the school gates, parked my car, and made my way to the first lecture, Alex and his buddies cornered me again. This was becoming a regular thing, and I hate to admit it, but I never had the guts to stand up to them as I knew they would beat me or at least harm me in some way. This morning, though, I was tired of this constant bullying, and I finally decided to stand my ground. 
When one of his friends, I think his name was Max, tried to snatch my backpack, I pushed him and he landed on his ass. This enraged Alex and he tried to punch me, but I blocked it with my school bag. Soon all four were on me, hitting me, trying to kick me. I almost broke my glasses, but the commotion was heard by one of the teachers. Miss Jen separated the boys from me and immediately called for the principal and the nurse. The nurse tended to my wounds while our principal questioned the boys. It was then decided that all five of us will get detention that day, and the four juniors will be suspended for a week. If you ask me, I didn't deserve the detention, but as I had pushed Max, I guess our principal thought I was active in the fight as well. Nevertheless, I had a total of two hours of detention after school, and I had to sit in Miss Gemma's classroom for the detention. Now, I must tell you, Miss Gemma was one of the strictest teachers in our high school, and there were rumors that she was into black magic and could levitate and move things with her mind. Now, if there's one thing I know about high school is that nonsense rumors are sprouting all the time. It's best to not believe them and move on with your life. I entered Miss Gemma's class that evening and sat in one of the back seats. Strange, it was just her and me in the classroom. This means there was no one else from the freshman year who had gotten detention that day. I started doing my homework and she was busy grading her tests, I guess. Not even once did she acknowledge my presence, as if I did not exist in the room. As soon as my two hours were up, I walked up to her desk and showed my detention slip for her to sign. She looked at me and, I kid you not, I will never forget those scary red eyes. It looked as if she hadn't slept in days and was intoxicated. For a moment, I thought she didn't hear me, so I repeated myself. Miss Gemma, could you please sign my slip? I've completed my detention and I need to go home now. All she did was look at me with those bloodshot eyes and smiled a weird, toothy smile. Then she finally spoke and the words knocked me off my feet. Where do you think you're going, boy? She was still smiling in that odd and scary way. Ma'am, my detention is over and I would like to leave now. I told her again. Go and sit back in your seat. I will let you go when I want to. She yelled, and I was stunned. I could almost sense something was very wrong with this whole situation. I knew I had to get my detention slip signed, but was it more important than my safety? I quickly decided it wasn't and made my way to the classroom door. As soon as I stepped out into the hallway, Miss Gemma was running behind me, screaming for me to stop. I did not know what to do, so I made my way towards the main entrance of the school. Suddenly, a poster on the wall flew across my path and I had to slow down. Let me tell you, this poster was nailed to the wall and there was no way it could move, let alone fly on its own so specifically in my direction. So, I dared to turn and saw Miss Gemma was a few feet behind me, her eyes completely black now, devoid of any emotion. I instantly knew it was her doing and started to run again, but she had other plans. As soon as I managed to run a few steps, a chair in front of me moved across the hallway and hit the wall opposite. This freaked me out even more, but I still kept running and finally reached the main door. I swung it open, dug into my backpack for my car keys, and got into my car. As soon as I tried to drive out of the school, I saw Miss Gemma standing just outside the school's main door and smiling at me. Her eyes were back to their previous red color, and she mouthed something close to got away, boy. This incident terrified me so much that I was sick for a week straight. My parents couldn't understand what was wrong with me. When I returned to school, I tried to narrate this incident to the principal, but he of course did not believe me. However, my story was soon spreading throughout the school and everyone was looking at me weird when I walked through the hallways or sat in class. Later that day, a boy from the senior year approached me and introduced himself as Luke. Luke was friendly, but I didn't understand why he'd approached me. After a while of small talk, he asked me if we could move to the library to get some privacy, as he wanted to share something important. The look in his eyes was sincere, so we walked to the back of the library. What Luke confessed to me shook my core and made me realize just how lucky I was. He said, Hey man, I got to know about your incident with Psycho Gemma. The thing she tried to do to you, 
has happened to several other students over the years. No one really speaks about it, and the principal doesn't do anything. One of my best friends, Andy, had detention with her two years ago, and he wasn't that lucky. She caught up to him. Poor guy. Couldn't escape her. I don't know what she did to him exactly, but after that encounter, Andy was acting weird. He wasn't the cool, friendly guy anymore, and in less than a week, he shot himself in one of the school's toilet stalls. I'm still recovering from his death, but I really want you to expose Gemma and whatever it is she does to the students. You could get a letter from your parents and ask the principal to check the CCTV footage of that evening. You can also report the assault and save a lot of kids from her. I'm not forcing you to do anything, but it would be a great help. He patted me on the shoulder and left. I thought about this and finally did as Luke requested. And yes, all of the things were recorded on the CCTV. Gemma was fired, arrested, and later admitted to a psychiatric ward. Her apartment was searched by the police and, according to the sheriff, some suspicious stuff was found in it. No official statement was released as to what she was truly up to. All I know is that she was declared mentally insane and unfit to live in our society. Some suspect it was black magic or satanic worship of some kind. I still sometimes see those bloodshot eyes in my dreams and think about that evening. Or, more specifically, what would have happened to me if I wasn't fast enough? But what do you think? What was she up to, really? This happened when I was 17 years old. It's been nearly two years now since my girlfriend broke up with me, and I was very chewed up about it on the inside. I've called her several times, but it always went to voicemail. I've tried texting her on Messenger since, ironically, we were friends on Facebook, but still, not a single response. As the weeks went by, I became very devastated and was worried that I'd never find love again. My brother told me to just forget about my ex-girlfriend and that it was time for me to move on. He introduced me to this app called Tinder, which he said was great for online dating. I was very familiar with online dating, but never actually done any of it because there was no way that I even felt like hooking up with some random person I met online. But I figured it couldn't hurt to try it out so I've decided to give it a shot. After I was finished setting up my account and was done creating my profile, I just started randomly liking a few of the girls that I thought were pretty. I'm not picky. I just wanted to make sure that I found the right girl for me. A few weeks later, I have already received my first match on Tinder. Her name was Robin. She had blue hair, freckles, and beautiful amethyst purple lips. According to her profile, she had the same interest in the stuff I was into, and was even around the same age as me. Even better, she lived in the same town as me. By the way, I live in Memphis, Tennessee. We started having friendly group chat on Tinder, which was going well. Her message said, you may not know me, but we went to the same high school. I replied, are you sure? She said, yeah, I was always the quiet one at the back of the class. Anyways, I think you're really cute. We should hang out sometime. I agreed and asked her where she wanted to hang out, where to meet her, and what time should I be there. She said we'd hang out at her place and to meet her at the park tomorrow night at around 9 p.m., to which I accepted. I got to the park that night around 9 p.m. sharp. Some time passed and I finally decided to call her to no response. I also tried texting her to no avail as well. It was around 9.30 p.m. There was still no sign of her and I was beginning to grow impatient. I was starting to think that maybe she wasn't going to show up at all. I sighed and said, I knew this was too good to be true. She's not even here yet. Ah, screw it. I'm going home. Can't believe I came out here this late for nothing. Oh well, so much for online dating. I was about to start my walk home when suddenly I saw a black convertible pull up to my location. The car stopped right in front of me and the window rolled down revealing a creepy looking old man who was probably in his mid fifties. He looked dirty and smelled like he hadn't showered in weeks. He gazed at me with a weird smile and asked, you going somewhere kid? I responded, yeah, I'm just heading home. He asked me why I was out there this late and I told him that I was supposed to meet someone but 
It seemed like she wasn't going to show up. He said, Oh, you must have been waiting for my daughter. The man by the name of Jeff introduced himself to me as Robin's father and said that Robin has told him a lot about me. He told me that Robin couldn't meet me at the park because she remembered that was the night she had to go to a party with her friends and she forgot to cancel. He told me she wouldn't be home till 11 o'clock and that's when I knew my night was a bust. He apologized and offered to give me a ride home. Well, I knew it was going to take too long for me to walk, so I accepted. It was going to be a long drive, but luckily, I knew all the shortcuts to my house. I told him where I lived and how to get there as I got into the car. After a few minutes, I was feeling tired from being out so late, so I closed my eyes for just a few short seconds and dozed off. Not long afterward, I awoke. Feeling a little drowsy, I rubbed my eyes and realized that I was still in the car. I asked the man where we were, as this wasn't the usual route to my house. He said, Relax, kid. This is a shortcut. We're almost there. I asked where we were going, and then he looked at me with some sinister grin on his face. I felt my heart almost explode out of my chest as he did that. I looked down and saw a handgun sticking out of his jacket pocket. I put two and two together and realized what was happening. I told him, Let me out now! He responded, no. Then he put his foot on the accelerator, speeding up the car. I tried to get out, but he had already put the child lock on. It seemed hopeless. I was trapped. There was no way out. To make matters worse, we were driving through a forest area with no cell service. I couldn't even call for help, but I just had to get out. As soon as the car started to slow down, I stabbed him in the shoulder with a pocket knife that I found on the floor. He screamed in pain as I was able to turn off the child lock, unlock the door, and run as fast as I could into the woods. While I was running, I could hear multiple gunshots being fired at me, but luckily, not a single one hit me. I never looked back because I had the fear of the man chasing me at the back of my mind. I dove behind a tree and hid under a bush. I heard the man yelling, You can't hide from me! I will find you! I covered my mouth with my hands and held my breath trying not to make a sound. Everything was silent for a while until I saw that the man was looking for me with a flashlight. He flashed it past me multiple times. When I heard his footsteps going deeper into the woods, that's when I knew the coast was clear. I ran using the flashlight on my phone to help navigate me through the dark and scary woods. In hindsight, I knew that was a stupid move considering the situation. I could hear the leaves crunching and the twigs snapping as I ran, which would also easily give away my position. When the crunching and snapping got louder, I looked behind me and my heart dropped when I saw that the man was chasing me. I ran as fast as I could with the man hot on my tail, firing every single last round he had in his gun, but thankfully, the shot ceased again. There's nowhere for you to hide, he said. I thought I was going to die until I heard the man trip over something and I was able to get away unharmed. I kept running until I was out of the woods and back onto the road. Looking behind me then, he was nowhere to be seen, which means I lost him. I sighed in relief, and then I saw a red car driving down the road. I was able to wave it down and tell the driver that I was kidnapped and almost killed by some crazy man in the woods. It took a lot of begging, but the driver finally gave me a ride to the police station, and I told the cops everything. Unfortunately, I didn't get the man's tag number, but I was able to give the police a clear description. After the police had run a search, they told me that he didn't even have a daughter and that they've been trying to catch this guy for months. As it turns out, he's wanted in several counties for the kidnappings, rapes, and murders of multiple teenagers and young men. How I managed to escape him is a miracle. The officers kindly gave me a ride home and I didn't tell anyone what happened except my brother. The man was never found, nor was he ever caught, and they say he's still out there even to this day which scares me the most. What's even worse is that I stupidly gave him my address, so who knows if he might try to kidnap me again. Needless to say, my days of using Tinder weren't over after that. The whole incident just made me a lot more cautious from there on out. People say that life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Some people are confused by this phrase, while others know the definite meaning of it. What this phrase means is that life 
is unpredictable. Of course, at a young age, I found out the hard way that this world can also be full of cruel, heartless, evil, sick, and very sadistic people. But it's through this horrific childhood experience that I become famously known for who I am today, a survivor of a horrendous kidnapping. My name is Julie. I'm 26 years old, and this is my story. It happened when I was 10 years old. I was walking to school by myself for the very first time when I noticed a man in his mid-30s standing by a white delivery van. He seemed like an extremely nice and very talkative person, but as you know what they say, looks can be deceiving. The man approached me with a weird, sinister-looking grin on his face and said, Good morning, kid. How are you today? I replied to him, I'm fine. That's good. What's your name, kid? Julie. Well, Julie, my name is Sebastian. Everyone calls me Bach, but you can call me Mr. B. Okay, Mr. B. Where are you headed off to, Julie? I'm going to school. Really? All by yourself? Where are your parents? They're at home, getting ready to go to work. This is my first time walking to school by myself. The same sinister grin dawned on the man's face once more, and he said, Say, Julie, want me to take you to school? What? Get in my van, Julie. I can drop you off at school. I have tons of snacks back there, too. Cakes, candies, cookies, and ice cream. This immediately got me super freaked out. I may have been 10 years old, but I had more than enough sense to not get into some random stranger's car. A little terrified, I said, No thanks, Mr. B. I can just walk. Mr. B's face turned into a combined look of annoyance and anger. He then said, All right. See you around then, you little shit. He then started the van and drove away. I sighed in relief and then thought to myself, Well, that was rude. I then brushed off the encounter and proceeded to walk to school. I don't know why, but I had the strangest feeling that it wasn't the last time I was going to see that creep. So, the entire walk to school, I kept looking behind me just to make sure he wasn't following me in his van. Just when I was halfway towards the school, I heard rapid footsteps approaching me, and then suddenly, I felt someone's arm around my waist and their hand covered my mouth, and then I was lifted off the ground. The person then proceeded to carry me towards the mysterious white delivery van. I recognized this van. I immediately knew that I was being abducted by Mr. B. I began kicking and screaming while this crazy man forcefully kept trying to drag me into his van. I tried to scream as loudly as I possibly could, but his hand was covering my mouth and he was gripping me so tightly that only little whimpers came out. I then started to bite his hand as hard as I possibly could. He screamed in pain and finally released me. I tried to make a run for it, but before I could, he grabbed me by my arm, and then I felt something cold and sharp sticking me in my neck. Next thing I knew, I was tossed into the van, and then suddenly, everything went black. Moments later, I awoke and found myself tied and taped and my head was throbbing. I then heard a door opening and footsteps coming down the stairs. It was Mr. B. Oh, good. You're finally awake. He said. He had the same sinister grin on his face and a terrifying, hungry look in his eye. Judging from the background, I wasn't in a basement. I was inside a cellar. I realized that this crazy, sick bastard drugged me when he abducted me and then tied me up and brought me here while I was unconscious. He took the tape off my mouth and with tears in my eyes, 
I cried and screamed. Please, let me go. I want to go home. I want my mommy and daddy. He slapped me in the face and yelled. Shut up, you little bitch. His slap really hurt. This man was crazy. I sobbed louder, and he slapped me again and said, I said shut up. This guy was insane. Then he got closer to my face and said, Your parents can't help you, little piglet. You belong to me now, you little shit. And if you know what's good for you, you will do what I say when I say it. I then said to him in a tearful voice, You're crazy. Mr. B then laughed manically and said, <laughs> Crazy am I? Listen, kid. Here's a little something you need to know about life. We're all crazy in our own unique way. But it's how we handle our craziness that makes us different. And believe me, kid. You haven't seen crazy. Not just yet. He then threatens me and said in a creepy, whispering voice, If you ever try to escape or tell anyone, including the police, then I will kill you and bury you in the deepest hole I can find. And then I'll go after the rest of your family. You got that, kid? With a tearful face, I nodded my head up and down in response. He then smiled, kissed me on my forehead, and said, Sleep tight. He then walked out of the room, turned off the lights, and went back upstairs. I spent the entire night in that cold, dark cellar, all tied up, and as soon as he left, I began to cry myself to sleep. I was miserable, but little did I know that was only the beginning of my troubles, and that my nightmare was just beginning. The days that followed afterwards were hectic. Every single night, when he thought I was being bad, he would torture me, beat me, starve me, and even worse, he would come down into the cellar and he would rape me. And yes, he did all those things every night. And that was only during the first week. It still brings me to tears when I recall all those things to this day. And eventually, those days turned into weeks. And those weeks turned into months. And those months finally turned into years. I'm not going to lie. During my childhood, and most of every single day and every single moment, I spent living with that crazy man can only be described in two words, pure hell. I was incredibly miserable during my childhood, and not a single day went by when I wasn't thinking about my parents and how they were feeling. Sometimes, I even wondered if they were even looking for me. And every time I asked, pleaded, and begged Sebastian to take me back to my parents, he would get furious and start beating me on the spot. It was absolute torture. Sebastian always told me that he was the only parent I would ever need and that his house and the cellar was the only home I was ever going to get. And of course, I was super devastated about it. Of course, by the time I was older, things actually got a bit better. Sebastian would even allow me to spend more free time outside the cellar. And he even had me do some work around his house to start earning my keep. And from the moment I was in my teens, he would often take me out at times, passing me off as his daughter. And there were several occasions where he would molest me, but not as much as he did when I was a child. Of course, every night, I would still have to sleep in the cellar. But of course, I didn't mind it very much, as I pretty much got used to it at that point. He would have me do chores around his house as a housekeeper, clean his car, and he would even allow me to go outside to work as a gardener. It took me years to gain his trust, but he allowed me more freedom outside the cellar. Of course, I was still thinking about my parents and my old home and my growing years, and my big chance to escape finally came when I turned 18. When I turned 18, 
He would take me out, passing me off as his wife, and would even make me do more work around the house, and would even make me do more work around the house. And on one fateful day, I finally sought the chance to escape. It was Wednesday, and the day went as usual. I got up, made Sebastian breakfast, and we went and did our daily rounds. One afternoon, I was cleaning and vacuuming Sebastian's car in the garden when Sebastian got distracted by a phone call. Because of the vacuum's loud noise, he walked away to take the call. I left the vacuum cleaner running and ran away, unseen by Mr. B, who completed the phone call without any sign of being disturbed or distracted. I ran for quite some distance through neighboring gardens and a street, jumping fences. And asking passersby to call the police, but they paid me no attention. After about five minutes, I knocked on the window of a 71-year-old neighbor, telling him who I was, and he called the police, who arrived shortly afterwards. Later that day, I was taken to the police station, and was met with the best news of my entire life. Not only did my story check out, but as it turns out. I was identified as the missing girl who's been missing since she was ten, and even better, my parents were looking for me. I also came to know that I've been missing for eight years, and my parents never stopped looking for me. I was thrilled hearing this news, and later that evening, I was finally returned home to my parents. My mom and dad rushed to hug me. And we were all in tears. The story doesn't end right there. I explained everything to my parents and to the police, and I even told them about Sebastian and what he did to me when I was ten years old. I did end up getting justice, but however, it wasn't the justice I was expecting. The next day, I was informed by the police that they found Sebastian, but he wasn't alive. Apparently, when Sebastian saw that I escaped. He knew that the police were coming for him, and he committed suicide by running in front of a moving train. I guess he would rather end his own life like the coward he was instead of facing what he's done. Call it Stockholm syndrome or whatever you want, but I honestly can't say that I don't miss Sebastian, or rather that up until his death, that I kind of felt sorry for him. Sebastian's family mourned his death, and I attended his funeral secretly. He may have been a psychotic bastard, but Sebastian was right about one thing: we're all sick in our own way, and it's how we handle our sickness that makes us different. I now wish Mr. B to rest in peace. On the other hand, several years after I returned home, my story became widely known. There were several news segments about me. I've appeared on various talk shows, had a talk show of my own, and I even became an author, writing a book about my life and about my time in captivity. I'm also currently working on a movie about my time in captivity, and I'm often called at survivor events to tell my story. And thanks to my endurance and bravery, I am still around to be telling my story for more years to come. This was written by John Johnson Jr., A.K.A. Dragon Ball Universe. This story was based on the kidnapping of Natasha Kempusch. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe to SSG Animation for more videos. I have a sweet tooth, and I love trying any and every dessert. Cookies are my absolute weakness, so when I randomly stumbled across Crumble's Instagram, I was salivating. I was bummed that they were only based in Utah, so you can imagine how excited I was when they started opening up in new locations around the country. And one of them was coming to Glendale, Arizona, where I live. I'm Jake, and I'm about to tell you why I won't be eating there again. I hate large crowds, but I had been gawking at these cookies on Instagram for at least a year. Their ever-changing menu every week was torture. I couldn't wait to dive into the richness they contained. With the creamy buttercream frosting, gooey caramel, and peanut butter options, I was willing to stand in line on grand opening day. My wife Miranda shares my passion for goodies, so she and our daughter Lily 
kept me company while we stood outside a long line, waiting to get our box of cookies. The smell of cookies teased us for about an hour before we were able to go inside. I picked Lily up and kissed her cheek. Would you like to pick a cookie to try? She looked at the display cookies and pointed out the birthday cake one. Miranda smiled. <laughs> that looks like a good choice, sweetie. Mom and Dad can't wait to try it. What cookie would you like to try, baby? I'm torn between the raspberry cheesecake and the buckeye brownie. Let's get them both. We completed our order with a classic chocolate chip cookie and took it home. We were all in the car, drooling over the smell of the fresh cookies. I was surprised at how big they were, so we all decided to cut them into even pieces and try them all after we ate dinner. Miranda made a crockpot lasagna that night, one of my favorite dinners that she makes for our family. After we had dinner, we brought the box of cookies to the table and Miranda began to slice up all the cookies into smaller pieces. She furrowed her brows as she began to cut through them and looked at me. Jake, these cookies are a little raw. I stood up to go take a look at them. Sure enough, there was some dough oozing out the center of the cookies. Maybe they're still really warm? We picked up the cookies over an hour ago. They can't be that warm at this point. Babe, they're the size of my hand. Maybe they take longer to cool off. <sighs> I'll take your word for it. I gave Lily a little slice of the birthday cake and the chocolate chip. Thanks, Daddy. You're welcome, sweetheart. The rawness was a bit off-putting, but we enjoyed them. We figured because it was a grand opening and the line stretched across the shopping center it was located in that they may have been rushing things to make sure everyone got their cookies in a timely manner. I did the dishes while Miranda put Lily to bed. She and I snuggled up in front of the TV to watch our favorite late-night comedy before we turned in for the night. It was about halfway through the show when my stomach started feeling funny. It wasn't long before Miranda started feeling sick as well. My stomach hurts. Mine too. I'm getting hot as well. Same. We decided it must have been too much sugar, so we drank some water and went to bed. We weren't getting much sleep, though. Miranda and I took turns using the bathroom to either shit or puke. It was around 4 a.m. when we heard Lily crying in her room. Miranda and I rushed down the hall to find poor Lily had had an accident in her bed, and there was vomit on the floor. Miranda picked her up and took her to the bathroom to clean up, and I gathered up her sheets to wash them and cleaned a small pile of vomit off the floor. I heard the bath water running from the laundry room, and Lily began to scream. Jake, Lily is burning up. That night, we wound up in the emergency room. None of us were keeping anything down, and we all were suffering body aches and stomach cramps. My asshole was on fire from shitting nothing but liquid, and my wife wasn't doing too hot either. Lily wasn't keeping anything down, and after doing some tests, the doctors determined we had salmonella poisoning. Miranda and I received some treatment, and we're starting to recover, but our sweet Lily was struggling. Apparently, by the time we heard her crying, she was severely dehydrated. Salmonella is a bitch on anyone, but on a little four-year-old child, it's deadly. Lily was transferred to the intensive care unit. All they could do was keep an IV in her and hope the poisoning flushed out. After a long night and late into the next day, Lily was starting to show some improvements. She had to stay at the hospital for a week to make sure her little body got it all out and was functioning again. Miranda stayed with her at the hospital while I went home. I had a bone to pick with Crumble. It was the only thing that made sense. That dough was raw, and even though cookie dough is usually harmless, I questioned the quality of ingredients they were baking with. I took a couple of days to rest up. I never threw the cookies away as I wanted Crumble to see the quality of our cookies. It was one thing to have given us bad cookies, but the way they treated me over it was completely disrespectful and disgusting. I walked into the bakery. The aroma that just the other day had me salivating made me fight the urge to puke. I walked up to the counter and placed the box on top. The kid standing there was tall and skinny. He had his customer-friendly face on until he looked down at the cookies. Then, he just got arrogant. I would like to speak to your manager. She's busy right now. What can I help you with? I warn you, kid, I'm in a pretty bad mood. I don't want to take it out on the wrong person. Please, get me your manager. There is nothing she's going to do that I can't. And if you're in a bad mood, maybe you need to get laid or something. I slammed my fist on the counter. This isn't funny, you little shit. Go get your manager. 
Okay, okay, I'm going. He picked up the phone by the register and dialed a number. Jenny, there's some dude up front with last week's cookies. I think he has a complaint. A couple of minutes later, a woman around my age came out from the back and offered a friendly smile. What seems to be the problem? I want to know what kind of cookies you served us. She opened the box and, in a smart-ass tone, said to me, It looks like raspberry cheesecake, birthday cake, buckeye brownie, and a chocolate chip. Nice job, Officer Fuckface. You really connected the dots on that one. This is serious. We were here last week for your grand opening and these gave us salmonella poisoning. My daughter is in the hospital. I'm very sorry to hear that, but sir, you have to understand these are last week's lineup. If you waited until now to consume them without proper storage, that's probably what made you sick. We're not liable for that. We ate them the night we got them. Then why did you wait until now to come in and tell us? Gee, I don't know. My wife and I were shitting and puking our organs out and my daughter spent two days in the intensive care unit. It took us a bit to get around to this. I'm sorry, sir, but you can't wait a week to make a complaint about a menu item that isn't on the menu anymore and won't be until the next time it comes around. There's nothing we can do. I just want a refund. Sorry, we don't offer refunds if it's been over a week. Unbelievable. Have the day you deserve, ma'am. I grabbed the cookies and stormed out of the bakery and got into my car. I had to make some deep breaths so I didn't drive with rage in my veins. I pulled out my phone and called the corporate number. I told them about how their cookies made my family sick and nearly killed my little Lily. Corporate apologized and all they offered was a free cookie for the inconvenience. I was shocked by the lack of care. This was a company going big and maybe they got too big too fast. I was glad I didn't throw the cookies away because they didn't look any different than the day we bought them. I took my story to TikTok and thank God it blew up. I saw that many other people had the same problem with Crumble serving them raw cookies and getting the exact same treatment I got. A commenter suggested that I call the health department and report that particular bakery. When I did, all they said was how much they love Crumble and have all their merch. My daughter is back from the hospital and after our experience with Crumble, we only eat trusted cookies either from the store or what Miranda makes. I don't understand the spell Crumble has on people. Maybe in some places it truly is good, but I will keep sharing my story and hopefully more people will come forward. Sometimes, fame gets to people's heads. It has Crumble thinking it's invincible. I won't stop exposing them. Gwen and Adam Smith were considered to be a part of the elite of our town for more than a decade. Their success story was an inspiration to every kid in our town. Both of them were extremely successful. Gwen, a lawyer, and Adam, a surgeon. Both of them were extremely busy with their work and lived on the far side of town, on top of the lone hill in a big mansion. They hardly had time for their twin kids, Lucy and Lincoln. This is where I come into the picture. I'm Susan, and I used to babysit Lucy and Lincoln on most nights a week. I picked them up from school in the afternoon, made sure they did their homework, cooked dinner for them, and put them to bed. I was more of a nanny to both the kids rather than being a mere babysitter. The pay didn't hurt one bit, and most of the times the kids were well-behaved. It wasn't much work, plus their parents did not mind if I used their internet or watched TV while the kids napped. This job was helping me pay my mother's medical bills and keeping our family afloat. It was a win-win for all. Until it wasn't. Everything went downhill after that one phone call on that fateful stormy night. There is something you guys should know. I never used to babysit the kids on a weekend, as it was a time they spent with their parents, bonding and catching up, is what Mrs. Smith described it as. It never really bothered me, as I got the weekends off to spend with my family and drive my mom to the doctor's. That night, it was around 8.30, when me and my mom and my brother returned from one of my mother's routine checkups, she has stage 2 cancer, so hospital visits are as often for our family as visiting the grocery store. It was a Saturday, and my phone started ringing. I initially thought it was one of my friends wanting to catch up in the local bar, but instead, my screen displayed Mrs. Smith's name. I was a bit confused, as she never texted or called on a weekend, unless it was an emergency. 
I pick up the call and ask, Hello, Mrs. Smith, what's the matter? Hi, Susan, sorry to bother you, but could you look after the kids tonight? I and Adam have to go to a dinner party. It was very unusual as the couple was almost adamant about spending time with their kids on the weekend. Sure, Mrs. Smith, I'll be there in an hour. Let me settle my mom in and I'll head over. Sure thing, Susan. We are waiting for you. Mrs. Smith, or should I say Gwen, hung up, and I went back to taking care of my mom. By the time I left my home, mom had slept and my brother was watching TV. On the drive to their mansion, the road was unusually foggy, as if preventing me from reaching their house. I wish I would have returned to mine, but the thought of piling up bills in my mom's deteriorating condition kept me on the road. In about 40 minutes, I was there in their driveway, parking my beat-up car. Gwen and Adam were in their driveway, too, getting into their brand-new SUV. Hey there, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I greeted the couple. Hey, Susan. Gwen greeted me back, and Adam just nodded at me. The twins are asleep. It's already past their bedtime. I and Adam will return late tonight. Just keep them company. Don't let them have a midnight snack. And just text me if you need anything, Gwen instructed me before leaving, and got into the passenger seat beside her husband. It was a little weird that their driver was missing. I didn't think much of it back then. Maybe it was a last-minute plan and the driver couldn't make it as I did. Before their car rolled out the front gate, Gwen yelled and let me know she saved a piece of chocolate cake for me and that it was on the counter. Yep, fancy desserts were a common thing, too. I loved this job. Once I entered the mansion, it was dark inside. Usually the couple left a few lights on at all times to keep the house illuminated. I switched on a few lights in the drawing room, grabbed a piece of chocolate cake, and sat on the couch watching TV. For the first hour, I was so engrossed in the TV and the dessert that I did not notice that the house was too quiet, as if I was the only one there. The kids slept through the night on most days, but sometime either of them would wake up for a midnight snack or have a bad dream. It was common for me to put them back to bed and maybe read a bedtime story, too. I thought it must be one of those days when the twins slept through the entire night. Still, my instinct told me something was wrong. I waited for half an hour more and then headed upstairs to the kids' room. Lucy and Lincoln had separate bedrooms on either side of the hallway and then, at the end of the hallway, was the master bedroom where their parents slept. When I opened Lucy's bedroom, I wasn't much worried when I found it empty. The girl often slept in her brother's room if she was scared or had a bad dream. But the sight I saw when I opened Lincoln's bedroom door is etched into my memory forever. Both the kids were hanged by a noose from the ceiling fan. Their eyes were still open as if they were very much alive. I tried to free them, but when I touched Lucy's body, she was cold and stiff, as if she had passed away hours ago. I knew Lincoln was no different. I screamed and stumbled out of the room. I ran toward the master bedroom to fetch the emergency phone Gwen left in there. But when I opened the master bedroom door, I knew I was in deep, deep trouble. Both Mr. and Mrs. Smith were hanging by the ceiling fan, the exact same way their kids were hanged just down the hall. I was terrified and screaming and running back downstairs. I didn't know what to do. I could still feel their open eyes on me as I called 911. When the cops got there, I was sitting in the driveway, weeping and hysteric. I did not know what was going on. The police did their investigation and questioned me. I told them all that had happened and also mentioned the fact that I had spoken to Gwen and Adam as they left the mansion. I did not understand how they were hanging inside their own bedroom when they left in front of my own eyes. Naturally, I was pinned as the prime suspect for the murder of a family of four. Right now, I'm narrating this story to you from a prison cell where I have been locked for the past six years. They say I killed the Smith family, but I swear I didn't do it. I would never harm the kids nor their parents. They say I'm insane and have mental disorders. How is that possible? 
I'm totally fine. Can't they see I'm being framed for a murder? I told them I met the couple before they went out for the dinner party, but the investigators say that I didn't meet the couple in the driveway. I clearly remember meeting them, though. I asked them to check the CCTV footage, but the footage they showed me has me standing in the driveway, alone. No sight of Mr. or Mrs. Smith. They say I forced the family to hang themselves. Why would I do that? They were paying my bills by giving me employment. Why would anyone want to lose such a job? I firmly believe that I'm being framed, but all the evidence is against me. The CCTV had recorded me arriving in the mansion, but I clearly remember talking to Gwen. I remember eating the last piece of chocolate cake. How would I know that there was a single slice of chocolate cake if Gwen hadn't mentioned it? Why is anyone not believing me? I couldn't even attend my mother's funeral as the doctors and the cops think I'm too dangerous for the world. They think I can hurt people. How is that possible? I was just a girl who was trying to provide for her family and take care of her mom. Why does no one see that I'm being framed? I don't know what's going on anymore. I'm so confused and lost. All I know is that I didn't do it. What do you think is the truth? Am I innocent? Who did I see in the driveway if the couple was already dead? And more importantly, who called me pretending to be Mrs. Smith? I swear, I didn't do it. If you're a U.S. resident, then you're familiar with the cookie bakery called Crumble. It started in Logan, Utah and blew up. They now have 300 locations in 36 states. Their cookies are famous for being the size of your whole hand and a consistently changing menu. Different flavor cookies every week so you never get the same thing twice in a row. I have been a loyal customer from Salt Lake City for the past couple years, but after my recent experience, I won't be coming back. It started a few months ago. Since the pandemic, I ordered curbside pickup and never really broke the habit as I never like leaving the car anyway. For a long time, the service was exceptional. I would order through the app, leave them a tip, and click the here button when I pulled up. They would bring me my box of cookies and I would take them home and enjoy them throughout the week. They never got my order wrong either, which was something I counted on every time. On a typical Monday, I placed my mobile order after work. Four cookies, three of them were each of the new flavors and a chocolate chip which is on every week. Their flavors are always amazing, but there is something about the chocolate chip with their milk that they sell with the cookies that makes me nostalgic. I pull up to the Crumble store and tap here on the app. Usually my order is out in two minutes, but that day I waited for 45 minutes before I decided to call them. Thank you for calling Crumble in Sugar House. This is the manager. How can I help you today? Hi, I placed a mobile order and tapped the here button on the app and I have been waiting 45 minutes in your parking lot for someone to bring it to me. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. So when you pulled up to the bakery, there's a button that you can push. I pushed that button. You what? I know what button to push. I've done it a hundred times. Did you push it on the app? Oh, for fuck's sake. That's what I'm telling you. 45 minutes ago, I pulled up, tapped here, and I have been waiting. Oh, okay. It's not showing up in our system that you confirmed you're here. I've obviously been here. Yes, I will have your order sent out right away. I hung up, and sure enough, a male employee was on his way to my car. But they were only carrying a single cookie box instead of the four cookie box that I ordered. I rolled down my window and he smiled at me. I paid for four cookies. I sincerely apologize for your wait. Here is your cookie. According to my bank account, I've been charged for four. Oh, our system says you just ordered one. I showed him my order receipt on my phone. Okay. And he went back inside. Within a couple of minutes, he brought out the correct order. Since they have been consistently good to me, I let the incident slide, but decided I wouldn't tip them anymore. I continued to hit them up every Monday, and things went back to normal, but I still wouldn't leave a tip. A few months went by, and they pulled the same thing. I again waited 45 minutes for my order, and we had a repeat. 
I was a bit shorter with them than I was last time and still refused to tip them. Because it had only been a couple of times, I still let it go. Everyone and everything has an off day once in a while. I had another incident where I worked late at the office one night. During the week, Crumble closes at 10 p.m. I placed my order at 9.30 and when I got out of the office at 9.45, I made the trip to Crumble to pick up my order that should have been ready by the time I got there. I pulled up and saw some employees still inside with the lights on. I tapped the here button and I waited. I was parked directly in front of the place so they should have known I was there to pick it up. I watched them make a box of cookies, assuming it was mine, so I waited patiently. Being 10 p.m., I was the only one there, and I didn't think they could miss that. They finished frosting the cookies and placed them all in the box. Then the workers proceeded to shut off the lights and walked out the back having not brought out my order at all. I checked my bank and I was indeed charged the $14 that I usually paid for my box of cookies. To say I was pissed was an understatement. I got on the Crumble Instagram page and sent a direct message to them. I let them have it and mentioned the times that their curbside had screwed up. I let them know I was out of money and no cookies. They have over a million followers, so I wasn't even sure they were going to see it. I only sent it because I needed to bitch someone out and all I could do was get on their social media at the time. I was surprised to see that they had messaged me back sincerely apologizing for the inconvenience and they would like to make it right. I rolled my eyes and waited until the next day to call them. Thank you for calling Crumble in Sugar House. This is the manager. How can I help you? Hi, I'm Lacey and last night I ordered a box of four cookies around 9.30 p.m. I understand it was closing by the time I got to the bakery, but your employees saw me pull up, made an order, and just left. Oh shoot, I am so sorry to hear that. Would you like a refund? What I want is a refund and my box for free. That was completely unacceptable customer service. I understand, but all I can do is offer you a refund. Your corporation wanted to make it right but didn't say how they would, so I'm taking that as I'm making the demands. All I ask is my cookies and my money back. Ma'am, I can't just give you a box of cookies and a refund. It has to be one or the other. Fine, I'll take my cookies, but I want you to know that this is bullshit and I never want to come back here again. We're sad to see you go. I'll be there in five minutes to pick up my box of cookies and they better be fresh. I hung up and drove down to the crumble on my lunch break. They brought out my cookies and I took them back to the office and dug into my chocolate chip cookie. It was still warm and the chocolate was gooey delicious. I had nearly forgotten about Crumble's error the night before and thought maybe I will give them another chance since this cookie was one of the best ones they had ever served me. I dunked my cookie into the ice cold milk and took a large bite, allowing myself to get lost in the flavors. Suddenly, I could taste something metallic, and I bit into something sharp and hard. I spit up the mashed up cookie in my mouth and saw blood mixed in with it. Whatever it was cut up my mouth and I was bleeding profusely. What the fuck? I grabbed a napkin from my desk drawer and dabbed my mouth. I went to the bathroom and swished water around in my mouth to wash out the blood. I discovered that one of my teeth was missing and I had cut up the gums around it pretty badly. I went back to my desk to clock out and head to an emergency dentist to see what they could do to repair the damage. As I was on the phone with them, I was sifting through all the gunk I just spit up and pulled out a large screw. Inside my chocolate chip cookie was this thick metal screw that I didn't notice until it was too late. I hung up with the dentist and made a quick TikTok video of what I found in my cookie and what it did to my mouth. I went to the dentist and luckily since it was a back molar that had been knocked out, I could arrange to get an implant after my gums heal up. They gave me stitches as I was scrolling through TikTok that night in bed. I had a lot of comments and messages. There had been at least a dozen more cases of people finding screws in their cookies. The next day, I called the Crumble location and told them what was in my cookie. All the manager said was, maybe next time you'll remember to leave a tip. 
I did bring this up to Crumble's attention, but all they did was apologize and offer a free cookie, which I vehemently turned down and told them to take their business and fuck off. Personally, I think Crumble grew too fast and now they think they're invincible. Selling cookies with screws inside them is dangerous and I was lucky to only have my mouth cut up and lost a tooth. If I had swallowed that screw, I could have lost my life. Hey, stop! You're pouring a liter of soda on my car! Stop it! You what are you doing? Illegally. I, I told you to move you it! You I didn't was just move delivering it. a pizza! Oh, that's my pizza! No, it's I not! Hey! Me. The following story is an animated, dramatized version of the footage. Over the past few years, a lot of delivery services have opened doors of opportunity. It's been really convenient when you want something, but don't want to or can't get it yourself. Not only does it benefit customers, but it's been an amazing side gig when you want that extra cash. I was a graveyard security guard at night, so during the day, I would make a few DoorDash deliveries. I'm Kenny, and I loved my side job doing DoorDash until I came across this random woman on a street I frequently delivered on. For the past year, this is a woman who works from home and orders from DoorDash frequently. She took full advantage of this service by ordering from anywhere and everywhere. Most of the time, she ordered healthier foods like salads and iced tea. But once in a while, girlfriend indulged herself on Little Caesar's Pizza. Her name was Alyssa, and she was easily a decade older than me, but I had a crush on her. Delivering to her is a bit out of my way, but one day, I decided to go the extra mile for that bigger buck. That's when I saw her, and I knew the next time this address placed an order, I would be the one to take it. For the past year, we've had an ongoing flirtatious interaction between us. I wanted to ask her out, but I was too damn shy. I swear she was attracted to me too, but I could never work up the courage. I saw Alyssa two times a week, and I finally worked up the courage to ask her out. I rang her doorbell and she answered in her Zoom meeting attire. Business on the top, lazy on the bottom. Her hair was up in a slick ponytail, a blouse, and my god, she usually wore yoga pants, but that day, she had no pants. Kinney, my DoorDash hero. Alyssa smiled as she leaned seductively against the doorway. I responded bashfully. Uh, hey, Alyssa, I got your chicken Caesar salad. I held up the bag and her iced tea, and she took them with gratitude in her eyes. Delivered in perfect condition. Thank you, Kenny. I can always count on you. You're very welcome, Alyssa. I flashed my signature flirtatious smile at her, and I swear her cheeks turned a shade of pink. You're not seeing anyone, right, Alyssa? Of course I'm not, silly. Why do you ask? I'm hoping to take you out on a date sometime. She smiled at me as though she'd been waiting for me to say something along those lines. I'm free this weekend. Pick me up at 8 o'clock, Friday night? Yes, absolutely. Can't wait. Until then, you better text me. I walked away with a pep in my step. I got in my car and shot her a text. She responded with a winky face and I felt my body warm with happiness. I get a date with Alyssa. It was a Tuesday afternoon, so I had a couple of days to prepare for our date. That week, she was ordering DoorDash every single day. It made me feel weird delivering her food as she avoided talking about the date unless we were texting. I tried not to think of it much, but it bothered me. Even on Friday, she ordered DoorDash and got a Little Caesars pizza with a 2-liter Diet Coke. I found it odd she got a soda as she usually got some sort of iced tea. Even if the restaurant didn't serve it, she'd order it from a gas station in a bottle. I shouldn't have been surprised as she was acting weird since I asked her out. I parked in front of her house as usual, and I pulled up the app to show I had arrived. With fall approaching, I had my windows rolled down in my truck that day to enjoy the oncoming crisp air. I heard a bang on the hood of my truck and looked up to see this elderly woman shouting profanities at me. Move your fucking truck, asshole! You can't park here, you son of a bitch! She continued to pound on the hood of my truck as she yelled at me. Ma'am, I... Can you please stop hitting my truck? I'm just making a food delivery and I'll be gone. She walked to the passenger window and snatched the two-liter Diet Coke out of the seat. Excuse me, that is not yours. Fuck off, prick. I told you to leave. You can't park here. Now get out. Ma'am, I'm just making a DoorDash delivery. If you'd let me get this done, I can be gone. 
She ignored me, opened the soda bottle, and proceeded to dump it all over my windshield. Do you understand now? You can't park here and you need to leave. Stop dumping that fucking soda all over my truck. Get out of here, fucker. She went back up to the passenger window. Oh, look. It's a pizza. Don't you... She reached in and snatched the box, and I tried to grab it out of her hands, but she jerked it away. Damn it! I cursed as rage built up inside me. I looked up to see that old woman getting away with Alyssa's food, and I don't know what came over me. I've had to go through anger management before. I started to channel my inner coping mechanisms and took deep breaths. It was a $5 pizza and a soda. Nothing I couldn't replace. I sat there gripping my steering wheel. DoorDash is how I paid for this damn truck, and I was not about to let myself screw it up with my rage. I sat there, seeing nothing but red, trying to change my thinking and calm myself down, when suddenly a slice of pizza hit the windshield. I jerked in response to being startled and saw the cheese, pepperoni, and sauce oozing slowly down the windshield. Next thing I knew, a slice of pizza hit me square in the face. It was still very hot, and it boiled against my skin. I screamed out in pain as I shook off the pizza and peeled the cheese away from my cheek. I looked over and rolled up my window in time before another slice collided with me. That old bat was back harassing me. I told you to leave. That had done it for me. I don't know who this psycho, wrinkly bitch thought she was, but I'd had enough and nothing was going to hold me back from showing this old bitty that she was messing with the wrong guy. I put my truck into drive and peeled out after her. She screamed at the top of her lungs and dropped the pizza, running as fast as her frail legs could carry her. I revved up my engine as I rammed my truck into her. Her body flew up onto the hood of my truck and hit the roof, rolling back down and hitting the ground. The cracking sound of bones shattering echoed through the street. You wanted me to leave? You just got your way, you crazy old bat! I could hear her screaming out in pain as I put my truck in reverse and ran over her again. Her flesh squelched under my tires as I dismembered her. I put the truck in drive and went to run her over again, but this time, another body flew up over my truck and landed with a crashing thud on the pavement. I heard a familiar voice scream out, and I put the truck in park, getting out. I ran to the person lying on the ground. Alyssa. Blood was sputtering out of her mouth, and she was choking. Oh my god! What have I done? I grabbed my phone and called an ambulance. I knelt down and cradled her head in my lap. Alyssa, I'm... So sorry. K Kitty, you just killed m my Aunt Faye. That was your aunt? I'm sorry. She was crazy. My vision began to blur. The girl I'd been chasing for a year was now dying in my lap next to her aunt that I single-handedly turned into roadkill. Alyssa was gone by the time the ambulance arrived, and I was arrested on the spot. It's... Not that I won't do DoorDash anymore, it's that I can't. If you're wondering if I regret my choices, I don't. That wasn't the first time I've killed doing a DoorDash delivery. They've yet to find out about the others. I knew Alyssa was slipping her aunt some food, which she personally asked me to slip some poison into to drive her to the point of insanity. I never intended to run over her, but... Collateral damage happens. Next time you trust a family member to order DoorDash for you, I recommend you double-check your food. You never know what someone's true intentions are, even if you think you know them. The world of horror content creators it's not easy. People ask and ask for new videos without knowing how long it takes us to make them. I'm James. I'm 19. But until I was 17, I was a well-known urban explorer. In my early days, I was a paranormal investigator. But I never found anything, and my audience was getting bored. I went viral in a video that surpassed a million views, but my subscribers started to drop over time. After a few months of unremarkable content, I stopped making horror videos and dedicated myself only to explorations. My channel started growing again. Eventually, I made a new series of videos that consisted of me having the challenge of staying all night in different places. 
In the first videos, I stayed in the post office building, in a shopping mall, and a huge gym. For the next video, I had to target the most complicated place I had done so far. Walmart. I had everything planned. I was going to hide behind some cushions at closing time. I had a backpack with water and food. I didn't plan to steal. Since there were cameras and they could expose me if they caught me, in the worst case scenario, I preferred to keep it all as a teenage prank. Come nightfall, everything went as expected. The guards seemed to look around the place without much interest, more focused on going home than finding someone hiding. I decided to let the time pass by sleeping, setting my cell phone alarm to ring a few hours later. In the early morning, I was awakened by the sound of my cell phone and I pulled back the pillows. I looked around and confirmed that my plan had been a success. I was alone. I started to investigate the Walmart. I entertained myself in the game section and even watched the TVs for a while, documenting everything that was going on. At first, I thought this was going to be a complicated video to make, but it turned out to be the easiest one I had made so far. I was having a lot of fun exploring the place, but it all ended when I peeked into the food section and realized one thing. I wasn't alone. At first, I thought a guard had stayed longer without me knowing, but that person was dressed differently. The man was in a black t-shirt and short shorts, standing casually looking at the dairy prices. Upon noticing me, the man turned around, looking me straight in the eye and started calling me like a dog, crouching down and whistling at me. As he slowly walked towards my position, I lowered the camera and stopped filming out of fear. I didn't know why, but this person didn't look like someone else making a challenge, or perhaps a homeless man. This person was someone who wanted to catch me and hurt me. As the man came closer and closer, my body, paralyzed with terror, managed to move back a few centimeters. Many people often question me and say that if they were me, they would have ran in desperation. But you'll never know how you'll react in such a situation until you're in there. As I stood there, I felt like an animal terrified of its natural predator. Standing there at 17 years old, thinking about how to escape, the face of evil slowly approached me. A few seconds later, which felt like minutes, he was already very close to me. Despite my fear, my body remembered how to react, and I ran away as far as I could from that man. Somehow, in just a few meters, I had him next to me again. His face was even worse than before. At least he was looking at me with curiosity. But since I ran, his face was only of happiness and malice. I thought about reasoning with him. But before I could speak, the man hit me very hard with his right hand, knocking me to the ground. I tried to stop him, but he climbed on top of me and prevented me from getting up. Tears ran down my eyes in despair, and he punched me incessantly in the face, smiling. My tears were confused with blood spurting out of my face. I felt like I was going to faint at any moment. The man seemed aware of my situation, so he stopped hitting me, and without saying anything, pulled a knife out of his pants. He looked at me smiling and threatening to stab me in the chest, but stopped halfway and continued laughing, tormenting me. Before I could react, he grabbed my right hand and slowly plunged his knife into my palm. The pain was indiscernible, as he did not immediately stab my hand. The man slowly pierced the knife in and began to twist it hatefully. Meanwhile, his eyes were still fixed on me. This man did not care about the damage he was causing me, but he enjoyed seeing the expression of pain on my face. A few seconds later, I heard loud noises behind us. It was the police who had somehow found us. The man pulled the knife out of my body and went running quickly to them to try to kill them. But with several shots in the leg, he realized he wasn't going to win and had to give up. At first, they didn't trust me either. But after seeing that I was just a kid with bruises on my face and a huge hole in my hand, they had no choice but to believe me. When I was finally reassured that my life was no longer at risk, I closed my eyes and collapsed to the ground. The policeman rushed me to the hospital, 
but I had lost too much blood. Shortly after waking up and receiving the scold of my life from my angry but concerned parents, I learned that Walmart was not going to press charges for trespassing during the night. Even though no guards are monitoring the whole place, they have lots of cameras and people monitoring them at times. So they witnessed everything that had happened between me and this psycho. Speaking of him, neither the police nor my parents told me much. But a few days later, I saw the news and I dropped the remote control out of fear. The man was a cannibal who enjoys savagely beating his food unconscious before devouring it. Today, I don't know what life will be like for this man or the rest of my acquaintances who had urban exploration. But after that day, I knew I had to give up this type of content. I won't have the same amount of viewers, but lately, I started telling stories of psychopathic killers. A lot of people think they're lies or that they're exaggerated, but they don't know how exaggerated reality can be and how a man almost devoured me in a Walmart. One of my favorite memories as a kid happened during a particular sleepover. My friends came over to spend the weekend, and I always remembered how we ordered a Papa John's pizza every night during that weekend. That precious memory stuck with me as I grew older, and what happened that night eventually became a habit, as I always order a Papa John's pizza every night during the weekend. Most of the time, I'd invite some of my friends over, and it didn't take long before they coined the term Papa John's Weekends. It had become something we always looked forward to after a long week of work, and we always had a good time whenever we did it. Now, a strange thing recently happened during one of our fun weekends. I had some friends over, and as usual, we ordered a couple of pizzas from Papa John's. When the pizzas arrived, I answered the door to take our order, and that's when I noticed something strange. The delivery guy, whose name was Jace, had a very disturbing look in his eyes. It looked like he was angry about something, and for some reason, all that anger was targeted at me as he intensely stared at me with a malicious look on his face. My friends who were there noticed this strange behavior and asked me if I knew him or the reason for his rude demeanor, but I was just as confused as I told them I had never met that man before in my life. We decided to brush it off that night as we didn't want anything to spoil the mood, but the same thing happened the next night when we ordered our usual pizza as the strange delivery man came back with the same attitude that he had had the night before. It eventually became a reoccurring problem for me every time I ordered a pizza, as it was always the same angry delivery guy who delivered my order. Things got worse from there as I noticed him following me around during the week and hanging around my house. My friends also noticed this, and they told me to call the cops, but I decided not to as I didn't want things to escalate any further. One Friday night at around 12.02 a.m., someone started to incessantly ring my doorbell. Shocked, I wondered who could be visiting me at this hour, so I went to the door to check. As I looked through the peephole, my heart dropped to my stomach, as standing there with bulging red eyes was that strange delivery man. He rang the doorbell for a while, and when I didn't answer, I heard him making his way to the back of my house. Terrified, I wondered what he was going to do now and that's when I realized my bedroom window was still open. I rushed to close it, but by the time I got there, I was too late, as I saw him standing in my bedroom. Scared, I screamed, What do you want from me, you psycho? He then calmly looked at me and said, I just want to talk. I looked around for my phone to call the cops, and I realized that I left it on the counter. I made an attempt to reach for it, but he was faster than me, as he grabbed the phone saying, Please, just hear me out before you call the cops. I knew I had no choice now, so I listened as he said. My brother Matthew went missing a couple of months ago. He was a pizza delivery guy like me, and we both worked at Papa John's. The cops still have no leads to his whereabouts, so I decided to check out the locations of the last deliveries he made that night. As he spoke, I realized he was telling the truth as the cops had come over a few months back to ask me if I knew anything about the disappearance. So I told him. I heard about that, but as I told the police officers that day, I don't know anything that might have happened to him after he delivered the pizza I ordered that night. Jace, who now had tears in his eyes, then said, He isn't the first one of our employees to go missing. 
and I can't help thinking that it's my fault because I got him this job. That's why I felt I needed to do something, which is why I've been following you around to see if you had anything to do with it. I was still scared, but I started to sympathize with the strange man, so I said, Look, man, I understand. I'd probably do something crazy too if I lost a family member, but that's what the cops are for. You can't be breaking into homes and taking matters into your own hands. When I was done talking, Jace then said, I'm sorry, but I just had to check and make sure. Either way, you seem like a nice person, so I apologize for all the inconvenience and trauma I've caused. I'm going to leave now, so please don't call the cops. I promised him I wouldn't and offered him any help in finding his brother. But as he stood up to leave, I found myself staring at his neck. I really didn't want to, but it had been a while and I couldn't help myself. So I picked up my pocket knife and stabbed him in the neck. As he fell to the floor bleeding, I found myself getting excited at the sight of his blood. The mixed look of terror and confusion in his eyes made me feel a little bit sad, so I decided to give him an explanation. I'm really sorry, dude, but I had to. You see, Jace, from a very young age, I realized I had something called hematolagnia. It's basically a blood fetish, as I always find myself getting excited and aroused by the sight of blood. Jace was struggling now as he tried to stop the blood that was gushing from his neck, so I continued with. When I was ten, I cut my dog open with a kitchen knife because I wanted to see his insides, and I told my family that he'd run away. When I was twelve, I pushed a girl off the top of a high jungle gym. The impact crushed her skull, and... I can never forget the amazing feeling I got from seeing her blood spill out. As I got older, I found myself wanting more, so I picked my victims off in parks or in the street at night. I mostly killed homeless men and women, in addition to late-night walkers, but doing that was a bit too risky, so I decided to work smarter. And around last year, Jace, I had an amazing epiphany when I ordered a Papa John's pizza, as I realized that the men and women who worked in delivery were the perfect prey to satisfy my urges. I mean, these are people whose jobs take them all over the city, so accurately tracking down their last locations prove difficult, even for the cops. It's not like I had anything against the delivery people at Papa John's Pizza. Matter of fact, I love your pizzas. But sometimes, Jace, the urge is so strong and I just can't help myself. You understand, right? As I looked towards Jace's motionless body, I realized that I'd been talking to a corpse. He was dead now, but there was still fun to be had as I repeatedly stabbed his body with my knife, and, similar to a fun piñata, I shrilled in excitement every time his blood spilled out. When I had my fill of fun, I decided it was time to get to work. I moved his bloody corpse first before I cleaned out my room with bleach. I then took off his clothes before taking his corpse to the basement. After putting on some protective gear, I put his body into one of the four barrels of sulfuric acid that I had. And just like his brother, I knew there'd be no trace of him in a couple of days. When I was done, I put on the Papa John's restaurant uniform that I'd gotten from one of my victims, and I went outside to Jace's car. I did this in case any eyewitnesses had seen him break into my house. I then drove the car deep into the nearby forest and made sure to use gloves when touching the steering wheel so that there wouldn't be any prints in the car. There were no cameras in my neighborhood, so when the cops come over to ask their routine questions, it is only my words they'll believe. Doing this was hungry work, so when I got back home I decided to order another Papa John's pizza. The delivery girl's name was Abby, and as I paid for the pizza, I smiled, because I really couldn't wait to see what her insides looked like. I would like to think I'm an accomplished woman. I was able to buy my first home at just 25 years old. It's nothing big and fancy, but it's just me, and I live comfortably in it. Moving into the suburbs, my parents gave me a housewarming party, and their gift to me was a doorbell dash cam. You can't be too careful these days. 
Thanks, Dad. I was wanting one of these. I hugged my parents, and we enjoyed the rest of the party. The next day, my dad came by to help me install it. After that, I started working into my new daily routine. Now that I lived in the suburbs, I went running in the mornings instead of hitting the treadmill at my apartment complex. I loved sprinting in the fresh air every morning before work. It always woke me up for the day and gave me a good dose of serotonin. One morning, I returned home from my run and turned on the shower when my phone pinged. It was a notification from my doorbell camera. I picked up my phone and looked at the live footage. It was 7 a.m., so the sun was barely coming up. But a dark shadow was lurking outside my front door. My porch light was connected to my Amazon Echo, so I was able to turn it on from where I was. Alexa, turn on the porch light. The porch light turned on, and whoever was at my door began to run away before I could make them out. I shrugged, thinking whoever it was might have been some door-to-door -door salesman. I took my shower and went to work. The next morning, I got up to go running a little earlier than usual, so I took advantage and ran an extra couple of miles. I went down a path that I don't normally go, but it looked well lit, so I figured it would be safe. While running on this path, I came across a mobile home that looked abandoned. Though I couldn't see anyone, I felt as though the windows of the trailer were watching me. I decided to go home once I found the clearing. Despite heading back to the safety of my usual route, I still felt as though someone was watching me, and it made me uncomfortable. I got home safely and locked the door behind me. My phone pinged as I was getting ready for my shower. I went to look at the camera footage. What I saw made my stomach drop. Gazing straight into the camera was a man with eyes that were unnaturally far apart and a grin bigger than the Cheshire cat himself. I watched, paralyzed with fear as he went to the window in the living room and busted it open. I snapped out of my paralysis and made a mad dash for my bathroom and locked myself inside. I didn't hesitate to call the police. 911, what is your emergency? There's a man inside my house. I gave them my address and they arrived within minutes, but the intruder was gone. I gave my statement and they informed me that all they could do was keep an eye out for him and to call them immediately if I see him. I was freaked out and unable to wipe the image of that man's face from my mind. I don't know who he was or what he wanted. Was he the same man that my porch light chased away? I had to go stay at my parents' house for a few days, and my dad helped me replace the window that was broken. One night, I was having dinner with my parents, and a news report showed up on the television. His picture from my camera was displayed on the television screen. Suddenly, someone was knocking on the door. My mom got up to answer it, and a gunshot sounded before she dropped dead. My dad stood up and was shot before he could come between myself and this man. I looked at him. He had the same expression on his face. Those eyes that were miles apart, looking in different directions. That smile. That horrific, eerie smile. He said nothing. Just tilted his head to the left, slowly to the right, and took small steps toward me. My heart began to pound violently through my chest. The fear I felt inside, I was positive it would kill me. I had heard of dying of fright, and I never thought fear could actually take a person down until that night. As if he couldn't appear any more unnatural, his face began to distort as though it was melting. Are you afraid of me, Jessica? How? How do you know my name? That's what you're worried about. I tried to take a step back, but it's as though my legs are made of lead. I looked at him, wanting to ask what he wants, yet I can't speak anymore. Why did you break into my house? Why did you look into my camera like that? What do you want from me? He just keeps getting closer and closer. Suddenly, he starts to growl. Like a demon in a horror movie, his body twitches and writhes as he's brought down to his hands and knees. He suddenly crawls towards me at an unnatural speed 
and I'm trapped where I stand. I feel a sharp pain, and then my eyes open. I woke up in the guest bedroom at my parents' house, drenched in cold sweat. I rushed to my parents' room and found them asleep in their bed. I was only supposed to stay a couple of days, but it's been weeks now. I don't know when I'll feel safe again. I went back to bed and replayed the photos my camera took. I had submitted them to the police the night he broke in. I know the logical thing to do would be to delete the pictures, but the problem is police haven't found him yet. And even though I couldn't possibly forget his face, I don't want to forget what he looks like should he show up again. I keep them as a reminder to stay out of unknown territory. It's not confirmed, but something in my gut tells me that he followed me home that day and was the pair of eyes I felt watching me from that trailer. No one knows who he is, but to the police, he's known as Smile. Snapchat is one of the most popular apps amongst teens and young adults. It's a way to share your day with your friends, send each other pictures, and play with filters. I used it a lot through high school, and now I'm in college. It's helped me connect with new people. I'm Daphne, and this is why I don't use Snapchat anymore. It wasn't unusual for me to get friend requests after classes started in the new semester, and some of them I accepted, others I didn't. There was always a mix of bots that would add me as well. They'd always friend me and send me some sort of message to check out their sexy content. Those I blocked and reported. Due to the high cost of tuition and losing my job, I had to drop out of school and look for another job. It was really difficult to find one that I could make enough money to pay tuition and I was feeling completely hopeless. I walked out of an interview for a fast food place and checked my phone. I saw that someone added me on Snapchat and checked it out. It was a guy named Logan and his bitmoji seemed kind of cute. He sent me a picture of himself with the caption, hey. His picture was very attractive and I decided to accept him as a friend. I took a cute selfie and sent it to him with the caption, hi. We began messaging back and forth. Hi there, I'm Logan. Hi Logan, I'm Daphne. You live in Atlanta too? Yes I do. Are you attending university? I was. Why not anymore? I lost my job and couldn't pay for tuition. Sorry to hear about that. It's okay. Do you go? Yeah, and I happen to be the richest guy on campus. That must be nice. We continued to chat late into the night. I began to feel an attraction to him as he was hilarious and good looking to boot. I wondered if he needed to be up for school the next day, but he insisted it was fine. We talked consistently over the next couple of days when Logan offered me something that should have been a red flag but when that stupid fast food place declined my application, I was desperate. You wanna work for me? What would I be doing? I think you're really attractive and would like you to make content just for me. What would that entail? You make videos and take pictures based on what I want. I have a lot of money and can pay for you to come back to school. I had an odd feeling about where this was going, but when you're desperate, you'll do what you have to do. How much? $3,500 a week. Just making content for you? Yes. Do you use PayPal? I do. Send me your PayPal. I sent him my PayPal information and to my surprise, he sent me $3,500. To be honest, I've dabbled in sugar baby stuff before, but never went through with it because they always ask for money up front. Logan just gave it to me. This week, I want pictures of just your feet. I want 10 pictures and we'll pay extra if you feel like sending extra. He described to me the different kinds of foot pictures to send him. He wanted my feet to be covered in something edible from dripping with honey to smothered in cake with frosting and a pot of chili. I did everything he asked and extra just to see if he would pay extra. To my surprise, he did. The content escalated to more risque things, but I was getting so comfortable with it as he paid up. Within a month, I was caught up with my bills and able to come back to school. It was nice being able to attend classes and take the weekends to create the content he asked for and I sent it to him. There was one week he didn't send payment and it was after I sent him his requested videos. One day, I saw a guy on campus and thought he looked familiar. I ran up to him. Logan? He gave me a strange look, asking who I was. It's me, Daphne. 
I don't know a Daphne. What? I've been sending you content for weeks now and I wanted to say you're late on payment. I have no idea what you're talking about. He walked away leaving me confused and a part of me felt violated. I have shown this guy everything for the money and he acted like he had no idea who I was in public? I suppose I understood. Maybe this was a dirty secret for him. God knows it was for me. I went to my American literature class and sat down. The professor insisted we call him Doug. A lot of professors insisted we call them by their first names. I noticed Doug kept glancing at me through the lecture. He was an older man and I picked up on the fact he was looking at a lot of girls. After class, I got a notification from PayPal that I received my money for the week. Logan and I continued our agreement and I never saw him around campus again. I wondered if he just wanted to avoid me and I honestly didn't care at this point. He paid me and I sent the pictures and videos he asked for. I had Doug's class every other day and I met a guy in there that I actually liked. His name was Greg and we sat together in class every day we had it. One day, Greg asked me out to lunch and I accepted. Greg and I began hanging out a lot and started dating. He didn't know about my agreement with Logan on Snapchat and I was hoping he wouldn't find out. One day after class, Greg gave me a kiss as we wouldn't see each other until after lunch. Doug had pulled me aside and asked me to stay after to talk to him. I figured it was about my grade as spending time with Greg has pushed my studies to the side. With juggling my secret hustle and Greg, the last thing on my mind has been American literature. Thanks for meeting me, Daphne. Sure thing. You know I care about the well-being of my students, right? Yes, I do. I wanted to talk about the test on Friday. You flunked it. I cringed and ran a hand awkwardly through my hair as I sat down in the seat next to him. Yeah, I figured I did. Well, the good news is, I can help you. He reached over and placed a hand on my thigh and rubbed his thumb against my knee. I do this for a lot of my students. I pushed his hand away and stood up. I don't think so, pig. I'm going to report you for sexual harassment. You're not going to do that, he chuckled. His demeanor was smug and arrogant. Oh, really? And why not? Because I am Logan. With that, he pulled out his phone and opened up all the content I sent to Logan in exchange for thousands of dollars a week. I felt the color drain from my face and he began laughing maniacally as he scrolled through all the explicit photos I sent him. You dumb bitch, it's been me the whole time. But Logan's a real guy on campus. No, he's not. I was just using a picture of some random kid. You sick bastard. He continued laughing hysterically and even snorted. Sick am I? You're the one who agreed to send content for my eyes only for money. I paid your way back into this college and if you don't want me releasing your photos, you're going to do exactly as I say. I scoffed. You're not going to release my photos because if you're caught prostituting students, you'll lose your job and be placed on the sex offenders list. You'll never see a student again. <laughs> oh, honey. All I have to do is show your pictures and say that you sent them to me in hopes to get your grades up. They'll never believe a student over me. I raised my hand and slapped him hard across the face. You know what? You can expose me. That's fine. If that's what it takes to be free of our deal, then so be it. I grabbed my books and stormed out of the classroom in tears. I tried to go about my day as usual, but I felt paranoid and found myself looking over my shoulder. The dean of the university called me and asked me to come into the office. This was it for me. I went in to face my fate, but instead I saw Greg there, showing footage of mine and Doug's conversation from earlier. Doug was arrested for paying sugar babies that he would friend on Snapchat using random pictures of guys around campus to gain their trust. It caused a big mess with everyone involved and a lot of young boys had to appear in court to clear their names. Because Doug did this to a number of girls, none of us were expelled. If it hadn't been for Greg having an odd feeling about me being asked to stay after class, he wouldn't have gotten the footage and exposed him. He was a hero to many. Ladies, next time you get friended on Snapchat from a guy who seems trustworthy, don't engage. It's not worth it. I'm a 27-year-old female. I graduated three years ago, but I've been living independently since I was 17. I've gotten used to and could even say mastered handling my own affairs. 
one of which was funding and buying my own place. Next up on my list was a car. I was scrolling through many car vending services and Craigslist was too freaky. I can't name the number of times I've been harassed there for trying to negotiate the prices that led me to avoid using it. Luckily, I came across another online selling platform called Carvana. I was scrolling through the app during my lunch break at work and saw a car ad that I had seen many times before. Not because it kept getting recommended to me, but because the poster kept uploading and then deleting it right after. I just assumed that it might have been because the person was hesitant about selling the car and didn't think much of it. It was relatively new and well taken care of, but the price wasn't a banger deal or anything. It was surprising, but not impressive. I ended up settling on a few options. Some were deleted, some were sold, and I was left with two options. After contacting both owners, I decided on a gray Honda Civic that I had seen in the post that I just told you about. I met up with the owner of the car. He was a bit intimidating. He was very tall and large. His face was unkempt and he reeked of the smell of cigarettes. I have a sensitive nose, so I didn't tune into half of what he was talking about during the interaction. I was probably ready to bail on the car if he hadn't stopped talking, handed me the keys and signed the contracts. I drove home that day excited and full of energy. It was a short work day and I was ready to spend it resting in preparation for the following one. Weekends are always really busy at the shop and my shift can last up to 11 to 12 hours. As I neared my house, one of my phones, an iPhone, indicated that an unrecognizable AirTag was tracking my movements. I stopped in my tracks and got out of my car. Using the instructions on the iPhone, As soon as I bent over the vehicle, the iPhone stopped tracking the device and said no airbags nearby. I assumed it might have been a malfunction and went about my drive. When I got to about 15 minutes worth of walking away from my car, I got out and walked the rest of the way home. I wasn't prepared to take any chances and a walk to ensure that wouldn't kill me. However, if I'm being followed, that might actually be the case. I got my car checked the following day and no air tags were located anywhere near it, so I finally got to park my car in my garage for the first time. I went into my house very happy and proud of myself. I noticed the smell of cigarettes in my house. However, I assumed it had to be brought in because of the car, which absolutely reeked of it still, utterly oblivious to the nightmare of a night that was brewing for me. I was woken in the middle of the night to the sound of gently tapping. I didn't know what it was and I have no pets. I opened my bedroom door very gently and cocked my ears up to try and locate where it was coming from. As I pressed my foot on the first step on my way down, I heard the creak of the back door open. Suddenly, I was hit by the realization that this is a break in entry and my life is in danger. I ran back into my room, making as little noise as I could manage, locked the door, grabbed my phone, and jumped up to catch the rope that pulls down a ladder. My jump made a huge thump, which was immediately followed by the loud sound of footsteps skipping over the stairs. I practically shoved myself up the attic as something massive made contact with the door. I pulled up the ladder and slowly pushed the planchette back to enclose the ceiling and shoved my hand against my mouth. It wasn't necessary, but all sorts of bangs and grunts were warring from beneath me. I know you're in here, you bitch. I heard you. He grunted out in rage. You wait and see till I find you, stupid little girl, buying cars from strangers for low prices. You think you can rob me? You can't even secure your back door properly. He said as the banging in the room calmed down. Some time passed and the noise below me has ceased. There were all sorts of profanities being put to my name by whoever the hell this psycho was. As I sat in the dark attic and on the uncomfortable wooden staircase, spiders of all sizes were crawling all over my body and suddenly all my phobias kicked in at once. I couldn't take it anymore and hoped that he would have left at that point. I pushed the planchette back out of my way as slowly as my muscles could take. It was the car owner. His build and same dirty, patchy outfit gave away his identity at first glance. 
He was standing in the dead center of the room in an attack pose, a knife in hand and eyes scanning the room relentlessly. As light from the window illuminated the attic a bit more, I noticed a hammer that I had abandoned when I was installing the new and improved ladder. I looked back down and aimed to the best of my abilities and closed my eyes as I let it fall, hoping it would land right on his big bald head. I heard a loud thump, but no sound of agony, and my breath immediately caught in my throat. I missed my shot. I looked down to see I didn't miss it. The sound of the thump was his body falling limp onto the floor. Oh God, what did I do? I said to myself, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? I said aloud as I pushed the ladder down and rushed to see if I had killed him. As soon as my hand made contact with the skin, the world around me darkened for a bit and a sharp pain shot through my leg. He slashed my calf open and my blood was now gushing out of it. Gotcha, bitch. Should have kept hiding. Now I'm going to take you down the darkest alleyway of pain that you can ever imagine. He said standing back on his feet. The hammer didn't even touch him. It fell onto the floor and he pretended that it landed on him. That's the end of it for me, I thought to myself as I crawled away from his crazed smile and drooling mouth. He looked at me like a starved dog would stare at a roasted chicken. He was walking slowly towards me, spinning me around the room like a cat would toy with a mouse before killing it. My hand hit metal behind me as I crawled around. The hammer's head was aligned perfectly under the bed so that it wasn't apparent that it was there. I started crying hysterically. The overwhelming sense of hope spiraled me into hysteria. Don't cry now, sweetheart. I'll make it quick and sweet, he said as he bent over to me. I'll just assault you, kill you, assault you again, cut your body into pieces, and feed it to my dogs. He continued as he now headed towards me on all fours. I positioned the hammer in my hand, ready to strike as soon as he comes close enough. I'll take good care of your dead body. Don't worry about that, he said licking his disgusting lips, his build easily towering over my body even though he was still relatively far away from me. Not that you care, because you'd be dead. Before he could finish the word dead, I swung the hammer as hard as I could manage from that pose and hit the side of his head, leading his whole body to shift as light slowly escaped from his face. He fell unconscious on me and I disgustingly pushed him off of me and ran downstairs for the door. I turned the knob and my stomach twisted as I did so. It was locked. I have to go back upstairs to my bag to get it. I stopped midway when I heard the sound of heavy footsteps going down the stairs. I reached for the vacuum behind my fridge and smashed the lower half of the door with the heavy thing. I crawled out of it without failing to slash my body from all angles. I stomped my way over to the neighbor. Him and his family said they'd be leaving for the weekend. It was the closest and I couldn't walk any longer. And to my horror, the door didn't open no matter how much I banged on it. Please, he's coming! Open the fucking door! I shouted at the top of my lungs. The lights flipped on about five seconds after and I looked back to see him hunchly speed walk towards me. The glass door opened and my neighbor's eyes scanned behind me. He immediately opened the porch door for me when he saw him and rushed me in, a shotgun in hand and a dad's will to protect his family in the other. He scared the living daylights out of that fucking criminal. He shot at him, but I'm not sure if he landed it or not. I immediately passed out at the gunshot sound when the adrenaline stopped pumping into my body. Police never found out who he was, even though me, the neighbor, and his wife all gave detailed descriptions of him. I painted the car and changed its license plate and sold it immediately after. I also moved to a completely different city and I certainly learned my lesson. I'm never buying anything off of sketchy online websites, no matter how good the deal may seem on the outside. It could have easily cost me my life. Let me tell you the story of how I developed social anxiety disorder. I used to work night shifts, so I sleep during the daytime and a few years ago I woke up to some pretty terrible news. I had a bunch of missed calls and unread text messages from my landlord. They were telling me to call them as soon as possible. I called my landlord and he tells me that there's a leak in the apartment downstairs, 
one that they figured was coming from my apartment. As a result, they'd shut off the water to my apartment while I was asleep. That meant no shower, no coffee. I couldn't even flush my own toilet. The only consolation was that I'd found a plumber to find and fix the leak, and he'd reimburse me the money if I kept a receipt or invoice. Now, it's already around 3 in the afternoon when I learned the news about the water being shut off, which was obviously coming up to the end of most people's working days. I knew of a few emergency plumbers who might be able to deal with the problem at short notice, but all of them seemed to be too busy to take the job. I ended up calling around to a few friends to see if I could stay at their place until the problem was dealt with, and luckily, one of my girlfriends was more than willing to take me in. But she also threw me a kind of Hail Mary suggestion as to where I could find someone who wasn't a pro, but knew enough about plumbing to be able to come over and help. Craigslist I didn't think it'd be much help. I mean, I figured most people would just use it to sell stuff and organize CD hookups or whatever. But then again... I hadn't actually visited the site all that much, and to my surprise there was a section of the services part of the site that was called Household. Then what do you know? The third post down said something like, 37 year old handyman looking for work, with the post saying how he knew a little about everything and would take jobs at short notice at really low prices. It seemed way too good to be true, and I suppose that's because it was. I give the guy a call on the number he'd included in his post and explain the situation to him. Honestly, I expected that he'd give me the sorry, too busy line that all the others had. You'd think they'd at least arrange a time to take the job. But no, he seemed only too happy to drive out to me that evening to see if he could shut off the leaky pipe and go turn my water back on. I was literally like... All my prayers had been answered. I mean, the guy even said it himself that it sounded like a relatively simple job, and he was amazed another plumber hadn't come out already to just open up the floorboards, close off the pipe, then turn the water back on. I knew absolutely nothing about it, so when he said opening up the floorboards or whatever, and how that was a simple process, I just totally ate it up. About an hour or so after I'd made the first phone call, the guy shows up to my apartment and tells me he's outside. I realized that I totally forgotten to tell him which apartment I was in, so I let him know and I buzz him in. The guy then shows up at my door looking totally legit and I show him into the bathroom, which was where the landlord thought the leak was coming from. I then went back to my TV room and carried on preparing my very late breakfast. Remember, I worked night shifts at the time. A few minutes later, the guy, who called himself Tony, calls me into the bathroom and says something like, Does this look right to you? I then walk towards the bathroom, stick my head around the door to take a peek, and that's the last thing I remember. The next thing I know, there's a bright light in front of me, and I groggily realize that it's coming from the little pen flashlight of an EMT checking if I'm responsive or not. I start panicking, asking what's going on, and they tell me to keep still while they get a stretcher up to my apartment. They put me on it, wheel me out into the hallway outside, and there's the friend who had agreed to let me stay at her place. She's in tears, asking the EMT if I'm going to be okay, and I remember just relaxing and sinking into the stretcher when I heard them say, yes. I just felt like I wanted to sleep for days, but when I told the EMTs that I was feeling tired and could I just nap while they were driving me to the hospital, they kept telling me to stay awake, to do anything I could to stay awake. In the end... They kept asking me these dumb, small talk style questions to just keep me talking. Then at the hospital, I'm pretty sure they gave me something to keep me from drifting off because apparently falling asleep with a head injury can actually be fatal. And not long after, the cops showed up to take a statement about the plumber guy from me. They'd gone through my place and found a bunch of valuables missing, obvious stuff too like the TV being gone from the mount on the wall all my jewelry gone with my bedroom completely ransacked. Only then did I actually put two and two together and realize what had happened. That wasn't a plumber at all. He hadn't even touched anything in my bathroom. He just used the whole handyman thing as a front to rob people. One of the cops told me that I was the fourth person to get robbed by the same handyman guy that month, only because he uses different phone numbers and never told anyone much about himself. They hadn't been able to track him down. As far as I know, they 
never caught the guy. They just pulled a few robberies, then quit when the public got a warning about hiring anonymous handymen on the internet. Maybe he's still out there, robbing people, doing his thing, switching it up and not getting caught. And I hope those other people he'd robbed and beat got over what happened to him, but I didn't. Like I said, I developed a serious anxiety disorder after the attack, and it hit me in a way I just didn't expect. Bad things happen to good people sometimes, I know that and I took a lot of comfort in knowing that the cops were at least closing the net around the guy. But then after I got out of the hospital, it must have been like two or three days before I realized I hadn't even left the house. I got nervous getting food from the delivery guys that dropped it off at my apartment building, but I figured that feeling would just go away after a while. Only, it didn't. I got this tight feeling in my chest, this itchy feeling all over me, whenever anyone I didn't know walked outside my apartment or outside in the hallway. I still sometimes find myself running to the people with the gun I bought, staring through the little glass circle and just waiting to see the face of the guy who robbed me on the other side. I know I'm never going to see it either, but I still find myself doing it. I got a nasty little scar on my jawline from where the guy hit me, and even the EMTs said I must have had a steel skeleton or something because... It's a miracle my jaw wasn't broken, but I guess I got a lot of scars that people can't see, along with a wound that I'm not sure will ever properly heal. At me often, it was the usual finale and finishing touch to our arguments. Maybe she was right. What could I, a 42-year-old man, have in common with a 15-year-old girl? Her world revolved around boys, social media, and Starbucks, and mine just didn't. Things took a turn for the worse six months ago. I felt Liz more emotionally detached from me than ever, always deeply distracted by her phone and social media applications. They were alien to me. I barely understood how Facebook was used, so to me, Instagram, TikToks, Twitters, and Snapchat, it was just a different language. At the time, a wave of child abductions was sweeping through New York City. In four months, 19 kids and teenagers had vanished. None of them was found. Investigators suspected these kidnappings were occurring through social media targeting. An ongoing theory by investigators was that children and teenagers were being followed and tracked by this group of criminals. After learning the kids' location, habits, and activities, the criminals, usually working alone, swooped them away. The motive behind the kidnappings was still unknown, but a pattern had been identified. Young kids were being followed before being abducted. Reports warning children and parents about oversharing of personal information on social media frequented the news. I pleaded with Liz not to use any of these services, but she called me basic and argued every single one of her friends still used it. She didn't want to be the only weirdo that didn't, so we compromised. I allowed her to use them, only if she allowed me to monitor all her posts. She accepted my agreement, saying lots of people followed her and I'd just be another one on that list. Every night before going to bed, I'd sit with my reading glasses and view her Snapchat stories. They consisted of uh, typical teenager activities. Dancing routines with her friends, drinks at Starbucks, the occasional boy. I rarely asked questions and she rarely commented on my constant vigilance. The reports of missing children only intensified my watch and devotion to looking after my daughter. The night it occurred was like every other. It was a Friday evening and Liz had gone to a friend Trisha's house for a get-together with friends. Despite Trisha's parents being present, we kept in close communication. I still worried any time Liz was out of the house after sundown. So I watched some television, keep myself from wondering about potential dangers that could be approaching her. After what seemed like an eternity, Liz arrived home at 11.15 p.m. She greeted me, said goodnight, and headed to her room. I headed for mine, ready for a good night's sleep. As was my daily ritual, I sat on my bed, put on my reading glasses, and began watching Liz's Snapchat stories. There were over 50, starting out with a day at school. I watched my daughter's day play out through Snapchat, all while she slept in a room across the hall. Her stories began with videos of her and Trisha walking through the school's busy hallway, headed towards homeroom class. They complained and joked about Mrs. Weber, and they wanted the school day to be over in anticipation of the party. The next few stories were of Liz walking through a crowded parking lot towards her car, again talking about Trisha's party, inviting her followers to attend. 
After those, a series of stories showed Trisha and Liz at an overcrowded Starbucks, drinking frosty, caffeinated beverages and raving about the party. Finally, the last series of stories detailed the anticipation of the party. The activities shown were mostly innocent enough for my approval. No drugs were involved, no alcohol either, and it certainly seemed like no boys were being too overly friendly. Trisha's parents even made an appearance in her Snapchat stories, putting my mind further at ease. At least there was adult supervision. The Snapchat stories ended with her exiting her car and arriving home. She thanked Trisha via her story for a great party and headed for the front door, only seconds before entering and greeting me in real life. However, something lingered in my mind. Did I just imagine it? I put on my reading glasses again, picked up my phone, and began re-watching her stories. My heart sank. As the screen flashed before my eyes, I began taking continuous screenshots throughout her stories. Adrenaline pumping, before I knew it, I had gotten up and was now pacing through the room, staring intently at her stories. I hurried to look at the screenshots I had taken, my heart beating fast. My hands began to shake. As I zoomed in to each screenshot, my worst fear became a reality. During her morning Snapchat stories, a screenshot revealed a man in the background, staring at Liz from within the crowd. He wore a plaid shirt, jeans, thick glasses. He looked in his late thirties, trying to appear younger to blend into the school setting. Her video showed him sneaking around the background, trying to shield his face, occasionally being captured by my screenshots. At Starbucks, the same man sat at a table behind them, hiding behind a newspaper, shooting quick momentary glances at them, again captured by my screenshots. At Trisha's party, the same man was cowering in the living room corner alone, this time wearing a hood over his head. He continuously covered his face with his phone, but again, my screenshots captured his true identity. My panic culminated when I spotted him in Liz's final Snapchat story. He hid behind a tree in my backyard as Liz exited her car. The moonlight hit his glasses, shining brightly momentarily, seized by my screenshot. He sneaked behind a tree, heading towards my backyard where Liz's window was. I dropped my phone and sprinted to Liz's room. I bursted through the door and found myself with an image I will never forget. The dark room was illuminated by an open window. The figure of the man in the plaid shirt turned to look at me, as half of his body was out the window escaping. Over his shoulder, the limp body of my daughter dangled lifelessly. For a moment, our eyes met, and the moonlight familiarly glistened off his glasses. I charged at him, but he was out the window when I reached him. I threw my body forward through the open window, diving face first and landing in my backyard. I looked up and saw him escaping. He moved gracefully and nimbly through my dark backyard as a fox moves to avoid detection. Our pursuit lasted a quarter of a mile before he realized he could not run me with my daughter's body weighing him down. As I grabbed his plaid shirt, having caught up with him, he threw my daughter's limp body onto the street and accelerated into the darkness. Her body hit the concrete hard, ricocheting like a rag doll. I rushed to my daughter's rescue, checking for a pulse, any signs of life. The next three days were spent in the hospital room conversations with doctors and detectives. The good news was that Liz was alive. She had been given a strong sedative, but besides its after effects and a broken wrist from the fall, she would be fine. The bad news was that this man in the plaid shirt had escaped undetected. Investigators and other forms of law enforcement have interviewed me relentlessly, but no arrests have been made. Liz continues to be tormented by the idea that this man is roaming free. When we arrived home, the first thing she did was delete her Snapchat account. However, she still lives in constant fear and paranoia. She doesn't want to leave the house without me, and has fallen into a terrible depression. I'll confront her just as I did when she was a young child. But let this be a warning to all the parents on the dangers of Snapchat and how easily our children can be targeted. As soon as he points at you, you're as good as dead. I lost all hope when the doctor pointed at the man who walked up to me and Lily. The doctor plucked out his eyes, and they made us watch as he bled to death, screaming. The next time the doctor came, it was my turn. He locked eyes with me, and I whispered, no. He pointed at me, and the hefty men carried me to the table. My hands and legs were tied before I could blink. I started struggling. The doctor brought out his instrument. He rubbed something on my stomach then brought out a scalpel to cut my belly. I loosened the rope used to tie one of my legs and kicked the doctor. One of the men punched me and they tied my leg even tighter. 
The doctor was annoyed and told one of the hefty men to cut off my leg. My eyes opened widely and I started begging them not to. One of the hefty men carried a chainsaw and started cutting my leg. I can't describe what I felt at that moment. The pain was incomparable. It still traumatizes me today. I felt weak and was about to pass out when I heard the police siren. When I opened my eyes, I was in the hospital. I heard I was unconscious for five days. Turns out Lily was an undercover agent who had been working on the human trafficking case for years. The craziest part is that Dave didn't die. He was alive and well. He was the one who drugged and sold the people at the party, including me, to the human traffickers. I was shocked and disappointed when I visited him in jail, and his only excuse was that he needed the money. Ever since then, I never really trusted anyone. It was a traumatic and horrific experience that cost me one of my legs. But I'm glad to be alive. My father, Pat, grew up in a tall grass country in Butler County, Kansas, on a five-acre truck farm about three miles outside the town of El Dorado. He was born in a sharecropper's house at exactly 8 a.m. on March 10, 1931. It had snowed so much that the doctor wasn't able to get his car out to deliver the baby. And so, my grandfather called the town vet and asked him to come because he had a sleigh and therefore could get through to the house. My grandmother never forgave him for that. My grandfather, my father's father, Lester, was finally able to buy some land when Pat was about five years old, so he bought acres directly across the road from the sharecropper's house Pat was born in. And there, he built a stone house for his growing family, and he and my grandmother turned the land into a truck farm. It was during the Great Depression, so times were tough, and my grandmother Audrey took care of a lot of people with the food they grew and the animals they had. She never turned anyone away, and Pat never forgot what he learned from Audrey, and because of that, and who he was, took care of those in need all his life. Even when he was desperately poor himself, he always managed to find a surplus to take care of others. My father was an exceptionally intelligent and adventurous person, and was a fantastical, wonderful storyteller. He was the best storyteller I've ever heard, and many, many folks I knew would agree with that, hands down. I have a plethora of his stories I plan to tell, and this is one of them. As a child, Pat roamed the prairie, woods, and creeks for miles around the farm when he wasn't busy with his chores. He was a curious and inventive child, who was happy playing by himself as he was with his friends. He loved to make jewelry out of things that he found in nature to give to his mother. This became a lifetime fascination. As he grew into an adult, he used what he could find to make incredible sculptures and jewelry. He was a fabulous artist, and I am blessed to have a small collection of his sculptures and jewelry. Of course, living on a farm, as all children that do, he had jobs to perform each day. One of those chores he and his older brother Gene had was to milk the cows. They had to be milked twice a day. Since Pat did not like to get up early, and Gene did, Pat milked the cows in the evening. To get to the barn, you had to go through the chicken yard, which had two gates on either side. You had to open the latch and unlatch the gates as you passed through, so the chickens wouldn't escape. One night, when Pat was about 10 years old, during the late fall when it was very cold and got dark early, he prepared, as he always did, to go out and milk the cows. He bundled up in his jacket and put on his boots and lit the lantern so he could make his way. He went out the back door, walked down the stairs, and slowly crossed the backyard, taking his time as children do when they're shouldered with a chore. He got to the chicken yard and unlatched the first gate, and after passing through, latched it again. He was ambling along, daydreaming looking down just in front of him, since the lantern didn't fall more than a couple feet in front of him. The chicken yard was kind of large, so it took him a minute or two to cross and get to the second gate. He passed through, made sure the gate was latched as well, and slowly headed towards the barn door. He wasn't looking forward to milking the cows in the dark and cold. As he came up to the barn door, an eerie feeling suddenly came over him, though he knew not why. As he took his next step, 
There, in a pool of light right in front of him, were a pair of gnarled, old bare feet. He slowly looked up, his mind barely able to comprehend what his eyes just beheld. For there was a bent and twisted thing, seemingly covered in rags. As his eyes continued upward, there atop of the shoulders sat a face from the depths of hell. The eyes were wild and red, the hair long, gray, and wiry, sticking out in every direction. The lips were pulled back tightly in a terrible snarl over yellowed and broken teeth. This thing, for which he wasn't entirely sure what it was, made a strangled, choking cry and reached out towards Pat with a gnarled, clawed hand. At that moment, a great surge of adrenaline numbed his thoughts of all but flight. Shaking with fear that he'd never known before, he dropped the lantern, turned on his heel, and began to run for its very life all while screaming hysterically for his father to come save him. His voice was now so high in his throat it seemed to strangle him. He reached for the first gate and somehow, he got the latch undone and was through, flying on wings of fear as fast as his feet could carry him. As he ran across the chicken yard, he could hear the creature right at his heels making the strangest, most horrible sounds that he ever heard. The noises were not human. They sounded like the demon Pat was sure this was. He made it to the second gate, managing to unlatch it just as he felt Claus grab at his shoulder, catching at his coat. He managed to pull free, still screaming for his father to come help and save him. At that very moment, when he was sure that he was about to be caught and done unto, his father appeared in the back porch, shotgun in hand. He rapidly cocked the gun while threatening to shoot. But the creature had already disappeared into the dark. Lester assured Pat that he was now safe while steering him up in the back porch stairs and into the kitchen where his mother could comfort him. Then Lester set out to find the intruder and spent the next hour patrolling their property, looking for the old demon man, but nothing and no one was to be found. Several days later, Lester came home with his poor tale. There was an insane asylum some six miles or so outside of El Dorado and one of the inmates had escaped and wandered off that very night of Pat's near mishap. He had been picked up the very next day, about another 10 miles away. What a poor old fool. However, many months afterward, Pat was terrified of going to the barn alone after dark and would beg his brother Gene to go with him, which he never would. Needless to say, from then on, he did his best to milk the cows before dark. Though in winter, that could be difficult. Before I tell you my story, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jonah and I'm currently 19. The story I'm about to tell you happened to me when I was 11 years old. As the only child of a wealthy family, I used to be very noisy and spoiled. My father would go on business trips every month and stay in other countries for days. He was a hardworking man, but his ambitions caused me to spend my childhood fatherless. However, my mother was always there for me, and being rich helped us a lot. Although I lived a life that a child could only dream of, Everything changed when I was 11. We began to receive news and letters from different banks that would describe how much debt we were in. It didn't take long to realize that my father's company was bankrupt. Everything happened so fast. In a couple of months, our family became poor. My father, instead of being around us, decided to divorce my mother and flee the country as soon as possible. Thus, we were left behind with no money. But the terrorizing event that I'll tell you about now happened after all this chaos we faced. My mother started to work so that she could provide food and shelter for me. We moved to a tiny and dirty flat with one room in it. The neighborhood was not trustworthy to say the very least. I could always hear people crying, shouting, and beating each other in the streets. Every night, I would wake up with loud sounds of guns being fired off. I hated living there. There was nothing we could do. This place was the best we could afford at the time. One day, my mother returned from work. She opened the door and came inside the flat. I could see that she had brought a friend with her. Her friend was an older man with white hair and a long beard. Something was unsettling about this guy's eyes. He had dark brown eyes with wrinkles around them. What made me creeped out by his eyes was how he was looking at me. At his first glance upon me, his eyes shined with unearthly madness and an incredible sense of joy. He opened his mouth and showed his toothless gingiva. He was trying to smile, but all I could see was an endless void. Unexpectedly, he was a very muscular older man. I could see some scars on his arms that looked like knife wounds. 
my mother introduced the man to me and started to tell me how they met. This older man was our neighbor. He was living downstairs with his sick wife. This older man was my mother's hero, as she told me several times. Around a couple of minutes, I was introduced to this man. When my mother was on her way home from work, a couple of teenage thugs from the neighborhood had tried to mug her. She told me that the older man had come running to rescue her. He saved my mother, which is why she invited him to our flat. After hearing this story, my prejudices toward the older man replaced themselves with a sense of gratefulness and admiration. We started to talk. At first, he seemed a bit weird, but after a while, we began to enjoy the conversation. There was laughter and joy. He sat with us for three hours, and as he was about to leave, he hugged me. His grip was way too strong, and his breath smelled like garbage. As he was hugging me, he said, Oh, you're such a good child that I just want to take you to my house and caress your hair for hours. His strange sentence creeped me out, but my mother took it as an act of affection. He wished us a good night and glanced at me one more time before he left. After he left, I went to bed and started to sleep around 3 a.m. I woke up because of a troubling and familiar smell. At first, I didn't understand why the smell was so familiar, but when I opened my eyes, I realized that the smell was the older man's breath. I saw his face right on mine. He was leaning over me with an open mouth. The room was dim because of the moonlight shining through the window, and that dimness allowed me to see the red veins in this man's terrifying eyes. He grinned as he looked at my frightened face, and a drop of saliva fell from his mouth onto my cheek. He whispered very quietly, Don't worry, Tim. Your daddy will always protect you. It freaked me out. I remember everything going dark after seeing that horrible scene. I fainted, and when I regained consciousness, it was already the afternoon. I searched the house to find out if the older man was hiding somewhere, but I couldn't see him or my mother at the flat. That time was around 2 p.m., so I figured my mother was just at work. It was probably just a nightmare, I thought, and I continued hanging out inside the flat as if nothing happened. When the night fell upon our wretched neighborhood, I heard a fright that had started on the street. I peeked from the window, and I saw my mother lying on the ground while the older man was frightening two young people. I rushed outside, screaming and crying, Mother, you all right? Mother! The old man fought off the youngsters and told him to help me carry my mother inside our flat. Still shaken by the nightmare I saw, I hesitated to trust him, but I realized it was the most logical thing I could do in that situation. We carried my mother inside, and the man told me that she was not badly injured. I thanked him as he tried to wake my mother. After several attempts, he gave up. Realizing that she would not wake up, I started to get worried. My worries grew bigger as I saw the man smiling and looking at me as if I was a prize he wanted to have. Tim, your daddy missed you. Your mama is ill. Do you want to see her and hug her? He said as he approached me. My name is not Tim. Stop calling me that. I shouted as I grabbed the chair next to me. My arms shook because the chair was heavier than I thought. He laughed and said, You would not hurt your daddy, would you? Put the chair down, Timmy, and let me take you to our house. Your mother missed you. As he came closer, I hit him as hard as I could. His voice changed, and I could sense his anger. Timothy, you will listen to your father. You are coming with me, he yelled as he pulled the chair out of my hand and grabbed me by my hair. He dragged me to his flat downstairs. As he opened the door, I started to smell the disturbing scent of the house. What I saw in that house is still the reason for my sleepless nights today. I saw a skeleton-like figure lying on the couch with rotten skin. The corpse's skin looked like it had melted and mixed with the sofa. I screamed as hard as I could. I tried to escape as the old man called me Tim and told me to stop frightening my dad. I knew that I wouldn't survive this if I didn't fight dirty. So I bit the older man's hand so hard that I actually ripped a piece of the flesh out. He let go of me as he shouted curses and I ran upstairs. I got inside my home and locked the door. When I got inside, I saw that my mother was conscious and already calling the police. She told me that it was the older man who knocked her unconscious. While we waited for the cops to arrive, the older man tried to break into our place for 10 minutes straight and finally managed to do so. As he burst open the door, my mother and I screamed so loud. At that moment, we heard police sirens. The older man jumped on us, and I could understand that his only intention at that point was to kill us. 
We tried our best to defend ourselves as he punched and scratched us. He maniacally continued to hurt us until we heard gunshots. The older man got shot several times and his motionless body fell onto me. After that incident happened, the police told us about the older man. He was a mentally unstable man who had lost his child 15 years ago. His son, Timothy, was my age when he died. The older man and his wife were going through depression after losing their only child. Upon searching the house, the police identified the corpse on the couch as the older man's wife. They told me that after his wife died, the man lost his sanity and tried to recreate his family. He was most probably planning to keep me locked up in his flat and pretend like I was his son, little Tim. To this day, I still don't know how to react to all of this. But in my dreams, I see little Tim looking at me through the mirror and smiling with purple lips. This story of mine comes from perhaps the worst period of my entire life so far. I grew up privileged. Summers in the Hamptons and winters in the Bahamas kind of privileged. My dad was an investment banker, and a good one at that. So much so that mom never had to work after they got married. I had it all. Fancy private schooling led into what I thought would be a free college education. Well, not exactly free since dad was footing the bill, but... I'd never be saddled with any kind of crippling student debt that would turn my peers into wage slaves for the rest of their lives. At least, that's what I thought was going to happen. Until the 2008 financial crash. A lot of other financial companies got government bailouts, right out of the taxpayer's pocket, but my dad's didn't. For whatever reason, they didn't qualify, so he lost his job. Long story short, one day I was in college, living the good life, the next I was on the phone to my mom, being told I'd have to drop out and find a job if I ever wanted to be able to support myself, as they just didn't have the spare cash anymore. It was devastating. I'd never worked a day in my life before, and there I was, traipsing around town with a folder full of resumes, trying to find something, anything, to get some cash in my account. And that's how I ended up working at Burger King. It was really hard at first, although I didn't necessarily feel like it. I obviously gave off some major rich girl vibes, as the rough, tough, working class staff members detected it immediately. They didn't go easy on me, not in the slightest. But if I'm honest, that's the best thing that could have happened to me. In the space of about three months, I learned the meaning of a hard day's work, and the more I threw myself into the challenge of full-time work, the more my colleagues started to respect and appreciate me. In the end, we were incredibly tight, and I still keep in touch with a few of them via Facebook and stuff, but anyway, now they have a bit of background, on with the story. So I was working the late shift one night, which is generally the hardest shift of the day. The manager only ever put the most competent, most capable workers on that shift, and I know it sounds dumb, but the fact that I'd proven myself enough to be put on that cycle was a huge compliment to me. We used to stay open until midnight on weekends, and at about 11.30, we get this pretty regular-looking dude coming in, standing there at the counter whilst perusing the menu behind me. I gave it my best. May I take your order, sir? He looks down at me. Without skipping a beat, he's like, Two double cheeseburgers, please. I could have plugged the order into the register when he interrupts me with an addendum into his order. Could I have those without the bun, the bacon, or any cheese, and hold off on grilling them for me, would you? Thanks. I stopped plugging his order in and looked up at him. Excuse me? It took a moment for me to really process what he was asking for, and he smiled as he began to clarify what his order was. Is there a problem? Uh, yeah... I'm not sure we're allowed to serve raw hamburgers. It's against food safety regulations. You've heard of steak tartare, haven't you? Yet another guy who immediately detected something in my mannerisms or accent that suggested I was upper class. I didn't even justify it with a response. I just asked him to wait a second while I talked to my supervisor. So the supervisor comes out and basically tells the guy no, just like I had. Even if you can eat raw beef, it's just not something we're able to serve our customers. Or, that's what I thought, anyway. Because as my super is talking to this guy, 
calmly explaining that as much as he's sorry, it's just not something we can do. The guy like rolls his eyes and pulls out a wad of high denomination bills from his pocket and is just like, how much would it take? Now the place is pretty much empty at this point, but all eyes are on this guy and his wad of bills. I'll never forget the moment my supervisor stopped talking all calm and professional before turning to me and telling me, go to the back and clean something. I was stunned. I knew the guy well enough to know exactly what he was doing. He was going to clear the floor of potential witnesses, then actually get this guy's order. I pretended to clean something, all the while spying on him as he collected two raw patties from the fridge and sort of went through the motions of cooking them, so that if anyone watched the camera's back, it would look like he had done his job to the letter. A couple of minutes later, he comes into the back, telling me to take over the register, but not before he slides a few crisp hundred dollar bills into my hand, telling me not to say a word to anyone and to just forget about what had happened before people start running their mouths about it. As far as the rest of the team knew, he had told the guy no, served him some regular burgers, then simply gone about the rest of his shift as normal. But I couldn't let it go. I had to get some closure, even if I had a few hundred bucks worth of tips. I had to know what this guy's deal was. So being the sly fox that I am, I ducked my supervisor and hit up the manager in his office, asking him if, since it's so quiet, it'd be okay if I took a cigarette break. He looks at me all confused, turning in his chair before saying, like, You don't smoke, do you? Uh, yeah, I just started. Stresses of the job. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but you're entitled to your five minutes, just... Make sure you get your station covered. So I did. I got a buddy of mine to man the register, bummed a smoke off of one of the fire guys, then stood out back trying to get a look at the guy as he headed for his car. So there's me, standing there, pretending to smoke while I pretend I'm not watching this dude climbing into his driver's side. Then the thought hits me. It's late. Stores might not be open. In fact, they definitely weren't open. And the dude probably wanted something to cook with, right? Wrong. I distinctly see him unwrap the dripping wet burger wrapper before he raised the raw meat to his face. He doesn't take a bite, not like I expected him to. In fact, it looks more like he's smelling the meat more than anything else. I really couldn't believe what I was seeing. Literally, though, I thought the perspective had me seeing something that I wasn't so I made the awful decision to edge a little closer to the car, angling out so I could see through the driver's side window. All without considering that his side mirror would reveal me as the peeper that I was. And oh my god, the way he looked at me through that window, this wild look in his eyes after breaking from what looked so much like he was making out with that chunk of meat. He was furious, gunning his engine before ripping out of the parking lot as fast as he could move. I just tossed the cigarette, ran back inside, and went straight to the super to tell him what I'd seen. He only repeated that no matter what, I wasn't to tell a soul that we'd served him raw meat, or those few hundred dollar bills would be the last money we ever got out of this place if the owner didn't opt to sue us too. We never saw that guy ever again, and no one ever found out about the raw meat we sold him. I don't suppose I was in any real danger, but... It was definitely the scariest, if not the most disturbing incident I've ever had while working at Burger King. Years ago, I worked at Burger King. It was a job that I had during my college years when I was usually broke. I drove a really beat up old car, so it was a job that I needed to pay my bills. I worked a lot of late shifts where we closed. And I would sometimes take some food and eat it after I was done with work to save money. One night, I worked another closing shift, and after cleaning up and closing the place, the few of us employees left and got to our cars in the parking lot. The rest of them drove off, but I stayed in my car eating because of how hungry I was at the moment. It was a hot night and stuffy in my car, so I decided to start it up and turn the AC on, but when I tried, it wouldn't start. This would happen to me occasionally because of how old my car was. I really needed a new one, but I couldn't afford it quite yet. I stopped trying to start my car and rolled down my window instead to get a breeze. I thought about maybe starting it again, but 
but I called my dad and told him just in case. Thankfully, we didn't live too far away and he could give me a ride home if I needed it. I sat there in the parking lot, continuing to eat and wait for my dad to get there. I had backed into the parking space that I was in, which was the side parking lot of the Burger King next to a large woods. As I was sitting there, I started to hear the noise of something in the woods. I looked but saw nothing, and I guessed it was just the wind. But suddenly, I heard something hit the back of the wood. I couldn't tell what it was, but it sounded like a pebble or maybe a stick. Something then flew over my car past it, which looked like some sort of rock. I looked behind me but saw nothing other than the thick woods and darkness. Then something else hit my car. I looked behind me once again. This time, I saw a man from behind a tree. I saw him throw something else at me. He leaned out and fired what appeared to be a rock. I was leaning out the window, and this one went right by my head. It was thrown so hard that I saw it go past the Burger King parking lot and hit the side of the restaurant. I could now see that it was, in fact, a large rock. Then I heard some noises in the woods as the man was saying something. He sounded angry, but I couldn't make out any of the words. I looked in my mirror. I saw the man take a step out from the woods and start to walk towards my car. I was desperate and scrambled to start my car again, hoping that this time it would work. Luckily for me, this time the car just barely started up. As soon as it did, I sped out of the parking lot and left. I was able to get away and called my dad telling him not to go to Burger King anymore. The next day, I learned that the windows of the Burger King had been broken and we were closed for a whole week while they fixed it. I guess whoever was in the woods was throwing rocks and went and broke the windows after I left. I'm just glad that they didn't hit me. Home is supposed to be a place where you feel safe and secure from the rest of the world. A sanctuary where one can be themselves at the core. Home is where you live and love with your family. But once in a while, too often if you ask me, an invasion violates the safety of that space, and it's not something one comes back from easily. I'm Lisa, and this is my story of how I had a nightmare come true. I was married at 19 to the love of my life. I moved from Utah out to Virginia, far away from everyone I knew and loved. My husband works for the government, and his job is classified a lot of the time. I'm not entirely sure what he does, but he was traveling overseas for months at a time during the first decade of our marriage. We had our first child, and with our growing family, we moved to a luxury home in Leesburg, Virginia. My husband being overseas a lot felt lonely, but I at least had my dog Bailey and my six-year-old daughter Autumn. I was also pregnant with my son. His job also allowed me to live in the beautiful home that I have. One night, we all had gone to bed, Autumn in her room, me and mine with Bailey. It was around 6 in the morning when I opened my eyes and heard something stirring downstairs. I assumed it was Autumn getting up to get herself some cereal, so I dozed back off. My eyes shot open at the sound of my daughter screaming and I rushed downstairs to find her restrained by a man wearing all black, including a ski mask. He had a gun pointed at me. For context, we had a security system and I have no idea how he got in in the first place. My dog wasn't even barking and though her tiny body was no match for the man in the house, she would usually bark her brains out. Make one wrong move and this bullet goes through her head. I held my hands up in surrender. I'll do anything you want, just please don't hurt my daughter. I don't want any trouble ma'am, just give me your jewelry, that playstation, and that TV. Take all of it. Just please don't hurt her. Go gather it up for me. I'm going. Autumn was crying out for me. Mommy, please hurry. He's hurting me. Don't worry, sweetie. I won't let him hurt you. I frantically rummaged through my drawers for my jewelry. I honestly didn't have that much and it wasn't worth anything. I gathered it all up hoping it would be enough for him to let go of Autumn. I put it all in a bag and took it downstairs, tossing it in front of him. He looked down at the bag and scoffed. That's it? It's all I have. He flashed a sinister grin at me through the ski mask. No, it isn't, he said as he glared at my wedding ring. 
please, not this. It's my wedding ring, and this is so special to me. Put it in the bag, he yelled and pressed the gun barrel against my daughter's head. I jumped as he yelled, and with a shaky hand, I took off my diamond ring and placed it in the bag. The PlayStation and the TV, now! I nodded and went about unplugging the PlayStation and started to unmount the TV from the wall. The entire time, I had to listen to my poor daughter cry as the man held her against her will. Tears began streaming down my face from the helpless feeling I had. We were being robbed and I had no choice but to comply with him if I wanted to save my daughter's life. It was completely violating to have someone in your home threatening your child, trying to boss you around. I felt enraged and there wasn't a thing I could do about it. Once I unmounted the TV, he pointed the gun at me. Get down on your knees. I gave you everything you wanted. Now give me back my daughter. Who the hell said I was done, bitch? You can have my jewelry. You can have the PlayStation. You could take the TV and I'll even throw in all of my credit cards. You can't bring me to my knees. Plus, I'm obviously pregnant and it's hard to get on my knees. He pressed the gun into my daughter's head. I said, get on your knees. I struggled but managed to get down on my knees and looked at my daughter who was sobbing. It's gonna be okay, baby girl. My dog came running into the room and began barking her brains out up at the guy. Autumn and I both screamed at the top of our lungs when he shot my sweet puppy and she dropped dead. Bailey! Somehow, Autumn was able to shake away from his grip as he was distracted from shooting the dog and ran into my arms. I grabbed her hand and ran past the man, shoving him down and got Autumn outside. I began to scream for help and banged on the neighbor's door. They opened up and as I went to go inside, I felt a sharp pain in my leg and collapsed to the ground landing on my stomach. I turned to see the man running up to us. He shot my neighbor in the chest and he collapsed dead in front of me. Autumn, lock the door and call the police. I don't know how, mommy. Just dial 911 and give them our address. I watched as the man dove for my daughter. That's when I opened my eyes, drenched in a cold sweat from the horrific dream I just had. I sat up and saw that the sun was starting to come up and Bailey was sleeping peacefully next to me. I blew out a sigh of relief that my dog was okay. I rolled out of bed and went to go check on my daughter. For context, closed doors bother me, especially since I had my daughter and she sleeps in a different room. I like to keep it open at night in case she's had a bad dream and needs to come into my room with me. I went out of my room and began to walk down the hall when I heard some rummaging going on downstairs in my living room. I froze in place and listened closely. A part of me wanted to believe that Autumn was downstairs getting herself some cereal. I stood there convincing myself of that when I glanced towards her room to find her sleeping in bed. I felt the blood drain from my face and my breath began to shake. I was torn in that moment. I didn't want whoever was downstairs rummaging around in my things. The seconds ticked by slowly, yet I knew I needed to act fast. You're all probably thinking the logical thing would be to grab my daughter and barricade her and myself in my room. You would be right. But when you wake up from a nightmare like that and hear that someone has truly broken into your house and tripped the alarm, logic goes out the window. A racing mind is a frantic mind. You only want one thing, for yourself and your kids to be okay. My daughter is sensitive and I knew if I woke in her, it would have put us in a worse situation and she would be traumatized. I couldn't exactly wake my dog and bring her into Autumn's room with me as she would bark and draw attention to us. I was feeling clammy as panic began to set in and I knew that if the man started walking upstairs, we were done for. With my daughter being six, she's a bigger girl and it would have been a struggle as I stopped carrying her after I got pregnant with my son. All these things were racing through my head with the pressure of my son sitting on my bladder. I worried that the nightmare I had was about to come true. This man would somehow have my daughter with a gun pointed to her head, my dog barking and being shot at and dying. I stood silently in the middle of the hall fighting the raging battle in my head of what I needed to do. 
What was worse, I remembered that my pregnant brain took me to bed without my phone the night before and it was downstairs. Probably already snatched by the bastard that got into my home. I'm not sure what happened, but as luck would have it, the man just left my house. I went into Autumn's room and could see him running away down the street. I rushed downstairs and saw nothing was taken. I checked my alarm system and, of course, I forgot to set it after locking up the house. I grabbed my phone and reported the break into the police. They came by and were able to get fingerprints on the guy. I don't know if they found him. What I do know is I'm never forgetting to set the alarm again. Sadly, we moved to Australia a couple years after this incident and I had to leave Bailey with my mom. She ran out in the street and was hit by a car. By Megan McCall, based on a true incident with my sister. Stowaways. Disclaimer. The following story was creatively inspired by and loosely based on the actual events, locales, or persons, living or dead. It was created with the sole purpose of entertainment and with no intention of slander or defamation to anyone or any place mentioned in the story. It happened on the 25th of November, 2007, a day I can never forget. It was around 1 in the morning and I was on the highway. Now, I'd probably driven past this highway a thousand times, as my time as a truck driver always saw me using this route. But that night was different, and I could tell that something was very wrong. I started my journey by 8 p.m. on that fateful day, and I was supposed to deliver a massive crate of soft drinks to the nearest warehouse that was located on the outskirts of town. After the truck was loaded up, I quickly began my journey, and on my way to the warehouse, all I could think about was Susie my nine-year-old daughter whom I'd left at home. It had been really hard for us since her mother decided to leave, so it was up to me to take care of her. I had recently asked my boss if I could take the night shifts, as I wanted to spend my days with my daughter. And even though I hated driving at night, as I knew the dangers of doing that, it was a small sacrifice I had to make, so that I could be there when my little angel woke up to go to school. So I drove on, with a smile on my face. Everything went fine at first, as I remember putting on the radio to listen to my usual station. The station was talking about a recent slew of attacks on the roads, but I only managed to identify the assailants. I attentively listened to the reports, as I hadn't heard any news of the attacks from the other truck drivers. I tried to increase the volume of the radio when it abruptly lost its signal. Loud, static noise filled my truck as I started to fiddle with the radio. The radio had been acting up recently, and I had meant to fix it, but just didn't have the time. I tried to turn it off and on again, but that's when out the corner of my eye, I saw something that shocked me. I slowed down the truck as I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, but after getting a good look at it, I knew I wasn't mistaken. Laid out before me were a couple of cut-down trees blocking the highway path. Now, this would have been normal if the highway was surrounded by trees, as it wasn't uncommon for a tree to fall by itself and block the path. But there weren't any other trees in sight, so it was clear to me that someone had purposely put it there to block the path. I was tense now, as I didn't know why the path was blocked or what was going to happen next. I thought about going back, but I had already spent five hours on the road and I knew going back to use a different route would cost me more time. I also knew the warehouse I was supposed to deliver the goods to was really close. I thought about it for a couple of minutes, and against better judgment, I decided to continue forward. I slowly hit the gas as I wanted to make sure I drove over the trees softly. I didn't want to drive slowly, but I knew doing that made sure the goods weren't compromised. Unfortunately, that was another costly mistake, as right when I was about to cross the trees, I saw them. Numerous men holding metal pipes and rocks immediately emerged from the darkness. The sight of these people made my heart jump and I instantly froze. My mind started to race as I wondered what they were going to do to me and that's when I watched in horror as they all attacked my truck. The men at the front tried to take out my headlights and I heard them violently striking the front of the truck with their metal pipes. The men who held bricks and rocks then started to throw their projectiles at my windows and windshield. It didn't take long before my windshield's glass gave out and I felt a hard brick strike my head. 
The pain was unbearable, and I could feel the blood from the wound on my head, dripping into my right eye. My vision then became blurry, and a searing pain ran through my entire body. I could hear them on the sides of the truck now, and I was scared shitless. But even with all this happening, all I could think about was my daughter, Susie. I knew I couldn't die here, as I was the only one she had left. Her mother had already abandoned her. I wasn't going to leave her, too. So I steeled my resolve. I hesitated to do this at first, as I didn't want to kill anyone. But I knew at this moment it was either my life or theirs. So I gathered the strength and honked my horn. I did that as a warning, as I knew I wasn't going to stop now. So with no hesitation, I hit the gas. The trucks started moving forward, and I watched them all scatter as I made my way for the trees. Driving over the blockade was a rough bump, and I heard the goods in the back jolt and fall, but I didn't care. I knew I had to do anything to get out of there. I finally made my way past the trees, and for a second, I thought the worst was over. But that's when I heard loud thuds outside the truck. I then looked through my window to see a crazy-looking man holding onto the door of my truck like a psychotic stowaway. His eyes were bulging red, and he held a jagged rock in his left hand. Luckily, the window on my door wasn't completely broken like my windshield, but it was still severely cracked. And even though the window was closed, the man's screams reverberated through the entire truck as he screamed the words, Stop the truck or I'm going to send you straight to hell! Fear filled every inch of my body now. But I didn't let that stop me, as I kept hitting the gas. Seeing I wasn't going to listen to him, the crazy man then lifted the rock and brought it down with all his strength on my window. I wasn't surprised when the window gave in, as it was already severely cracked from the last attack. I knew I couldn't take another blow to the head like the one I had gotten earlier, so I handled the wheel with one hand and I maneuvered his attacks with the other. I managed to get him to drop the rock, and that's when he started to force his hand on the wheel to get the truck to stop. I'd lost a lot of blood now from the wound on my head, and I knew I couldn't do this all night. I racked my brain looking for a solution, and at first I thought about violently swerving the truck to shake him off, but I knew I could hurt someone else if I did that. I was desperate now, as I knew I had to do something, and that's when I remembered a detail that saved my life. Having traveled this route before, I knew that a few minutes away from the warehouse was a police station, so I mustered every ounce of strength left in my body, and I made my way there. It didn't take long for my assailant to realize what was going on, and right before we reached the station, the man finally let go of the truck. I watched in horror out of my partly broken rearview mirror, as I could see my assailant fall and tumble on the hard asphalt. Shockingly, the speeding cars on the road managed to stop in time before they could run him over. I figured my assailant was already dead now, as it was a pretty hard fall. But to my surprise, I saw the man get up and hobble out of sight. The cops in the station had already heard all the commotion, and a couple of them started to chase the man. The remaining officers who didn't go after him stayed behind to help me. As I came out of the truck, I started to stutter the words. I was viciously attacked by a group of men. It's all on my dash cam. I proceeded to get the device when I suddenly felt woozy. I then fell to my knees as they all surrounded me. One of the cops then said, You need to calm down, sir. You're badly hurt. Is there someone we can call? But before I could respond, the world around me started to get dark, and the last thing I managed to say before I passed out was, Susie. As all I could think about was her. I woke up in the hospital the next day, and sleeping on a chair in my room was my daughter, Susie. I could tell she had been crying all night, and right when I was about to call out to her, she woke up. She immediately ran to hug me, and I remembered crying tears of joy as I had survived that morbid incident, and I was able to see my little girl again. After this moment, the cops came into the room and asked for my statement, so I told them everything that happened. The cops then told me my dash cam footage was watched, and they were able to catch most of my assailants. They then assured me that a rigorous search was still going on to find the ones that were still on the run, so that they could be brought to justice. I never rode at night again after that incident. I asked my boss for shorter days, and even if it meant lesser pay, it also meant I could spend more time with my kid. 
I also knew I was staying safe from the potentially dangerous people lurking on the streets at night. This ghastly incident left me with some PTSD, as I still steer clear of that place today. And even though it takes a longer time to get to my destination, I still choose the longer trip as I can never shake off the feeling that some of those men are still out there, waiting to get their revenge. As soon as I woke up, I knew there was something off about that day. It was a regular Thursday, nothing special about it, really. But you know, sometimes we have a gut feeling about days like these when we know something bad is going to happen ahead. It was one of those days. I tried to ignore the knot in my stomach and continued my daily tasks. Once I sat in my business communication class, my phone beeped, which meant either someone was calling or texting me. I have a strict policy to not operate my cell phone in the classroom and to pay the utmost attention to my lectures. However, when my phone beeped for the second and then third time, the knot in my stomach intensified and my intuition told me to take a look. As soon as I saw the text sent to me by Mrs. Harris, I bolted out of the classroom with my stuff and ran towards my car. With shaky fingers, I started my car and began the long drive home. I was worried and scared. Worried because I wanted her to live, and scared because I was terrified of losing her. So I drove past the outskirts of the city toward my hometown. I knew it was getting late. It was starting to get dark outside, and soon I would be driving across a deserted highway in pitch darkness. But I was determined to get back to her on time. As a university student, I usually had early morning classes, so I avoided driving at night. So it was okay to say that I had a limited experience with driving at night. To ease my nerves, I switched on the radio and began to hear the weather forecast. Soon, I was two hours into my journey and I knew I was very close to the highway. I calmed myself down and focused on driving at a steady pace. Now you must be thinking, why is a college student who is clearly an adult so scared of driving at night on a damn highway? To know that, you must keep listening to my story. So, by this time I had driven a few miles away from the start of this highway, and I remembered that it had been particularly sunny that day. That's why there was no chance of a storm or any accidents caused by a storm. Then, why was there a fallen tree in the middle of the highway? While I looked at the tree about 300 meters away from my car, I had unconsciously slowed down a bit. That's when I saw the first person appear about 200 meters away from my car. Then, there were three more whom I spotted in the rearview mirror. For a second, I was baffled as to what to do. I knew what was going to happen to me if I didn't act fast. Their trick had worked, and I had already slowed my car enough for the people to approach me. Every second I wasted thinking about the right move was used by the people to advance on my car. Soon, the highway was full of people, and the only way to escape and go home alive in one piece to see her was by driving straight ahead. I know my car was hardly capable of running over a fallen tree, but I had to take the chance. After all, I was a broke college student who couldn't afford anything better than a beaten up Honda Civic. As soon as I put my foot on the gas, the first stone collided with the back door of my car. I thought it would leave a dent. The first stone was followed by another, and then more. One of the guys managed to aim at my passenger side window. It broke, and the glass shattered on the passenger seat. I paid no attention to it and sped the car, ramming it over the fallen tree. It hit the base of my car and a loud thud could be heard. The people were now furious that I was trying to escape. The mob started chasing me on foot, throwing stones, metal pipes, pieces of wood, and even rotten food at my car. I didn't even look back, I just kept driving until I reached my hometown. As soon as I parked my car in front of my house, I ran upstairs towards my grandma, who was fast asleep. Mrs. Harris sat beside her bed, reading a book. How is she? I drove here as soon as I got your text. I asked Mrs. Harris. She is fine. It was just a fall in the garden. She hurt her hip pretty bad, but luckily I saw her and took her to the hospital. She replied. Hey, Justin, why are there pieces of glass on your sweater? Mrs. Harris inquired. Mrs. Harris, I drove on the highway. It was... Them, I told her. 
She immediately understood what I meant. Thank God nothing happened to you. Did you report the incident? She asked me again. I didn't, Mrs. Harris. I do not see the use of it. I was tired and worried to death about my grandma. Mrs. Harris, our neighbor, had texted me during my lecture that my grandma had fallen in the garden and she was being rushed to the hospital. You see, I do not have parents, as they both died when I was too young. My grandma raised me and looked after me, and now it was my turn. As I went to my room after making sure that my grandma was fine, the whole highway incident flashed in front of my eyes. The men who attacked me were called the Faceless People and were famous in our state for attacking vehicles traveling on that highway at night. They were called Faceless People not because they had no face, but because no one could ever make out what they looked like and no one knew anything about them. It was as if they were off the grid and lived in their own day and time and somehow appeared on the highway at night. There were at least five to seven reports of the faceless people attacking vehicles on that highway every week, but the cops were unable to catch anyone. These people destroyed the vehicle by throwing things at it. They dragged the people in the vehicle out, looted, and then finally killed them. I knew I was lucky, as I was one of the few people who escaped the torture of the faceless people unharmed. But due to the lack of evidence, these people still roamed the streets unpunished. That's when I remembered that perhaps this incident was recorded on my dash cam. Maybe I was the first person to capture the faceless people on camera. This could be a huge leap in the investigation. I ran to my car and retrieved the recording, and there it was. Everything was recorded clearly. Although my car was damaged, the dash cam somehow remained unscathed. I borrowed Mrs. Harris's car and drove to the police station with the footage. The cops thanked me, and I returned home. The next day when I woke up, the town sheriff was having a cup of tea with my grandma downstairs. She seemed much better than yesterday. "'What brings you here, Sheriff?' I asked. "'You have no idea what you have done, Justin,' the sheriff said with a broad smile on his face. The dash cam footage you gave us last night helped us identify a few people from the Faceless Gang. We captured those people and soon extracted all the information about their operations. Most of these people are behind bars because of you and will be soon put to trial. You have no idea what you have done, boy. Saying this, he thanked my grandma for the tea and left. The news had covered the incident and my face was all over the TV. Turns out the faceless people were a bunch of drug addicts who had escaped the nearby rehabilitation center and were hiding in the abandoned factory in the woods during the day. That's why no one could find them. I still can't imagine what would have happened if I hadn't driven fast enough. What do you think? Would I still be alive to tell this story today? Have you ever spent a night inside an airport? To my knowledge, many people stay in airports while waiting for their other flights instead of spending their nights in hostels. I, as a person who travels a lot for the purpose of having meetings with my company's partners, also slept in airports several times. Of course, these business trips were arranged by the company, and most of the times, I would have a place to stay at the transfer points. However, due to the unexpected pandemic, the company's budget went lower than expected. Thus. I sometimes would sleep inside airports instead of in cozy hostels. Others would be annoyed by this change, but I decided to adapt to it. Considering it was not hard to understand the financial difficulties the company was facing. That night I would face the terror that dwelled inside the airport started relatively mundane. My flight landed and I went inside the airport. After the usual process of eating and selecting a place to sleep, I decided to call my boss. Mr. Maxwell had a personality that many would consider as obsessive. So these phone calls were one of the obligations of the business trips. I called him and told him that my flight would leave after 13 hours. Sorry for making you wait in these airports. Of course, your dedication to the job is highly noticed. Well, take care of yourself, Simon, he said as he hung up the phone. The mechanical tone of his voice revealed the fact that he was not really sorry about the current situation I was in. He only cared about the business. After the phone call, I realized that my phone was about to die. Knowing that it would be a catastrophe not to have access to my phone, 
I quickly searched for my backpack, hoping to find my phone charger. It was frustrating to see that I was not able to find it. After that moment, I figured out the fact that I had left my phone charger in my flat. I got up and rushed to a shop I had seen when I first entered the airport. I remember seeing the phone chargers inside it and I was willing to buy one. Unfortunately, the shop was closed when I got there. I was not aware of the time and decided to check my phone again. It was around 2 a.m., which meant that I had to wait for 10 more hours for my next flight. Guessing that the shop would be open early in the morning, I decided to sleep and then charge my phone when I woke up. To make things faster, I decided to sleep on the airport seating that was closest to the shop. As I lay there, looking at the ceiling of the building, many thoughts were wandering in my mind. Although I knew that it was near impossible to get a promotion at that time, I still thought about Mr. Maxwell's words. The words, highly noticed, surely indicated an idea of promotion. As I dreamed of being promoted, the calming sense of slumber took hold of my body. I slowly closed my eyes and slept. After a while, I woke up to a sound calling out my name. It was a female voice that had a technological texture in it, as if it was coming from a device with a voice recognition technology. I opened my eyes and got up. I saw the darkness of the airport illuminated with the dim moonlight coming through the windows. I saw the emptiness of the area. It was uncanny to experience the liminal space. Apart from the moonlight, a buzzing neon sign on a closed shop inside the airport also created dimness. To my surprise, there was no other people sleeping or staying inside the place except me. Considering that my phone died a couple of hours ago and the absence of people, the voice I had heard was enough to put me on edge. As a great sense of curiosity overcame my fear, I decided to look for the source of the voice. The first place I decided to look was none other than the shop. I thought maybe some of the phones inside picked up my murmuring while I was asleep and the voice recognition technology replied to me. Knowing that I had the habit of talking in my sleep, me activating Siri while sleeping was a plausible story. Although this theory of mine did not explain how the phone was able to reply to me by calling out my name, I figured it must have been a coincidence. I carefully observed the inside of the shop through the glass door of it. After spending five minutes looking and talking just to see if it would be able to activate any of the phones, I realized that there was no kind of reaction coming from the devices. I chuckled to myself as I realized the ridiculousness of my action. The source of the voice must have been my own imagination. I thought and decided to go back to sleep. As I lay down to sleep again, one simple question came across my mind. Why was the airport empty? Of course it was very late at night, but it could not have mattered considering that there were flights that left the airport every hour or so. As panic conquered my mind, I tried to find a solid explanation for the situation I was in and thought that maybe, just maybe, only the section I was in was empty and there were people in the other areas of the airport. The thought of that gave me enough comfort to go back to sleep. But at that moment, I heard the voice again. It called my name again and again. My eyes were open. I realized that I did not imagine the voice. It was real. An utter sense of horror left me shaking. I waited without responding to its call. Simon, look at me, the mechanical voice said. I closed my eyes, hoping to fall asleep. The unending calling of the voice disturbed me very much. In fact, after a couple of minutes, I decided to get up and find the source of it. I listened and found the direction it was coming from. As I walked cautiously towards it, the voice began to get louder and glitchy. It became distorted as I approached closer, almost to the point that it was hard to understand what it was saying. The sound of it calling my name was too distorted that it started to sound like a baby's crying. I came closer to it, and the distorted voice shifted into a clean version as the voice said very angrily, Don't be greedy, Simon. I did not understand what she meant, but I guessed that she did not like the fact that I was getting closer to her. Realizing this, I began to rush towards it. I was not aware of what I was going to face, but at least I was not going to yield to this creature's endless taunting. Finally, I found her. As I was running towards the voice, 
I saw a dark figure lying on the floor of a narrow corridor. It called my name as it crawled towards me. I stood still and watched her come closer. She crawled away from the darkness of the corridor, and as the moonlight shone upon the being, I saw her face. It looked like a pale woman with blonde hair. Her face lacked any expression as her red eyes looked inside my eyes. There was blood all over her torso, and one of her legs was severed from her body. However, the most shocking thing about her was the cable-like extension that seemed to be coming out of her thin neck. The cables were covered with blood, and I could see the copper lines revealed to be bursting out of the plastic cover of the cable. What do you want? I shouted as she came closer. Every time she moved, her limbs would make machine-like voices. She raised her arms as she continued to crawl. She did not respond. I stood motionless until she came near me and grabbed my ankle. As an instinctive reaction, I tried to run away, but her grip was too strong. I ended up falling down as a result of her grasp. She held me and dragged me to herself with an unearthly strength as she said, Listen to me, Simon. I watched her as she opened her metallic jaw and bit my leg. I could feel a stinging pain as her sharp teeth pierced my skin. At that moment, I heard a male voice. The sound resembled Mr. Maxwell's voice. But even though it was similar, it was not the same. Are you all right? The male voice asked. I looked behind me and saw another figure. A sharp-dressed fat man looked at me as the concerned look on his face turned into an evil grin. Realizing the pitiful condition I was in, the man decided to take advantage of the situation. He held my head with his huge hands and took a bite. As I felt the horrifying pain, I opened my eyes. A man was leaning over me and asking if I was all right. He seemed like an airport security officer that tried to sound concerned, but his expression was revealing another state, boredom. I figured that he was used to people like me, those who slept in the airports and had nightmares. I leaned up and said that I was okay. I heard you were screaming and some passengers were concerned about your situation. Uh, are you all right, sir? He stated. I told him, I was just having a nightmare. I looked around the airport and saw lots of other passengers and workers. The sunshine hit my face. I looked around, dazzled and confused as I was still feeling the effects of the nightmare. I saw a blonde young woman in her 30s with a baby. She was talking to her baby in an angry tone. Her face uncannily resembled the woman in my nightmare. As she continued to talk to her baby, I heard her calling him, Simon. I understood where my imagination was picking up the voices that I heard in my nightmare. After the epiphany I experienced as I woke up, I felt relieved. As a person who has not seen nightmares for years, seeing that nightmare while I was sleeping inside the airport made me realize the pressure my unconsciousness was going through because of my job. The nightmare helped me in a way by revealing the stress that I had that I was not aware of. However. This clearance was not enough for me to leave my job, considering I was not going to stop working just because I saw a nightmare. I went inside the shop, got a new phone charger, and charged my device. As I contacted my boss and told him how everything was all right and how ready I was for the meeting with our partners, I heard the announcement of my flight. I started to wait in line with dozens of others standing before me. I was behind the blonde woman. She leaned onto her baby's crib, and a shocking incident happened. A long and thin line that looked like a cable slithered down from her skirt. She seemed panicked about the incident. She instantly grabbed the cable and put it back into her skirt. As I saw what happened, I felt the pain in my leg. When I looked down, I realized the crimsonness conquering the white fabric of my trousers. I did not know what was happening. I started to pant heavily and looked around me with fearsome eyes. As my eyes darted around the place, I saw the officer that woke me up. He was observing me. His gaze was suggesting hellish deeds. At that point in time, I realized the thin line between fiction and reality snapped. I felt paranoid. The pressure of being there was enough to leave me breathless. I fell to my knees, gasping for air. The man rushed towards me. I knew not what to do or where to run. I fainted.
Sometimes, such incidents happen in our life that has a profound impact on our mind. One incident happened to me when I was working in the airport seven years back as an airport security officer. I liked my job. I used to meet new and good people every day at the airport, and I also loved meeting new people. But I found the behavior of the few crew members a little strange to me. So that was when I got a new job at the airport. Hi, this is Norman. I am now 35 years old. I didn't know anything about the modalities there. There, I had a co-worker whose name was Harris. He used to help me with my work sometimes. We both used to have a lot of fun during break time and shared everything. So one such day when I was busy with my work, I saw a man, 39, in a black t-shirt and gray pants. He was waiting for someone maybe? He held a board made of a thick piece of paper with the name Smiley written on it. He was delighted and it seemed that he was waiting for his family and after a while, I don't know why, he became sad and a little disappointed. And suddenly, the color of his eyes began to take off and all the laughter on his face was gone. His body had become very loose and he looked gloomy. I didn't particularly appreciate seeing him like that. I felt like going to him and giving my company to him. But I was so busy with my work that I didn't get the time to go to him. I ignored all those things and resumed my work. But the next day, again, that same man showed me at the airport. This time, he also wore the same clothes and his condition was the same as it was the previous day. And that day, the same thing happened, which was a little weird. At first, he was delighted, and after a while, he became sad. He was behaving as if big trouble had come to him, but I don't know what was going on. I still remember that man's eyes and facial expressions. I felt very strange. That's why I thought of going to him. When I went there, I saw that the man had left the airport. I thought that maybe his family had arrived and he had gone home with his family. So I asked some people standing there if they had seen that man, but no one had seen that man over there. I was surprised to know why nobody saw him there. I was a little frustrated, but I was helpless at that time. After a while, I got on with my work. The next day, I saw that man at the airport, and at that time, I thought I would go to him and ask what he used to do here every day. Later again, he started doing the same things he had been doing continuously for two days. All of those things frightened me very much and I could not understand what to do. Well, before the man could run away, I went to him and asked, why are you so sad? What happened? Your family members haven't reached you yet? Tell me what happened. I will help you. I tried to talk to him, but he was not saying anything. He was crying. When I was talking to that man, I could feel the environment around me change and I was sweating profusely. Also, the words were not coming out of my mouth. I was losing control over myself. I could not understand what suddenly happened to me automatically. I wasn't even sick that day. After a while, I found myself in the room. There were also the police. I don't know what happened to me that day. When I woke up, my friends told me I had attacked a man. I could not believe it at first. But later, the police showed me the CCTV footage. I was completely blown away after seeing the CCTV footage. I noticed that I was abusing filthy filth and destroying everything kept in the airport poorly. Not only this, but I was checking the luggage of some of the passengers present, thereby opening them. I didn't know if it was me or someone else. I was doing everything quickly, which was creepy. Also, I was slowly saying something. Everything has happened because of you all. You're all bad. I won't leave you. I think you should see a good psychiatrist. We hope you will never do anything like this after this. I was petrified of that, and I didn't even go to work for three days. But I had to go to work. So again, I saw the same man, and at the same time, my condition got very bad. After seeing him, strange movements started in my body, and my heart started beating very fast. I knew that it was not some common man, but someone's soul. For the first time, he met my eyes. When he looked at me, I felt someone was scratching my body. His face had turned completely blue and his eyes had turned red. That day, I also saw his wife and his daughter. Their faces were burnt. His eyes were hanging out. 
They all gave me creepy smiles, though. And I started praying to God for my life. Living in L.A., you'd think that it was a lavish lifestyle. But, like everything, there's bad with the good. I happen to live on the dark side of South L.A., at least. That's what I think of it now, after the worst day of my life. I'm Pedro, and I was working at Taco Bell when this happened. For context, my dad Alejandro works there, and he helped me get a job as well so I could help support our family. I also wanted to go to college, and since my parents can't afford it, I'm working to pay my own tuition. Being Hispanic, family means a lot, and we do whatever we can to help each other. We're also naturally hardworking, therefore, dad and I put in a lot of hours at work. I was grateful to be working alongside the man who taught me everything he knows. Working at Taco Bell wasn't exactly a flex, but it put bread on the table, a roof over the family's head, and a car. I was well into saving anything extra I had to go to college, and things were on the up and up. We even had a great Christmas thanks to the extra income. But, that was the last Christmas we would have together as a family. After the holiday, Dad and I got settled back into the regular routine. We were working the late shift. Dad was managing employees, and I was working the drive through it was a busier than usual night, and we managed to catch a little break. Then someone pulled up to the drive-thru. Hello there, thank you for choosing Taco Bell. What could I get for you? Yeah, could I get uh, six of your steak quesadillas, three nachos belgrande, four chicken quesaritos, and three large Baja Blasts? Does everything on the screen look correct, sir? I displayed everything on the screen, and he was silent for a long moment before answering with irritation in his voice. Yep, perfect. Your total is going to be 75.68. Please pull forward to the window. I waited for him to pull forward and greeted him with a smile, repeating his total to him. He pulled out a $100 bill and gave it to me. When you work in the service industry, it's standard when a customer hands you large bills, you have to check for authenticity. It's a normal thing, and most of the time it's not a problem. But checking it pissed him off. What are you doing? It's standard procedure to check for authenticity. Stop it. Why would I give you fake money, you dipshit? No need to be rude, sir. We do this with every customer who gives us large bills. Just take the fucking money and give me my food. My God. I ignored him and held the bill up to the light. I was taught what to look for when it's fake, and sure enough, this was fake money. Sir, I can't accept this. Do you have another form of payment? I went to give his money back and he ripped it from my hand. Fuck you. He drove around to the front of the building and got out of his car. He walked inside and held up a gun opening fire on every employee in sight. My dad was the first person he shot. Dad, no! I ducked and ran to his side, trying to wake him up. All the pandemonium around me seemed to blur, and the screams and gunshots sounded distant. In my heart, when I looked at my dad, I knew he was gone. But I called for him, trying to bring him back. Dad, wake up. Please wake up. The family needs you. I need you, Dad. Wake up. I looked up to find more employees had been shot and severely injured. They laid on the floor crying out in pain and fear. People from other places heard the gunshots and came straight away, but the man got into his mysterious car and fled before the cops could get there. I held my father in my arms and cried. It should have been me. I was the one who denied him service for the fake currency. I should be the one laying there lifeless. My father was innocent. He was just working. This deranged psycho took his life. Everyone who was injured that night should have all been me. Due to the tragedy, we had to shut down for a while, clean up the restaurant, allow the employees to heal, and I had to bury my dad. My mom and younger siblings clung to me as we scattered his ashes on his favorite beach. I tearfully closed the urn and gave it to my mother. I'm not going back to work. You have to, mijo. Padre wouldn't want you to stop working. Mom, it should have been me. She reached up and placed her hands on my cheeks. You listen to me, mijo. Even if the man shot at you, your padre would have stepped in front of that bullet for you. You're living for a reason. Make him proud. Keep working. Go to school and make something of yourself. Then one day, you'll have a family of your own, and you'll understand why he would have taken the bullet for you. I took what my mother said to heart. She was right. My dad would want me to keep working and supporting the family. I didn't go back to work at Taco Bell. I managed to get a job at a bank instead. I had days where I wanted to give up and give in to the pain of losing him, but I always hear his voice in my head whenever I want to quit. Mijo, don't you dare give up. You have your whole life ahead of you. Make me proud. 
as I went on working, I managed to save enough for college tuition, and I went to study criminology. After my father was shot and the police couldn't find him, I made it my personal mission to catch this guy one day. What I didn't know was that day came sooner than I thought, but I made sure I was ready. It was at that same godforsaken Taco Bell. It did go back into business. And even though it was a hard place to be, the staff was close with my father, and I made a point to come buy food and check in on them once in a while, see how they were doing. Then that car pulled up. That mysterious, dark, beat up car with no license plate. It still looked the same after all this time. I walked out and thankfully, the parking lot didn't have any other people in it. I watched as the psycho stepped out of the car and I didn't even give him a chance to take a step before I knocked him out. I know I should have called the police, but I wanted to deal with this fucker myself. I shoved him into the car and got into the driver's side. There was an abandoned warehouse near the beach and I took him there. I grabbed his gun, the one I was sure took my father's life, and pointed it at him, waiting for him to wake up. He opened his eyes after a bit and looked up at me, holding his hands up. Hey man, I don't want any trouble. Don't you recognize me? His eyebrows furrowed as he focused on me. They lit up with realization, and this only added to his fear. Look man, I didn't mean to kill nobody that night, I just wanted some food, and the bill was all I had. Didn't mean to kill anybody. You mean coming inside and firing your gun was all an accident? I just wanted to scare you guys. I unlatched the safety on the gun and shot his leg. He screamed and grabbed it. You took a life that night. A life that meant the world to me. He looked up at me. No words came out of him, just cries of agony. This prick couldn't even apologize for what he did. I fired the gun on his other leg and he screamed out again. That was for shooting my father and killing him. I shot his hip and each shoulder. His cries satisfied me in an odd way. This is what justice felt like, and I reveled in it. Those are for the employees that you injured. I aimed the gun at his head and blew his brains out. That was for me. Thank God for everything I learned in criminology. It helped me to cover my tracks, and I was never caught when they found him. No one knows what I did that day, and no one ever will. I just rest more easily at night, knowing my family and the employees that night have justice. Hi, my name is Frank, and what I'm about to tell you will make you eat homemade food forever. It was a Saturday afternoon when my friend Daniel rushed over to my house to inform me about the new Domino's pizza that had just opened down the street, and they'd be giving massive discounts for every pizza you buy on the opening night. Lucky customers would also take home free pizza packages. Free pizza? Count me in, I said. A week had passed and it was Sunday, the opening night of the new Domino's Pizza. Daniel and I were set to go and enjoy the food. It'll take less than 10 minutes to get there, so we decided to get drinks. We took a few shots before going to the opening night. We arrived at the new branch which was well decorated. You could tell that they had a special occasion. Daniel and I smiled at each other as we entered the new Domino's Pizza branch. Little did I know what I was getting into. We looked around and spotted an empty seat. We moved closer and sat down. Dan sat opposite me and passed me the menu, and I was delighted at the varieties on the menu. We finally made up our minds on what to order. I called the waiter and gave our orders. While waiting, I informed my friend Dan about the new job I'd be interviewing for the next day. I was excited about the job because I'd been jobless for a while. We waited for about five minutes more, and a waiter finally showed up with our pizza. But it wasn't the waiter who had initially taken our orders. It was a different waiter, and he seemed familiar. He was probably transferred from one of the many Domino's pizza branches I've been to, I thought. We dug into the pizza, and it was tasty. I suddenly felt a weird sensation as if someone was staring at me. I looked around, and to my surprise, the waiter who had served us was glaring at me. I felt worried instantly. When our eyes met, he looked away for a while, but he continued glaring. I was getting scared and wondering why he was glaring at me angrily like a maniac. A couple of minutes later, I began to feel woozy, and I told Dan, so he ordered an Uber and I was on my way home. When I got home, I was feeling lightheaded. 
but I couldn't help but think about the weird waiter who was glaring at me. I took my mind off it and slept off. The next day, I woke up at precisely 12.54 p.m. My phone was right beside me and it was buzzing like crazy because of all the texts and phone calls coming through from my uncle and my friends. I finally figured I missed the job interview I was supposed to go for. It was scheduled for 8.15 a.m. and my uncle, who set up the job interview for me, kept trying to reach me. He had called some of my friends to find out my whereabouts and they wanted to contact me too. I only had a few shots. Why did I sleep for so long, I kept wondering. I called my uncle immediately and he sounded very disappointed over the phone. He told me that someone else had been appointed for the job. I was sad. I needed that job. I burst into tears. The only hope I had was that job. I'm such a disappointment, I repeatedly said in tears. A few days had passed and Daniel came over to my apartment to check on me and cheer me up. After I narrated the weird incident to him about how I slept off and missed my interview, he said that the shots were probably too strong for me to handle that night and he stayed over for the night. Still, he had to leave early because he had a job, unlike me, who was jobless. I decided to follow him to his house. He lives just five buildings away from mine. I saw him to his doorstep and I watched him enter his house. I couldn't enter. He was going to leave for work soon anyway. On my way back home, I felt a sharp pain in my stomach. I was hungry. I needed to find something to eat instantly. I hadn't eaten anything nice in days. I moved further and went to the new Domino's Pizza to get a medium-sized pizza. It was early in the morning and there were only two workers when I got there, a friendly-looking waiter and the one who had brought us food the other night. He was busy arranging chairs and tables. Immediately he saw me and his expression changed. I forgot about this weird dude. I should have gone somewhere else for food, I said. I went to the other waiter and placed an order to go. He whistled at the weird waiter and he moved closer to me with a horrible scowl on his face. My heart skipped a beat and I told the other waiter I wanted him to take my order, not the weird one, and he said, I'm in charge of payment only and gave the paper he wrote my order to the odd waiter. I reluctantly accepted and sat down to wait. He was taking well over 10 minutes and I was getting impatient because I was famished. He finally showed up with the pizza already packaged and he passed it to me with a very creepy look. I looked at him confusingly and collected the pizza and exited the place. My hunger had increased tenfold when I got home. I opened the pizza quickly and started eating. I had only taken a couple of bites when I noticed that something was wrong. I could feel some tiny pieces of pizza moving in my mouth. I went to the fridge, drank water, and the disgusting taste of the pizza finally hit me. I drank water again, but this time I couldn't swallow. I threw it out into the sink by the fridge. I was freaked out by what I saw. Maggots. I rushed to the table where I placed the pizza and looked at it closely. I could see maggots all over the pizza. I was so disgusted and I vomited instantly and kept on purging and retching for many hours. The entire day had gone by and I still couldn't get over what I'd been through. I called Daniel and we made our way to Domino's Pizza to make angry complaints and outraged protests. It was very late, but we didn't care. We arrived there, but they were closed. We were furious and disappointed. We had planned to turn the place upside down and call them out for their disgusting service. We went back to my apartment and when we got back home, we met Domino's pizza boxes at my doorstep. Daniel asked me why I ordered more pizza after what had just happened and I told him that I didn't order any pizza and we both stood there in shock. I moved forward to check the pizza. It gave off a horrible stench. It smelled like a dead animal. I opened the pizza box and it was pizza with blood all over. I dropped it instantly and fell back. I stumbled by the door and fell. Daniel was still looking at the pizza in shock. I was terrified. Daniel summoned courage, picked up the pizza, threw it in the trash and took me into my room. I was confused and scared. 
What the hell is going on? I asked Daniel. We're calling the police, he said. I barely slept that night and kept checking the time. As soon as it was 6 a.m., I woke Daniel and we headed to Domino's Pizza again. Only two people were there again, a girl in charge of payments and another male waiter. We gave our complaints and showed them a picture of the pizza with maggots. They pleaded with us continuously. I asked about the guy that served me the pizza package and we were told that he had quit his job that same day. Daniel called the police and we proceeded to the station. I informed the police about what had happened and they said they would conduct an investigation. The waiter who served me the disgusting pizza was summoned to the station. His name was Lambert Gerald. I finally figured out why his face seemed familiar. We were in the same department in the university. We never really got along in the university because he was from a lower class family and I was always hanging out with group of friends who bullied and insulted him in school. I didn't partake in the bullying, but I didn't stop it either. The police pressured him about the maggots. He confessed and admitted that he put maggots into my pizza and quit his job knowing that I would come back and he was afraid of getting caught. He also confessed to placing the bloody pizza in front of my apartment. The horrible part of his confession was that he had placed pills in the pizza I ordered on the opening night. He overheard me talking to my friend about my job interview. He wanted to make me miss the interview, so he quickly went to a pharmacy nearby to get sleeping pills and mixed a very high dosage in my pizza. He must have been hurt by what we did to him in school and was out for revenge. It turns out, he had a previous criminal record of assault and stalking. I wasn't his only victim. He had also done similar things to my group of friends then. I still feel disgusted whenever I see or smell Domino's Pizza. I had never really been a family person. I'd spent most of my life with my family and during that time, all I could think about was leaving. Don't get me wrong, my family wasn't really bad or anything like that. I just constantly felt smothered any time I was with them. So when it was finally time for me to leave for college, I left and never looked back. I ignored their constant calls and texts. I always made an excuse not to come for the reoccurring family gatherings, and I didn't even send them gifts or messages during their birthdays or holidays. Now, as I said, I didn't do this out of spite. I just wanted to keep my distance from them. And while I didn't know this at the time, it was a decision I would come to regret dearly. If I'm remembering correctly, it happened on the 30th of November, 2015. The Christmas holiday was coming up, and as usual, I made excuses not to come home for the holidays. My mom spent an hour trying to convince me on the phone, and I remember telling her that I had to work and I wouldn't be able to come home. Now, I worked at a nearby joint of the popular Denny's restaurant. Most of my co-workers had gone home for Christmas, and it was just a few of us left. I remember my manager being shocked when I told him I was going to work throughout the holidays, even on Christmas. He asked if I was sure about that, and I told him that it was fine. After my conversation with the manager had ended, I quickly got back to work. I was taking the night shift that night, so it was just me and my co-worker Jill. Jill lived in the area, so she normally worked the night shifts with me. It was a very slow night, and I knew it was because of the holidays. With no customers around and not much going on, Jill and I just talked to each other. During our conversation, I remember her asking me, Why didn't you go home for the holidays, Todd? So I responded with, Well, I weighed my options and it was either going home and spending time with some overbearing people or making a couple of bucks. She laughed before responding with, Overbearing? Your family is really that bad, huh? I then told her, to be honest, they aren't that bad, but sometimes they just get a little too much for me to handle. Besides, there's no other place I'd rather be. I was about to say something else when a strange couple walked into the restaurant. The man was wearing a black shirt with three-quarter denim shorts, and he was holding a green bag in his right hand. His wife, or at least the woman I thought was his wife, was wearing a black and white shirt with black shorts. We immediately stopped our conversation to attend them, as I looked at the man and said... Welcome to Denny, sir. How can I help you? The strange man totally ignored me as he started to make his way behind the counter. Confused, I said, What are you doing, sir? You're not allowed back here. 
But before I could do anything, I felt a gun pressed against my skin. I was about to scream when the man said, Don't you dare make a sound. Jill soon arrived at the scene and she screamed when she realized what was going on. The man then looked at her with cold eyes as he said, I'm going to paint your floor red with his insides if you don't stop screaming. His menacing threat worked instantly as Jill stopped screaming. He then told her, Now, I'm going to take your friend here to the back of the restaurant and keep him hostage. And if you want to see him again, all you have to do is take out all the money in your cash register and give it to my partner here. When he was done speaking, I was then ushered to the back of the restaurant. I remember being so scared that it was hard to breathe. I felt myself getting an anxiety attack, but I tried my best to keep it under control. I could tell Jill was also panicking, but she did everything they asked her as she started to clear the cash register. My eyes started to dart around now as I checked to see if there was anyone nearby that could help us. My assailant noticed me doing this, so he said, I don't think you've ever been shot before, because if you had, you'd think twice about doing anything stupid. I don't need to tell you that anything you do or whatever it is you're thinking of doing won't work. Don't be a hero, kid, because the heroes always die in the end. I really don't give a crap about your pathetic life, and I'd kill you without a second thought. His words pierced through my soul, and it didn't take long before I smelt urine. I had peed myself, and my assailant, who had noticed this, started to laugh. The cash register was empty now, as Jill had given the woman all the money. The man then ordered her to go hide in the back of the restaurant before saying, You better do as I say, or I won't let your friend go. Jill didn't complain as she did exactly what he asked. I was still crippled with fear, but I managed to stutter the words, We've done what you wanted, so please, can I go now? The man who was shocked that I was able to speak looked at me and said, I see you found some courage, but it's too late for that now, and I'm afraid we won't be able to let you go. We aren't done using you yet. When he was done talking, the woman who was working with the man quickly walked out of the restaurant. The man then ushered me towards the door, and with my hands raised in the air, I walked out of the restaurant. When I was outside, he brought out his gun again and told me to face the wall. I did what he asked me to do, as I held on to some hope that I'd come out of this alive. The man then whispered the words, Now, I want you to close your eyes and count to ten. Do as I say, and hopefully, at the end of that countdown, you won't wake up in hell. I started to count, and my heartbeat increased with every number I said. It was the longest ten seconds of my life, and numerous thoughts began to fly through my head. I cursed myself for not taking the holiday break to spend time with my family, as I knew I wouldn't have been in this situation if I did that. I also knew that if this crazy man shot me here, no one would care as I had constantly shunned the only people who would have cared. I then felt nothing but immense fear and regret as I prayed to come out of this situation alive. When I was done counting, I waited for something to happen, but all I heard was silence. It took a lot of courage to do it, but when I finally opened my eyes, they were gone. After the incident, the police were immediately called and we were asked to give our statements. We told them everything that happened and the hidden surveillance cameras were checked. The footage corroborated our stories and a manhunt was set up to find the thieves. He was trying to hide it, but our manager was more worried about the money that was stolen than the well-being of his employees. The news of the small case soon spread around town and it didn't take long before my family heard about it. They all came to visit me the next week and I could tell how worried they were. That incident became a real eye-opener for me as I realized that I had no one that really cared about me apart from them, and no matter how overwhelming or overbearing they got sometimes, they were still my family. So I made a pact with myself to always try harder to get closer to them, and ever since that day, I never missed a family Christmas again. I used to enjoy my work at Denny's. I would wake up by 8 and get to work by 9, serve customers and leave work by 4.30, but... Everything changed when the boss introduced the 24 hours policy. Workers would have to work on shifts. Some workers would work in the morning, everyone would work in the afternoon, and some would stay behind at night till the next morning. Everyone disagreed with the boss's decision at first, but after he offered to increase our salaries, we yielded to his offers. Many of us didn't have options. 
Things were hard enough, and we couldn't risk being jobless for any period. A duty roster was introduced, and everyone knew when they would be working during the 24 hours that our Denny's branch operated. It was a Friday afternoon, and my co-worker and friend John called me to the back of the restaurant to inform me about his mother's illness and how he planned to visit her the next day. She stayed very far away, so he would have to spend at least a night at his parents' house. He asked me if I could cover for him and work his shift in his stead. He had asked the boss for permission to leave, but the boss refused to permit him to leave for even an hour. I thought about it for some seconds, but I yielded to his request when he offered to cover for me whenever I needed help too. I agreed and told him not to worry. We went back into the restaurant. A few hours later, John told me he was leaving and exited the restaurant. It was 4 o'clock and the day shift was finally over. Those who worked the day shift with me were preparing to leave, and those who would work the night shift, I checked the roster to see when John would be getting a break. It was then I realized that John was supposed to be working during the midnight to dawn shift. I panicked for a minute, but gathered myself and decided to go home and come back to work the midnight shift. A promise is a promise, I thought to myself. I went back home, did the needful stuffs, and came back to work to cover for John. I arrived at 11.30 and was ready to work as soon as I got to the restaurant and reached for the door. A gang of people came, pushed me to the side and walked into the restaurant. They were all dressed in similar black t-shirts with a white design on the shirt. The design looked like an anchor. I walked in after them and finally took a good look at them. There were five men and a woman. They all had tattoos and their faces looked scary too. The lady in their midst was wearing very ridiculous looking makeup and was chewing gum very loudly. One of the men had his hand around her neck and they would smooch each other every minute. You could tell they were in a gang of some sort. I kept staring at them as I walked towards the kitchen. I took my uniform and put it on and went on to take orders. There were only three people in the restaurant apart from the gang of people that sat in the booth by the window at the extreme end of the left side of the restaurant, very close to the door. The other people were already attended to, and I didn't want to be the one to take orders from the scary-looking people, but I didn't have any other choice. I went ahead and took their orders. I'm here to take your orders. What would you like? I asked with a shaky tone. They all burst into laughter, and I wondered what was wrong. They started to mimic the way I asked the question. Looks like server boy over here is scared of us, said the scariest-looking of them all. He was the one who had his hand around the lady amidst them. He could tell that he was the leader, and they all burst into laughter again. I felt humiliated and asked again, this time more courageously. Can I take your orders? They stopped laughing and looked at me. Their glare sent shivers down my spine, and I took a step back. It felt like they wanted to attack me. The leader looked at me and said, Don't worry, you'll take our orders soon. I went back to the kitchen to assist my co-workers. Thirty minutes had passed and the gang refused to order anything. Nobody was willing to go and ask again. We were scared of them. An hour passed and many of the customers had left, even those that came in after the gang. A few moments later, every customer apart from the gang had left. Suddenly, one of the gang members stood and went outside. He looked around suspiciously like he was about to do something really bad. He came back in with a canvas messenger bag, and my co-workers and I looked at each other and wondered what they were up to. What do you think is in the bag? I asked Layla, who was beside me. We were both behind the counter. Honestly, I don't want to know, she answered. The gang member placed the bag on the table, and immediately the entire gang got up. The leader opened the bag, and instantaneously they all brought out guns from the bag. Everyone panicked and bent to the floor. They took the guns and walked over to the counter. Some of them went to the door to check out for the cops. Hey, server boy, the gang leader called to me. I'm ready to order now. He pointed the gun at me. He told me to get up and passed me the empty canvas bag and told me to fill it with all the money from the cash register. I began to shake as I stood up and reached for the cash register. I started to fill in the bag with the money as if that wasn't enough. He commanded everyone take off every item that they had on them valuable or not. I didn't have anything important on me, just a broken wristwatch. I filled in the bag with all the money and the gang leader pointed his gun directly at my head. I froze up at that moment. 
The blood-curdling feeling of the gun against my head made me weak. All I could think of was if he was going to pull the trigger or not. But he used his gun to push my head slightly and told me to take the bag around and collect the items for my co-workers. I collected the bag from him shakily and moved away from the counter to collect everything they had taken off. I went around collecting items from the others, and when I was done, I placed the bag in front of the leader. He looked at everyone and pointed his gun to Layla. I said everything, directing his focus to the necklace on her neck. No, please, no, Layla begged. The leader grabbed the necklace from her neck and tried to yank it off, but Layla fought back and tried to stop him from taking it. It meant a lot to her. She had told everyone about how her grandmother who raised her gave her the necklace. It was the only belonging of her grandmother that she had left. The leader would not have it, and he shot Layla multiple times until she lay flat on the floor right beside me. All I could do was stare at her as she bled out and lost consciousness. Everyone began to scream and cry after witnessing the shooting. You weren't supposed to shoot anyone, the lady in the gang said furiously to the leader. You! He pointed the gun at me again. Take the necklace off and put it in the bag, he said. I crawled hurriedly in fear to Layla's dead body and removed the necklace from her neck. Tears rolled down my face as I took the necklace off and placed it in the bag for the gang leader. He raised his gun at me and looked at me with a mortifying glare like he was about to shoot me. Suddenly, we heard sirens. Police sirens. A police car was headed in the direction of the restaurant. One of the gang members who was by the door on the lookout for the cops signaled the leader and he quickly grabbed the bag, passed it to the lady, and they all left. The police came in about a minute after they had left. We informed them about the robbery and shooting that took place, and they chased after the gang. The gang members were eventually caught. After that night, I quit my job at Denny's. It was better to remain jobless than lose my life. I still have nightmares about the robbery and Layla's dead body. I wish I had refused John's offer on that sad day. Hi, my name is James Smith. I'm 30 now. Today I'm going to tell you a horrible story which will blow your mind. This incident happened when I was 25 years old. I had a close friend named Tim. He was also 25. We were like brothers. We both used to work as security guards in the same apartment. Well, it was a fresh morning. Both of us were just chatting away. Tim asked, Hey brother, you had breakfast yet? I said, No bro, not yet. I think I might stop by the shop for some treats. We'll see. Then we both heard the sound of a car which sounded really expensive. We both turned back shocked. A girl came out of that car. She was very beautiful and her clothes, whew, sexy. She was wearing a red dress. Her hair was so pretty and shiny that I just got lost in her beauty on seeing her. Tim just kept looking at her. Not a single word came out of his mouth. He was surprised to see such beauty around here. She was like an actress. It was as if she just finished shooting and had come to live in the apartment. Her name was Christina Jonas. Christina said, Hello, can I have the key to number 411? Oh, okay ma'am. We'll take your luggage. We'll deliver it to your apartment. We delivered her luggage and went. It was as if Tim had become crazy about her. He was talking to me again and again about her. Tim had a nice nature. After all, we were best friends. Everyone in the colony considered him very decent because he was always ahead in helping everyone. Whether they were young or old, he would help anyone. That's why he was a popular security guard in the apartment. He even was a little shy. One day, Christina was coming home from shopping. While shopping, one of her boxes fell down. Tim said that he'll take that box to her house. Suddenly, a boy named Alexander came there. Alexander said, Give me that box. I'll give it to her. She's my friend. Hey, sir, you don't need to worry. I'll give this box to her. Alexander, now kind of more angry. I said I'll give it to her. You stay here. Alexander lived in the floor above Christina. He used to like her a lot so he used to go there and try to hang around with her. He eventually went there for frequent visits. They'd become close friends. And just like that, a couple of months passed and that friendship grew even deeper. One day, Christina was looking really upset. 
It was as if she was worried about something. The next day, Christina's maid Rihanna reached their house and knocked on the door, but no one responded for a long time when she knocked. Open the door, please, ma'am. But the door opened after a little push from her. It meant that the door was already open. When Rihanna went inside, she was completely surprised. There was blood on the floor, everywhere. She got terrified. Then she moved forward, a dead body lying just inside which belonged to Christina. Someone had mercilessly chopped her to pieces, and it seemed as if something wrong had happened. There were no clothes on the body. Rihanna screamed, and some people came. We heard the noise, and both Tim and I ran towards the flat. How can someone be so cruel? The whole room was filled with blood. The scene there was so dangerous that even the maid had become dizzy. Christina's fingers were chopped off. The killer tried to cut her left hand, but it wasn't completely gone. He almost cut off each of her legs. I got goosebumps seeing such a scene. It was terrible. Everyone was shocked. Tim called the police immediately. Police came to the place and an investigation started right away. During the investigation, it was found that Alexander used to visit her house continuously, which we knew. There was a wristwatch on the floor. It was a gentleman's watch. This watch belongs to Alexander. Yeah, he used to visit her house, and the day before the murder took place, she was upset. Tim said, Christina was really nice, used to help everyone. Don't know who would have done this to him, sir. Let's catch him. And it was also known from the CCTV footage that he had come there at night. Police went to his flat, but it was locked. So, police started searching for Alexander. We all got to know that he murdered Christina, and that's why he escaped. After three days, police found him. He was caught at a friend's house. Here at the police station, the detective said, Hello, Mr. Alexander. Now there's no use in you hiding whatever you know. Tell us clearly. All the evidence points towards you. I'm not trying to hide anything. Whatever I'm saying, I promise is the truth. I haven't done any such thing to Christina. I went to her house that day because I had an argument with her, and I just went to apologize. The police did a third degree on him. Nothing was found. He got bailed after 15 days. Now, after almost a month went by, there lived one child who lived in the apartment next to Christina. He repeatedly tried to tell me something, but I didn't know why he was so scared. I tried to ask him a lot, and I asked again and again, and finally he opened his mouth. The child said, Christina? She fought Uncle Tim. She was shouting at him very much, and when Uncle came out, he had tears in his eyes. He was crying and seemed angry too. I had a half early exam the next day. That's why I was awake. It was 12 o'clock at night. When I told my parents, they forbade me to tell all these things to the police. I went to the parents of that child and talked about it. They told me that was absolutely true because she did not want to get involved in the murder case. That's why they didn't tell the police or anyone about it. So as soon as I came to know all that, I immediately went to the police and told the matter. Because he was my childhood friend and he was very gentle, I never thought he would do such a brutal thing in his life. I had to go to the police. After this incident, his different face came in front of everyone. People couldn't believe that he could do something like this. So police caught him and investigated. Third degree was done on him. Many charges were filed against Tim, but he was not ready to say anything. On the eighth day, he spoke. You bloodthirsty man, now open your mouth. Talk. Yes, yes, yes. I did. I did it. I killed her. She didn't listen to me at all. I loved her so much. A day before her murder, I'd express my love to her, but she rejected me. Oh, Jesus. She said that she was in love with Alexander and that she wants to marry him. Hearing this made my mind go completely out of control. I tried to explain to her a lot, but she wasn't ready to even listen. I just got so angry. I slit her throat and killed her right there. Tim, you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail. But I loved her so much, I wanted to celebrate a honeymoon with her and get married. I was going to cut her into pieces and then transport her body away from the scene. But Alexander got there before me and I had to flee. He rang the door and... I guess he thought Christina was too angry after their fight earlier that day. He said he'll come again in the morning to apologize and just left. I can't believe I never saw this, but my best friend Tim was a psycho. He was in prison for life. I couldn't believe that Tim, my best friend, was a murderer.
It started when I was 14 years old. I had gone to bed the night before in my home, but when I woke up, I realized that I was lying on a bench in our town's park. Now, I loved going to the park when I was a kid, as my dad used to take me there before he passed. It was a place I always felt safe, but that morning, I was extremely confused as to how I got there and why I was still wearing my PJs. My mind couldn't come up with a reasonable explanation for it, so I made my way home. When I finally arrived, I saw the worried looks on my mom's and her then-boyfriend Thomas Wyatt faces. As they rushed to hug me, my mom told me that she was extremely worried when she couldn't find me in my room that morning, and she was just about to call the cops as they really thought I was missing. Confused and upset, my mom asked why I left the house late at night. But I was just as confused as her, and I told her I didn't remember leaving the house. The confusion just rose from there, till our neighbor, Old Lady Margaret, told my mom and me that she caught a glimpse of me sleepwalking very late last night. I never had a problem with sleepwalking before, so my mom took me to see a doctor. The doctor told my mom that the sleepwalking could have been caused by numerous things, but she assured my mom that it was a common phase in a growing child's life, and I would eventually grow out of it. My mom felt calmer after hearing that, and she assumed that it was going to be a one-night thing, but unfortunately for her, that was just the beginning. As I started to constantly sleepwalk every single night after that day, just like the first night, every time I sleepwalked, I would always wake up at the park. Most nights, my mom stayed up and made numerous attempts to wake me, but I was told I would scream anytime someone tried to. Most of the time, it felt like they were telling me stories about another person, as I absolutely couldn't recall doing the things they said I did. After a while, I could tell my sleepwalking problem was getting worse, as it showed no signs of stopping. Apparently, during the previous night, my mom's boyfriend, Thomas, had managed to carry me back to my room when I sleepwalked out of the house, but I didn't stay there for long, as I was told I left my room a few minutes later. That's when they realized that even putting me back in my room didn't stop the sleepwalking. Thomas had been really supportive of me and my mom during the sleepwalking phase. He was a really nice guy, and he was the only one of my mom's numerous boyfriends who made an effort to get to know me as he always tried his best to get close to me. Through all this, he gave me and my mom reassuring words, and he was always there to lend a helping hand. But even with the help of both Thomas and my mom, the sleepwalking didn't stop. They eventually tried to lock my room's door, but I was told I would scream till it was open. More visits to the doctor were made, and the doctor told my mom that locking me in my room wouldn't solve anything, as making me feel trapped will just make things worse. As this went on, it didn't take long before I noticed my mom was really worried, so that night I decided to do something about it. I decided to pull an all-nighter as I believed that if I stayed awake all night, I would be able to overcome the recurring sleepwalking. Things went fine at first, as I managed to stay awake for most of the night. But once the clock struck 12.30, I felt intense fear, as each and every hair on my body began to stand. I didn't know why I suddenly got scared, as there was nothing in my room. But the crippling fear just rose from there. I tried my best to fight it, but my body wanted to leave my room, and the only word that was screaming through my mind was run. Words can't really explain how I felt that night, as I wondered what I was supposed to be scared of in my own home. It was nearing 1 o'clock a.m. now, and the overwhelming fear really started to get to me. I eventually couldn't take it anymore, as my body told me that I needed to run now. So I agreed. I made my way to the door, and as I opened it, I saw my mom's boyfriend, Thomas, standing in front of the door. Then I ran into his arms as I said, I'm so glad you're here, Thomas. I'm really scared, and I don't know why. I'm also really confused, and all I know is that my gut told me I needed to get out of my room now. When I was done talking, I looked at Thomas, who now had a sick grin on his face. He then looked at me and said, now, my sweet Clara, I need you to be a good girl and behave nicely for me. I promise I'll have my fun and you won't remember a thing when I'm done. 
I'm so happy that you're in your room tonight, my sweet Claire. After our first wonderful night together, I wanted to spend all my nights with you. But you started sleepwalking and I could never find you in your room. I even tried to put you back in your room on most nights, but you always left again. Thankfully, you finally overcome that problematic issue tonight and you've come running right back into my arms. Appalled, I stepped back from him as I had a horrific realization. At first, I thought it was just a bad dream, but everything from that night started coming back to me. I remembered how he came into my room and pressed a white cloth over my nose. I remembered how powerless I was to do anything as the chemical he used to drug me was potent. I then finally realized why I was so terrified as it happened at exactly 1 a.m. on that fateful night. I recalled how I didn't tell my mom about it because the chemical I was drugged with made me forget most of what happened and it also made me feel like it was just a bad dream. Terrified, I looked at Thomas, who was now bringing out the same white cloth from his pocket. He then walked up to me as he said, Now, my sweet Claire, I need you to be a good girl and behave nicely for me. I promise I'll have my fun and you won't remember a thing when I'm done. I tried to run out of the room, but he grabbed me before I could reach the door. He tried to force the cloth over my nose, but I struggled and resisted. I started to fight back, and I managed to bite his hand really hard. He screamed from the pain as he threw me across the room. My whole body ached now, but I wasn't going to give up. I started to scream out my mom's name as I crawled toward the door. My mom, who had become a light sleeper ever since I started to sleepwalk, rushed into the room. It didn't take long before she realized what was going on, and she started to protect me by fending off his repeated attacks. He was far stronger than her, and it didn't take long before my mother was being beaten by the man who she thought loved her. I knew my mom gave me a chance, and I wasn't going to waste it, so I ran. I ran all the way out of the house to see old lady Margaret standing on our lawn with a phone in her hand. She said she had heard screaming, so she decided to call the cops, and it didn't take long before I started to hear the sirens. After that traumatizing experience, Thomas Wyatt was arrested and given up to 30 years in prison. I had to see numerous psychologists after that experience, and with the knowledge of the incident, they told my mom and me that the cause of the sleepwalking was my body subconsciously trying to protect itself while I slept by automatically undergoing the fight or flight response seen in humans when danger is near. She then added that the body takes itself to somewhere it feels safe, which is why I kept waking up at the park. The psychologist then told me and my mom that sleepwalking cases like these were very rare. After the incident, my mom constantly blamed herself for bringing that man into our house. I always told her it wasn't her fault and that I didn't blame her for anything that happened that night. For a period after that, even though I was 15 years old, I found myself sleeping in the same bed as my mom, just like I used to when I was a kid. I always felt safe whenever I did that, and after those nights, I never went sleepwalking again. The strange phenomenon hit our town like an epidemic. It originally started with a girl named Valerie Maverick, as she was one of the first children who started sleepwalking in our little town. Then it moved on to Ezekiel Jameson, and it didn't take long before every single one of the kids in my grade started sleepwalking. I was 13 at the time, and I was in the 8th grade, and I remember that when the numerous reports of mass sleepwalking started to occur, it perplexed all the doctors, psychologists, and scientists in our town. The strange occurrence baffled all of them, as somnambulism, widely known as sleepwalking, wasn't a contagious activity. Things were fine at first, as most specialists calmed troubled parents by telling them that everything was going to be fine. But it didn't take long before a mass panic started to happen in our town, as some of the children who left their homes while sleepwalking never came back the next morning. Troubled parents started locking their children's doors at night, but that just made things worse, because in an attempt to get out of the room while sleepwalking, most children viciously banged their heads against the door until someone opened it. And some even went as far as jumping out of their high windows 
to their deaths. The horrific news started making headlines as doctors and specialists had never seen sleepwalking cases as peculiar as these. Strangely, the sleepwalking epidemic only affected children who were aged between 12 and 13, so it was mainly children in the eighth grade. Since locking them up was a bad option, efforts were made to follow these children in order to see where they were going. And after trailing them, they realized that after leaving their respective houses, all the children gathered in a secluded area behind the town school and waited patiently until they woke up the next morning. Now, I was one of the few kids in the eighth grade who wasn't affected by the strange sleepwalking phenomenon. And at the time, I guessed it was because I didn't really sleep much at night. I usually spent most of my nights playing video games or watching anime, and I always went to bed early in the morning rather than at night. But one night, while I was gaming, I felt myself dozing off as I was extremely sleepy. I found it really odd, as my body had gotten accustomed to staying up all night. I tried to shake off the sleep, but I couldn't. And the last thing I remember that night was closing my eyes for a second before I woke up the next morning at the back of my school, surrounded by my classmates. My father had come to get me as I had apparently dozed off and started sleepwalking. I was scared now, as the strange sleepwalking phenomenon had finally gotten to me, but I was determined not to do it again. So that night, I snuck into the kitchen and drank a lot of extra caffeinated coffee. After doing that, I felt more awake than ever before. But after a couple of hours, I felt my eyes shutting themselves, just like the night before. I tried to fight it again, but it felt like I was being forced to sleep by an unseen force. I continued to fight the urge to sleep till I eventually felt myself entering a trance-like state. It's hard to put into words, but it was almost like I was asleep and awake at the same time. I felt my body move on its own, and no matter how much I tried to stop it, I couldn't, as it truly felt like my body had a mind of its own. I saw myself walk out of the house and down the street to school. The scene terrified me as I watched my classmates leave their houses and walk like they were being pulled by invisible strings towards the school. From what I can remember, it looked like a really messed up class activity. Like last night, we all finally gathered at the back of our school. We waited there motionless for a while, till I saw someone emerge from the bushes. His name was Francis Harrison, and he was our 8th grade English teacher. Now, I could never really remember what happened in Mr. Harrison's class, as I always zoned out for some reason, but I felt like he was one of my favorite teachers, as his classes always made me feel calm. Confused as to what he was doing there, I watched him bring out a phone as he said, They weren't followed tonight. Bring over the van immediately. A black van then rolled out almost immediately, and I saw a very shady man walk out of it. Mr. Francis then said, Stand still, children. And even though everyone was asleep, their bodies all obeyed. He and the strange man started to look through the children as the man said, I only want the best quality. This one looks like she will fetch a fine price. He then pointed to one of my classmates, Ruby Pierce. Mr. Francis then looked at her and said, Now, be a good girl, Ruby, and hop in the van. I watched in horror as Ruby, who was still sleeping, obeyed his words and walked into the van. One by one, I watched as they picked off my classmates before they finally reached me. I stood motionless as I heard the man say, What's wrong with this one? His eyes are half open. He doesn't look like he's fully under your control like the others. Mr. Francis then said, He is. I'll show you. Leonardo Scott, I want you to go into that van right this second. As he spoke, my body began to move towards the van. Scared now, I started to strongly fight whatever was controlling me. It took a lot of strength, but after a while, I managed to regain a little control, so I let out a gut-wrenching scream. My scream sent the other kids into a frenzy as they all started to act up. Shocked, Mr. Francis rushed towards me as he tried to silence my screams, but I instinctively knew what to do when defending myself from people much bigger than me. So. I went for his eyes by thrusting a couple of my fingers into them. He screamed, and he finally let go of me, and so I started to run. 
The loud noise of frantic children had alerted a nearby security guard, and the cops were called immediately. The next day, I was called in by some of the police officers, as I was the only kid who regained some form of consciousness through everything that happened that night. I then told them everything that I saw, and an investigation was carried out into Mr. Francis's life. It didn't take long before it was revealed that the man called Mr. Francis Harrison never existed. He was using a fake identity, and his real name was Dmitry Oslo. He was a hardened Russian criminal who was wanted in over 40 states. He was also a notorious child trafficker and kidnapper who used forms of advanced hypnosis in addition to scopolamine, widely known as devil's breath, to kidnap his victims easily and willingly. Eventually, traces of the drug were found in our system, and after a while, the memory of what actually happened during his supposed English classes started coming back to us as we recalled how he hypnotized and instructed each and every one of us to walk to the back of the school every night while we were sleeping. The case baffled the detectives, and an explanation for the mass sleepwalking phenomenon was finally given. A manhunt was set out to find Mr. Francis Harrison, but unfortunately, he hasn't been found till this very day. I am Danelle, and I'm a college-going student. I do not believe in ghosts or spirits. Instead, I believe in science. But the incident at my elder cousin's wedding scares and astonishes me to this date. It was a winter wedding, just as Mia wanted. A destination winter wedding on a beach resort. Being the eldest in the family, her wedding was happening way before the rest of us cousins. Naturally, the whole family was united for this grand event, and everyone was very excited. Mia's side of the family comes from money, and hence they had booked a suite in the resort for all the relatives to live. My mum was unwell, so she could not attend the wedding, hence I had to represent her and me at the wedding. The hotel suite was to be shared by mum and me, but she was not there. I was the only one staying in the room. Honestly, I love hotel rooms and everything related to it. So it was not a big deal for me to stay alone, and I was a big college girl after all, so hardly anything scared me. The wedding celebration was two days long, means we had to stay two nights in the hotel. My room was on the second floor and had a beach view, which pleased me even more. Now, I have a big family, and there are a lot of first and second cousins. Mia also invited a lot of friends and colleagues who were probably her age and married with a few kids. So there was a lot of unknown crowd for the wedding. The first day celebration was more of a family get-together. I and my cousins had a blast. After the celebration, at about one at night, I returned to my room and was in desperate need of a shower. I was a bit tipsy so I stumbled my way into the shower and cleaned the stench of sweat and alcohol from myself. When I returned from the shower, there was a little girl with blonde hair, green eyes, maybe three or four years old, sitting on my bed and playing with my clutch, which I had just thrown on the bed while I made my way towards the shower. I was a bit spooked at first as to how she might have got in, but then thought that maybe I had left the door open by mistake while I came in. The girl was engrossed in playing with my purse and did not notice me at all until I called for her. I said, hey baby girl, what are you doing here? She looked up at me and smiled a toothy smile. I was just playing with the bag. I like it. It is colorful and shiny. Mum has the same, she replied. But how did you get in? I asked, sounding as friendly as I could. The girl said nothing, but instead pointed at my door. What's your name? I asked again. Cindy was her reply. So, well, Cindy, it's too late to be in someone else's room. Shouldn't you be with your mum now? I asked sweetly, to which she gave a strange reply. Mum left me here. Cindy climbed off my bed and away into the hotel corridor. I was still wrapped in the towel and my hair was dripping on the carpet below. I was extremely exhausted. And even when I should have checked after Cindy, I decided otherwise. 
I shut the door, got changed, and switched off the lights and climbed into the bed, too tired to think or do otherwise. The next day was the wedding, and the whole hotel was bustling with the guests, caterers, and whatnot. It was a grand wedding, followed by an equally amazing reception. I was truly happy for Mia and wished Mum was here to witness it too. After the reception, as all the guests were moving back to their rooms to call the night off, I and one of my cousins, Sarah, were headed to our rooms too, as hers was on the same floor. I narrated to her the incident with Cindy. Sarah knew of many Mia's friends and colleagues as they work in the same firm. I asked her if she knows who was Cindy's mom, and how could she leave Cindy at someone else's door so late at night? To which Sarah replied she did not recall any of Mia's friends or colleagues having a daughter named Cindy. By the time we had this talk, we were on the second floor. We went our separate ways to our suites. As I entered the room, I felt like something was off. I checked the whole suite for something amiss or out of order, but everything was as it was. I went to the balcony, still in the reception outfit. The moon had cast a soft shadow on the beach, and there, right in front of me on the beach, on the damp sand, sat Cindy. The waves were rising by every minute, signs of a coming high tide. I was worried sick for the little girl, so without thinking any further, I yelled her name. She was so engrossed in playing that she couldn't hear me. And suddenly, she got up and started walking in the direction of the water. By now, I was screaming and running down the flight of stairs to reach the beach. I did not bother that my dress was being dragged behind me, probably wet and dirty in the wet sand. I ran in the direction of the water, but in the minutes it took me to get down, Cindy had disappeared. I went waist deep in the water, but she was nowhere. I was ready to dive deep when I heard someone calling my name. I turned around to see a hotel butler calling me. I tried explaining to him what was happening, that I had to go deep to get her. But he was having none of it. He shouted for me to come out. I had no idea what took over me, but I thought for a split second that maybe Cindy's mom took her away. I returned to the shore, and the butler practically shoved me in the hotel reception. The receptionist and some of the other hotel staff were gathered, and everyone had a worried look on. I asked them what happened, to which one of them told me a story of a real-life incident that shook me to my core. Cindy had died in the sea at night a few years ago. The room I was living in was booked by Cindy's father on the day she died. He was having an affair and wanted to leave Cindy and her mom. When Cindy's mom found out, she stomped into the hotel along with her daughter and left her at her father's sweet door. Her mom did not want Cindy's responsibility either, so she had abandoned her at her father's door. Her dad did not open the door for Cindy. Eventually, she wandered off on the beach and drowned in the rising high tide. Since that day, she was seen by many occupants of that room. Apparently, I was the seventh person to run into the sea to save her. A woman before me had died saving her. This information paralyzed me for a while, barely able to speak. I spent the night in Sarah's room, too afraid to step in my suite. I still remember her face so clearly, those green eyes, toothy grin and blonde hair, and more than anything, I remember her last words to me. Mum left me here. I grew up an avid urbex enthusiast here in New York City. As you can imagine, there are awesome sights here, but weirdly, I'd say more than 50% of the community agree that one of the urbex holy grails is over in Cincinnati. Yep. While Cincinnati is famous for that weird Greek chili or their OG baseball team, among the urbex crowd it's famous for one thing, the Cincinnati subway. For those of you that don't know, the subway was intended as a replacement for the Cincinnati streetcar system. Construction started around the end of World War I, but then after the Great Depression hit, the project just tanked. What remains is just over two miles of derelict tunnels and stations, making it the largest abandoned subway system in the United States. 
Cracking the place is like an urbex rite of passage, giving you infinite bragging rights having explored a labyrinth of subterranean tunnels that's larger than some towns. I thought my visit to the subway would be a dream come true. Me and my group planned it for months and I don't think I've ever been so excited about anything. But in reality, it turned out to be one of the most confusing and terrifying experiences of my life, something I'll never be able to fully explain. As I said, it took quite a bit of planning to get the four of us out to southwestern Ohio. On top of barely being able to afford the gas money, we had to drive my friend's trashy 1990 Chevy Lumina, which was in such a bad way that it had become a meme of itself. It took almost 12 hours to get to Cincinnati, that's including a bathroom break, so even after leaving at like 9am, the very earliest we could muster everyone, it was way after dark by the time we arrived. We were tired, starving, and in no mood to head underground right away, so after a brief discussion, we decided to get a few hours sleep before heading down into the subway. This turned out to be a terrible idea. We barely got any sleep, so after a few hours we decided to just get some breakfast at a 24-7 McDonald's, then hit up the subway while we could still use the darkness for cover. The entrance to the tunnels, at least the one we used, turned out to be right in plain sight. It was just sat at the side of the highway, clear as day, and although the big grey iron doors were incredibly heavy, they proved to be unlocked. And just like that, we were in. Then, one of us switched on their flashlight and for a second, I was kind of taken aback. The concrete walls inside the entrance were completely bare, not a single tag or piece of graffiti art anywhere. One of the best parts of Urbex is occasionally stumbling across what amounts to a secret gallery. So, to come across a place with no art where I expected it most was kind of disappointing. It didn't set alarm bells ringing or whatever, it was just unusual. Anyway, we excitedly start advancing down the entrance tunnel and find that it branched off into two twin tunnels that ran side by side. Then, after a few minutes of walking, the tunnels opened up into our first abandoned station. You can imagine what this looked like. Wide platforms with support columns, staircases that led to nowhere. It was a pretty cool find and it was there that we found our first piece of street art. Only, instead of being something to admire, I remember finding it distinctly intimidating. Someone had sprayed a huge black figure onto the whole length of one wall, with its head and shoulders kind of overflowing onto the ceiling. The perspective made it look like it was staring down at you, and it definitely made for an intelligent and decidedly creepy piece of artwork. The logistics of it were downright impressive too. The walls had to be at least 15 foot high at the platform level, meaning someone had probably hauled a ladder down there with him at some point just to spray that blank-faced yeti-looking thing on the wall. After we were suitably unnerved by the big dark figure, we carried on through the rail tunnels, hitting up station after station as we went. Each one had a series of smaller tunnels leading off from them. Some were just a handful of dead ends. Others seemed to snake off into the darkness for quite a way. But the last station we got to, or at least that I got to, had a ton of different passages leading off from it. I'm guessing we were around the center of the subway system by that point because I read that they'd planned to dig out the central terminal station first, then tunnel outwards so everything fit to scale. And given that there seemed to be a tunnel passageway or corridor at every compass point, I'm guessing we were in that terminal station. Despite the creepy street art, we're getting pretty comfortable by that point. The first 10 to 15 minutes after you crack an old abandoned building can be a real adrenaline rush, and if there are hazards to be aware of, your heart stays pounding almost the whole way through. By that time, our count was in the high 50s, and I go so far as to say that we were pretty experienced. But that experience brings comfort and getting too comfortable makes you sloppy. Add on to that a bad night's sleep and the sugar crash from having gorged under the golden arches and for me personally, it was a recipe for disaster. 
It's not a strict life or death rule, but generally speaking, you don't split up when exploring an abandoned building. Sure, you can head off into an adjacent room, dip slightly out of sight for a second, but you don't go off wandering on your own. Not unless you're very, very confident of your surroundings. You hear horror stories about gas sinks where someone walks into a room and just passes out and dies, all totally silently. Then one by one, their friends follow them into the room, only to join them in death. Little tidbits like that serve as great warnings, but gas sinks are an extremely rare phenomenon that you only get when you're really deep underground. So despite the potential for danger, I think I just switched off a few seconds and wandered down a passageway on my own. It was dumb, I know, but I swear I didn't walk too far, and I remember the feeling of confusion when I turned around and walked back down the corridor, only to find that it didn't open back up into the abandoned station. I stopped and paused for a second, feeling this momentary sense of bewilderment wash over me before I took a deep breath and gathered my thoughts. My crew had to be at the end of the corridor I was looking at. It was only logical. But when I walked down it, still using my flashlight to cut through the darkness, and there was still no station, I'll admit that I started to panic a little. My voice echoes as I called out down the corridor, hoping my friends might be able to hear me. When they didn't respond, I did what anyone else might do, just went straight into denial. I called out sarcastically, <laughs> Very funny, guys. You can come out now. But no one replied. Then I tried to stop myself from walking down another corridor, but in that brief little moment of panic, I just couldn't help myself. It didn't make sense. I knew how to follow my own footsteps. I'd done it a thousand times before. But there I was, fifty-something derps under my belt, and I'd actually gone and gotten myself lost. I just put it down to how tired I was and how dark the subway was, then reached in my backpack to retrieve my walkie-talkie. We always pack these small things, but powerful radios just in case. We never really had to use them before, but there's a first time for everything, right? So, I got the radio out, switched it on, then began talking on the agreed-upon Channel 1. Our little pre-agreed protocol was that as soon as someone gets separated, out come the radios. The guys must have figured I was missing by that point, so they must have had their radios out, or at least one of them. But when I talked onto the channel and got nothing in reply, I went back to thinking that they were just playing a prank on me. Then suddenly, my radio buzzes to life with an incoming transmission. It sounded kind of distorted, but that didn't surprise me given that we were surrounded by masses of concrete. But as I'm straining my ears to listen to voices in the static, I realize it's not any of my buddy's voices. In fact, it sounded a lot more like a woman. It was slightly accented, a feminine voice, but I could only make out every fourth or fifth word. Everything else was just garbled. Yet as I strained my ears and concentrated, I heard the voice repeating something that sounded an awful lot like, Help me. That was the first time I'd ever come to a full-on panic while in an abandoned building, and I had to actually make an effort to control my breathing and keep calm. I told myself that the help me I thought I heard could have been almost any two-syllable phrase, and rationally speaking, the subway was a limited space. Even if I'd managed to get myself lost, there was no way I could stay lost if I just kept moving. So, that's exactly what I did. I switched on my little headlamp, told myself everything was going to be fine, then just walked off into the darkness. My main goal was to find the station we'd been standing in. That way I could effectively retrace my steps and find my way out of the subway system. But I walked and walked for maybe 15 to 20 minutes, and the whole time I failed to find an abandoned station, or even any of the twin railway tunnels we'd used to get into the place. It was just corridor after corridor, some of which forked off into two or three other passageways, and no matter which one I took, I never seemed to make any progress. I knew I could walk a mile in around 15 minutes, which meant that I could walk the entire length of the subway system in around 30 to 40. 
So when I clocked 45 minutes of walking, and I still hadn't found an exit, I felt myself getting that feeling of panic rising up into my chest again. It just didn't make any sense. The whole way I'd been talking to my radio, trying to raise my buddies, but to no avail. They had to be in range. Those radios were some of the most expensive things we owned, and the only reasonable explanation is the concrete was just too thick for the radio waves to penetrate. But still, even with a semi-rational explanation like that, I found one distinct thought creeping into my head. Something is very, very wrong here. Either something was wrong with me, or something was wrong with the tunnels, and being a somewhat rational person, I went with the first theory. I remember having to turn back when I wound up hitting a dead end, but after a few hundred feet, I realized I was walking a different layout of corridors than I had previously. Some of them had these cuboid concrete bumps in them, like they were the foundations for some kind of barrier. But then I started seeing them on the ceiling too, these 3D rectangles that looked like they'd been chiseled out of the rock. I hadn't seen those things walking down the corridor the first time at least. I hadn't noticed them, but then my suspicions were confirmed when I noticed that the concrete ahead of me was all wet, something which definitely hadn't been the case a few minutes before. That little detail did really bother me, way worse than losing my buddies too. As you can probably guess, underground tunnels and water leaks are a very bad combination, and the discovery added an even graver sense of danger to the situation. After I noticed the water, my pace increased significantly as I tried my best to keep calm, but the further I went, the harder that got. The sound of my wet footsteps had me praying I wasn't heading towards the source of the leak, and that I wasn't about to hit by some underground tsunami or something. Not the most rational fear I know, but like I said, I was struggling to remain calm. But then, right as the tension was really ramping up, I could have sworn that I'd heard a second set of wet footsteps in the tunnel behind me. I remember stopping dead in my tracks and listening, but the sound didn't continue, so I figured it was just an echo of my own footsteps. Yet shortly after continuing on my way, I heard a footstep behind me that was most definitely not in rhythm with my own. Again, I stop. Only that time I spin around on the spot, shining my flashlight into the darkness. I didn't see anything, and the sound of footsteps didn't continue but I started to get this horrible feeling that there was something just out of range of my flashlight. That then queued up all these questions like, who's down here without a flashlight, and who might follow me and not announce themselves? The Cincinnati PD had been known to patrol the tunnels and kick out any homeless trying to sleep there, and the urbex crowd tend to hate cops and security guards, but I found myself in this weird position where I actually hoped it was a cop that was following me, and not someone else. I tried to just push on, but turning around every so often when I thought I heard footsteps began to slow me down. And then I began to hit other obstacles. Those same cubes of concrete I'd seen previously, only they were much larger. Some of them were so big I had to actually step up onto them to get past. It made no sense why they were there either, like they only seemed to serve the purpose of constructing the tunnel. After another few hundred yards, the beam of my flashlight began to illuminate something that just sent my stomach into knots. For absolutely no reason I could discern, the tunnel abruptly narrowed to the point that there was only a very small vertical gap that I'd have to push myself a couple of feet through to keep going. I actually just stood there for a second and said out loud, You have to be kidding me. The only other thing was the worry that the gap would somehow narrow even further, and that I might get stuck trying to get through. But right as I'm mulling that thought over, I heard the sound of footsteps behind me. Only that time, there was no mistaking it. It couldn't have been the echo of my own. There was definitely someone else in that tunnel with me. I called out to them, wishful thinking I suppose, and when the speed of the footsteps dramatically increased, I knew their intentions toward me were not good. Fight or flight kicked in, and in the moment, I chose flight, shoving myself shoulder first into the narrow opening in the concrete before grinding my way through. 
The whole time I expected to feel a hand grabbing at my back, and when I finally popped out of the other side, I spun around and shone my flashlight to see who in God's name was chasing me. But there was no one. I knew they were there, though, hiding off just to the side, maybe just waiting for me to let my guard down before pushing through after me. Needless to say, I didn't wait to find out if I was right. I just took off along the wet concrete, trying to put as much distance between myself and my pursuer as possible. As I ran, I started to notice a lot more of those weird cuboid structures, only this time some of them were triangular, like little pyramids coming out of the walls, floor, and ceiling. The others had at least looked like they served some kind of purpose, but these new things looked almost completely random, like they were a glitch in a video game's levels or something. I'd have taken more time to observe them if I hadn't been running for my life. Only after a few hundred yards or so, the tunnel narrowed off yet again. Only that time, it was like nothing I'd ever seen in my entire life. Now that I think back on it, it was like looking at a piece of tessellated art. Like the kind that uses different sizes of the same shape to create a kind of 3D optical illusion. It would have been fascinating if I hadn't been forced to crawl through it on my stomach, not knowing if I was going to get trapped and starved to death in there. The whole lining of the passageway was ridged with tiny versions of the same pyramid structures and it was so narrow that I had to take off my backpack and shove it in front of me in order to fit through. The little ridges raked at my back the whole way, but my adrenaline was pumping so hard that I could like feel the damage it was doing. It just didn't hurt. And then came the moment where I couldn't advance any further. I could feel the little ridges against my skull, neck, and shoulders. I couldn't push my backpack any further, and I was actually stuck. I was so scared I felt sick, and I'm not ashamed to say I felt the overwhelming urge to burst into tears. My mom had always told me that I'd eventually get myself hurt if I persisted with the trespassing nonsense and... In that moment, it seemed like she'd been proven right. Only the thing that made me want to burst into tears was the fact that she might never find out how right she was. I'd never be found because I knew I was somewhere I wouldn't be found just by looking for it. I know that must make no sense, but in that moment, trapped in the bizarre, intricately chiseled crawl space, it made all the sense of the world. And just as it was sinking in just how screwed I really was, I heard something moving through the tunnels behind me. I'm not even sure how this really happened because as much as I tried to force my way through the crawl space, I simply could not go any further. But hearing that person and what I'm assuming was a person moving up behind me, it just sent me into overdrive. I just kept focusing on kicking my legs, wiggling my torso, and pushing my backpack in front of me that I barely even realized I'd shoved it out the other side. Then once I could get a grip of the opening, I let out all the air in my lungs to be able to fit through and pulling with all my might. Feeling myself free of the crawlspace concrete grip was the second time that night that I almost cried, but there was no time to celebrate. I had to keep moving, only right when I needed it the most, right when I thought I was about to lose my mind with fear, my flashlight started to flicker. I'd replaced the batteries that night in preparation for exploring the subway. There was no way I could have been down there long enough to drain them. And I just lost it. Consumed by panic. And I sprinted down the corridor, trying to make as much progress as possible before the flashlight gave out entirely. It started to flicker again and I was running. I actually started calling out, Mom, Mom, like she could somehow save me from a nightmarish fate. Then I tripped, and I hit the dirt hard. I felt the sting of the grazes on my forearms mix with my sweat, and there was this dull ringing in my ear that I first figured was from being knocked unconscious. But the monotonous ringing wasn't anything in my head. It was from a nearby highway. And when I opened my eyes, I saw I was back outside. I have absolutely no idea how I got back outside after tripping in the darkness. When I stopped ugly weeping into the dirt, 
I looked around for the entrance I'd fallen out of, but I couldn't see anything. Then right as I'm trying to work out what in God's name just happened to me, I feel my phone buzzing in my pocket as it reconnected to the cell network. And I won't bore you with the whole aftermath. I feel like this whole thing is just a massive wall of text already, but the looks on my friend's faces on the ride back as I tried to explain what happened, well, they put me off ever trying to properly explain it to someone. I went to therapy for a few years after a psychiatrist diagnosed me as having experienced a stress-induced psychotic break. I tried to accept that what happened was all just in my head, but honestly, I know that isn't entirely the case. And for some reason, whenever my mind wanders back to that night, I think of that giant black figure someone had spray-painted on the wall. At the time, I had no idea why anyone would spend so much time on something that no one might ever see. But now, I think I understand. My name is George. I'm 32 years old, and I have to confess that I'm afraid of elevators. Every time I'm in a building, I have to take the stairs. At first, this brought me some problems with my wife and children, but over time, and after learning the reason for my fear, they got used to it. I know many people with a fear of elevators. Some people's fears come because it's an enclosed space. Others are afraid of the elevator falling down, and some are just afraid for no reason. Whatever the reason for fearing this small place, it hardly compares to mine. I was just 15 years old and coming back from playing soccer with my friends. At the time, I was still living in an apartment with my parents. Although we were only on the third floor, I never used the stairs. We had an elevator, so why bother? I remember that day was a Thursday, and my friends almost canceled the game because it was cloudy and could rain. I convinced them to go on with the game. Luckily, it didn't rain. As soon as I got home, I stopped the elevator before the doors closed, got in, and pressed the third floor. I hadn't realized until that moment, but next to me on the other side of the elevator was a silhouette standing there, staring at me. The man who was sharing the elevator with me was tall and very skinny, almost skeletal-like. His clothes were torn and very disheveled. It was strange because they looked like new clothes but I could tell that they had been badly abused in the last few days. The man was noticeably dirty and emanated a horrendous odor. Could he be homeless, I wondered, but quickly dismissed the idea, as I knew a lot about this area and I'd never seen homeless people around here. After looking him up and down, I raised my head only to realize that his gaze was locked on me. I kept looking at him to make him uncomfortable and make him look away, but it didn't happen. His huge brown eyes were still frozen, staring at me. Instinctively, I put myself against the wall of the elevator and avoided looking at him all the way. Even though it was only three floors, I felt like I was trapped in that elevator for an eternity. As soon as I reached my floor, I waited a few seconds and got off quickly as if to prevent him from following me. Far from that being his intention, he just kept looking at me while the door closed, and I breathed in peace. When I got home, the bad experience with this man was ingrained in my head. It was as if his gaze had been tattooed in my memories. I didn't want to think about it anymore, so I took a shower and went in the direction of my video games. On the way, my mom stopped me, She's not the type of person who has a problem with video games being violent or ruining my life, but she was very authoritative with the chores around the house. When it happened, she told me that I could play the games and still enjoy my summer, but first I had to go down to the grocery store to buy a few things for dinner. A little angry at having to go out again, I jumped almost from floor to floor down the stairs and went to the grocery store. There were only a few people so I was able to get back to my apartment quickly. I contemplated taking the stairs, but the bags were too heavy, and the shower had relaxed my body after the game. As I got into the elevator, 
I looked around and whew, it was empty. I took a deep breath of relief and pushed the button for the third floor. I leaned against the wall and relaxed on my way home, but the ride was abruptly interrupted on the second floor. The elevator stopped and its doors opened, but there was no one on the other side. I relaxed again and settled back into the small space. But before the doors closed, a huge figure slipped through the side of the door. It was the man with whom I had earlier shared that horrible journey. With two long, timid steps, he stood at the other end of the elevator without looking at me. Meanwhile, the doors closed again and the elevator continued on its way. Even though I was still sharing the elevator with this person, at least this time he wasn't looking at me, so I thought happily that the trip would just go by quicker. The elevator passed quickly through the second floor and I could already imagine myself inside my house. But destiny had other plans. The elevator stopped halfway, and the lights turned red. What started as a moment of confusion quickly turned to despair. And a few seconds later, when I saw my companion, despair turned to fear. The man next to me was now looking at me, but he was certainly reacting to what was happening. His body began to shake frantically, and he began to breathe heavily. <sighs> was he having a panic attack? At the time, I thought he was scared, as I was, and perhaps I had misjudged him. These thoughts were diluted when I saw his face. His eyes were wide open, his nose was huge, and he looked like he was hyperventilating. But what scared me the most was the huge smile he had. At the very moment I saw his smile, a lot of things crossed my mind. What was the man doing on the second floor if he kept going up? Why didn't he press any buttons when he got into the elevator? Both answers were obvious. The man was not going to visit anyone, nor did he live in the apartment. After a few seconds of being trapped in the elevator, the man raised his head and looked back at me, still with his smile twisted and his body trembling. At his gaze, a shiver ran through my body. I wanted to cry, to scream, to defend myself. I knew this person was going to try and hurt me, and there was no one there to stop him. Recognizing my weakness, the man lunged desperately towards me and cornered me in the corner of the elevator. He didn't need a weapon to intimidate me. His cruel smile and eyes full of anger were enough. Cornering me, the man began to breathe heavily. I could smell a putrid odor coming from his mouth, while the drool coming out of it touched my bare legs. Prepared for whatever fate this man had planned for me, I squeezed my eyes tightly shut waiting for anything to happen. Anxiety overcame me and I opened my eyes and he was right there, glued to my face. In response to me opening my eyes, the man screamed violently in my face and started scratching me wildly. As if by magic, the light came back on and the elevator continued its course. This person didn't seem to care as he continued to dig his icy, filthy fingernails all over my body while I curled up crying. Suddenly, I heard the elevator doors open and as I lost consciousness, I saw a blur as many policemen rushed at the man. Several hours later, I woke up in the hospital. I had cuts all over my body but apparently I had passed out from a nervous breakdown. Several months later, my parents told me that this man was a mentally ill man who escaped during a power outage. This man was known for killing teenagers in very violent ways, and shortly after he caught me, he confessed that he had every intention of murdering me. This man was recognized in my apartment, and they locked the elevator on purpose, not knowing that I was there with him. There were no security cameras. I never again dare to get on an elevator. Whenever I can, I take the stairs. Even though a few years later I found out this man had died, I feel that in every elevator I go, somehow, he will be there, waiting for me. During the winter of 2017, my friends and I embarked on an impromptu skiing trip. The idea was brought up randomly in conversation. 
We discussed and decided on a destination, Denver, Colorado. And in a burst of spontaneity and excitement, we booked the trip then and there. We arranged the renting of a car and an Airbnb. And a week and a half later, before the idea was even born, we all boarded an airplane and were headed to the snowy mountains of Colorado. Upon landing and picking up our rental, our lack of appropriate planning became evident. None of us had put much thought into the trip, fueled by pure excitement towards the unknown. But that exhilaration had blinded us of the situation. To put it plainly, we were extremely unprepared. In the excitement of it all, we failed to notice a brutal winter storm was approaching the vicinity of our Airbnb. We didn't plan appropriate clothes. We didn't plan and purchase snow chains for our cars. We didn't have emergency equipment for our car or ourselves. We were just a group of friends driving up the mountains when a brutal snowstorm approached. We had nothing more than a bag full of clothes and phone chargers. We trekked up a snow-covered road. Despite it having been plowed only hours before, we faced a sleek road with an inch of snow already accumulated. Every slip and skid was terrifying, but added to the adrenaline-fueled ambience in the car. I looked out the window and saw we were spiraling up a mountain. Feet away from our road were drops of hundreds of meters. Enormous valleys and canyons surrounded us. It was a mesmerizing sight. But each skid drew us closer to a drop that would result in the deaths of all of us. Damn, I whispered, my nose up against the cold window. We're really high up, guys. Hell yeah, said Andrew with false excitement, hands on the wheel. The tension in the car was palpable, but it was well hidden behind a facade of excitement. Despite all odds and our lack of preparation, we arrived to our destination. We parked our car in a recently plowed driveway. Having been pushed aside, snow had accumulated to wall-sized barriers on the side of the driveway. These walls of snow towered five meters high. We quickly ran inside and turned on the heating system of the house. It was a cozy home, small but welcoming. The decoration was rustic and cabin-like. We all huddled around the chimney and turned on the television. It was a wonderful evening filled with laughs and conversations. We all decided to retreat into our rooms early in preparation for the long upcoming day of skiing. That day never came. At approximately three in the morning, a house-shaking clamor of noise woke me. Picture frames fell from the wall. My glass of water on the nightstand tipped over. I opened my bedroom door and shouted into the dark house, What the hell was that? There was no way anyone was still asleep after that. Soon everyone's lights were on. We all discussed what could have been that explosion-like ruckus. I opened the main door and was greeted by a wall of snow. Ugh, I said. Snow started to trickle in. I quickly shut the door. Guys? Vanessa said ominously. I turned to see she had opened the curtains, only to reveal a similar wall of snow covering the windows. Looks like we're snowed in, Andrew chuckled, failing to realize the severity of the situation. We sat around the chimney the rest of the night discussing our options. Our cell phones had no reception. Things continued to worsen. At 8 in the morning, the lights began to flicker. By 10 a.m., we lost all electricity in the house. By 1 p.m., we lost all water. But it wasn't until around 9 p.m. that we truly became worried. Someone has to be looking for us, right? My friend Monica whispered, drinking from her bottle of water. You know, I said, we should really ration our water and food. Who knows how long we're going to be stuck here? Why? We're going to get rescued soon. Monica insisted, irritated. I insisted too, and we decided to ration our resources. That evening, our phone batteries died. Two days passed. Four days passed. A week passed. Two weeks passed. We remained stranded, without a single sign that help was coming. During the first week, we concluded that an avalanche might have caused this. But that led to the elephant in the room we all wanted to avoid. What if we were under hundreds of meters of snow? By the second week, we had run out of food and water. We resorted to eating snow to satiate our thirst. But that worsened another problem we had. We were all freezing to death. After two weeks of sitting in a house with no heat, we found ourselves bundled up with every article of clothing we had. 
the temperature in the room was well below freezing level. It was during our second week when I began to accept the idea that we may die in here. We were all scattered in the living room. We sat and laid in silence. The only noise emitted was our shivering. Everything ached. My chest felt heavy from weeks of unbearable cold. Our throats were raspy and dry. We barely slept. I suspected we had developed pneumonia and hypothermia. Monica coughed brutally and consistently. It was when she stopped coughing that panic began to set in. Monica? I whispered, emitted vapor from my mouth. No reply. No cough. I struggled to my feet, enduring brutal body aches. Monica was sprawled on the floor. Her eyes were closed, but her breath was labored and harsh. Guys, I said, turning to everyone else. Andrew muttered something unrecognizable. Jeremy wheezed. Felicia didn't even respond. I sat next to Monica and began to cry. I had lost all track of time. I don't know if an hour or a full day had passed. I glanced around the room and saw my party just sprawled out looking deathly. Some breathed intensely, others barely breathed at all. I myself felt lightheaded, every inch of me hurt. The room felt to be rotating slowly, and I began to sweat. I felt hot, and I realized I developed a fever. I closed my eyes. I awoke and noticed nobody had moved positions. Nothing had changed, except one thing. In the corner of the living room, a tall figure stood in the shadows. He wore a dark robe, hood over his head, and stood well over eight feet tall. I stared. This wasn't real, was it? I must just be a fever-induced vision, I told myself. I stared for hours. He didn't move. The room's only movement came from the labored breathing of Monica and Paula's chest. The room's only noise came from Monica's breathing, gasping for air like a fish out of water. Suddenly, the gasping stopped. The silence was deafening. From the corner, the figure stepped forward. His slimness was skeleton-like, and he stepped beside the lank bodies, carefully avoiding to step on anyone. He made his way towards Monica. No, I whispered. Stop! No one seemed to hear me or react to my words. I wondered if this was all a hallucination. The figure stood next to Monica and knelt down. It lifted its arm, revealing a bone-like hand with fingers of rotting flesh. He placed his hand on Monica's head. He swayed her hair out of her face and drew its head close. It laid a kiss on her forehead. I stared in silence, physically and emotionally unable to protest. The hooded skeleton rose slowly and returned to the corner. That's the last image I remember. The next time I opened my eyes, light blinded my corneas. Bright sunlight burst through the windows, and men with medical gear were carrying my friends away. This one's awake too, screamed a man kneeling near me. You're going to be okay, he whispered softly. I was lifted, placed on a stretcher, and evacuated to a hospital, where I was reunited with all of my friends, all except Monica. All of us were diagnosed with pneumonia and a variety of other illnesses. Eventually, we all made full recoveries, except for a phobia towards snow and extreme cold. I don't remember what the doctors labeled the cause of her death, but they mentioned that they'd predicted she'd been dead for days. I never told anyone of the hooded figure in the corner. I doubt anyone would believe me. But I know who that figure was. And if more time had passed, I bet I would have gotten to know him better. God, I hate business trips. But it's part of the job. This time it was South America. Our plane descended into what looked like a heavy cloud of mist. I wiggled around uncomfortably in my seat. I shoved my coworker Jack awake. Hey, we're landing. Jack and I were here on business, and it was both our first time in South America. His eyes were heavy looking out the window. Is that... <sighs> rain? It wasn't rain. It wasn't mist. In fact, it was the opposite. We were descending into a cloud of dust that stretched hundreds of miles, as far as my eyes could see. Welcome to Arricha, Chile, announced the pilot. Where the local time is... Jack and I weren't listening. Our eyes were fixated on what was outside the window. 
the plane penetrated the dust cloud, where we couldn't see more than a few feet outside the window. I couldn't help but wonder how the pilot could even land in these conditions. The plane landed safely despite my worries. We exited the plane and collected our luggage. As we set foot outside the airport, Jack and I stood in awe. Before us was a busy town. Cars zoomed by, pedestrians hurried, and families walked the streets joyously. However, a thin layer of dust fogged everything, as if a filter was being applied to our scope of vision. Everything looked foggy, and no one seemed to care. We waved a taxi down. Hey, what are a pair of Americanos doing in Aricha? Asked the taxi driver in a cheerfully and friendly tone. We're here on business, Jack said matter-of-factly. I sat in silence observing the outdoors. We drove through deserted fields of weeds and dry roots that were covered by a thin layer of dust. What might have been a luscious image of green life and vegetation at some point in the past was now a scene no different than that of a desert, where the only signs of life were occasional stumps and tumbleweed riding air currents. Has it always been this... dry? I asked. Oh no, he said in a jolly tone. You all don't know? He glanced back at me. It hasn't rained in Aricha in what? 121 weeks now. It's the longest drought in Chilean history. He continued, but my attention gravitated towards the growing desert outside. When we arrived at our hotel, we learned that the hotel didn't exist. Instead, we were greeted with the knowledge that we were staying in a dilapidated hostel down the road, where we were scheduled to have our business meeting. The hostel consisted of a lobby area and three rooms, two of which were empty. The inside was equally as battered as the outside, and everything inside was just as dusty. Our room consisted of two stiff beds, an old wooden table that seemed to be waiting for an excuse to fall apart, a non-working television, and an AC unit that rumbled wildly. We placed our luggage on the bed, causing it to creak. Just then, I noticed the caretaker of the hostel. A short old lady shining a smirk at me stood at the door. Her smile seemed to extend from ear to ear, exposing cracked yellow teeth. Her eyebrows were raised as if anticipating something. She stood there, face unmoving. Just her sight made me shiver. I raised my hand slowly and awkwardly in acknowledgement. She stared, expression unchanged for about 45 seconds, and walked away without saying a word. Jack and I unpacked and had perhaps what was the most uncomfortable night's sleep ever. The next morning, we dressed with our best attire, that had already collected dust, and walked down the street to our business meeting. Good morning, said the short balding man as he shook my hand. We stood at the entrance of his office. Good morning, nice to meet, I said shaking his hand but was interrupted mid-sentence. We are no longer interested in your services, he said shortly. He began to walk back into his office. I stood confused. Jack intervened. Sir, if we could only have a few minutes of your time... The man repeated himself sharply. We are no longer interested in your services. Goodbye. The door shut in our face. Jack and I looked at each other and shrugged. We traveled all this way for this? The sun began to set and we returned to the hostel. Well, that was a complete and total waste of time, I said to Jack, removing my tie and throwing it on our hostel bed. Let's catch an early flight tomorrow and get out of this godforsaken place. Yeah, he nodded in agreement, and we began packing our things. Just then, a knock came at the door. That same caretaker stood at the door, wearing the same smirk and elevated eyebrows. It's time, she croaked. Huh? questioned Jack. It's time, she repeated. Ma'am, I began in a rather impatient tone. We don't want... She interrupted by repeating herself again. Jack, the more patient of the two of us, decided to indulge her. All right, it's time for what? He said in a soft tone often used towards the elderly. She led him to the lobby and I continued packing. I placed my last shirt in my suitcase when chanting erupted from the lobby. Followed by Jack's screaming obscenities, my stomach tensed and I rushed to see what was causing the commotion. The worn-down room that was the lobby was now void of any furniture. Along the walls hung hundreds of small candles, flickering sporadically, illuminating seven women who stood along the perimeter of the room. Each woman wore a black cloak that reached beyond their feet. They each wore identical masks that resembled a bird's face. It had sharp slits for eyes and a protruding beak. 
Long, colorful feathers stood on the back of their heads. They chanted in unison. Jack stood at the center of the empty room, seven pairs of eyes on him. Good, you're here, said the caretaker, pushing me to the center of the room. As I joined Jack, the seven-masked woman spread evenly around the room, covering all exits and room entrances. For three hundred years, began the caretaker in a thundering voice. Shuck, god of rain, has blessed our beautiful village. And for over three hundred years, our village has flourished and thrived. The chanting by the other six-masked women intensified. They stood motionless, though their shadows swayed as the candles flickered. But sadly, my people have angered Shuck. We have lost our way and the god of rain has turned his back on us. Her head hung low in disappointment. But the legends are clear. To regain the grace of Shaq and bring life to our village again, the god requests blood. This drought must end now. Jack looked at me. He was sweating profusely. Look, ladies, you have the wrong guys here. We just want to get home. So if you could just excuse us, began Jack walking toward the exit. As he approached the exit, one of the masked women broke her stillness, summoned a knife from within her robe, and plunged it deep into Jack's upper thigh. He howled in pain, dropping to the ground. Blood began to pour around his body, mixing the layer of dust on the ground, creating a thick and viscous substance. I ran toward him, but three of the masked bodies jumped forward, obstructing my path. You mustn't help him said the leader monotonously. He has been chosen by Shaq. And now you must end it, she said flatly. She approached me and presented a large ceremonial dagger. The leather handle was engraved with symbols I couldn't recognize. Now you must end it, she repeated. The bodies that stood between Jack and me cleared. Jack was laying on the ground, dagger deep in his thigh. The pool of blood had grown into an ocean. He was pale and struggled to keep his eyes open. I stood incapable of comprehending what had occurred in the last few minutes. The candles continued to flicker widely. A stabbing pain in my own arm grounded me back to reality. One of the seven had stabbed my arm. Though softly, as if to nudge me forward, I stepped closer to Jack. I... I can't, I repeated inaudibly. An excruciating pain erupted in my arm. One of the seven had plunged a knife deep into my shoulder now. You must. By then, Jack was unconscious. I told myself he was dead from blood loss, but I know that was a lie that I used to convince myself. The seven tightened the perimeter, forcing me closer to Jack. They now each threatened with a knife in my direction. They were now inches away from my body. The seven deadly weapons reflected the candlelight and threatened my life. I picked up the ceremonial dagger. I did what I needed to do. The next few hours were a blur. Vague and foggy images remain in my mind of the seven dragging Jack's body away. What they did with it, I don't know, and I don't want to know. I grabbed my backpack, leaving behind my luggage, and began mindlessly walking to the airport. As I left the hostel, the chanting intensified. I walked and walked for hours on the dusty road. I don't remember arriving to the airport. I don't remember boarding the plane. The one thing I do remember is looking out the airplane window as we departed and seeing flashes of lightning throughout the dark rain clouds that gathered over Aricha. Hi, my name's Carter. It's my birthday today. I know this is a very special day, but I'm remembering a horrible time in my life. On this same day, my birthday, a horrible incident took place in the year of 1997. My three friends, Natasha, Jonas, and Tina, were with me. We were all going to our friend Samantha's home. Samantha was our new friend. We met her at an event in England. She was a nice and sweet girl, and she became our close friend really quickly. So one day, Samantha came and told us and invited us to her father's birthday, Mr. Garman. We were happy for her father, and we all at once got ready for her father's birthday. She had come with a large and beautiful car. We all sat in the car and left for the house together. After covering about 10 minutes, we all noticed that Samantha suddenly drove the car in the opposite direction of the location. We all started wondering, so we asked her about it. We had organized a party there, in another location. Hearing these words from her mouth, we all sat calm. 
When we reached the location, we were totally shocked because that place was nothing but an abandoned hostel. Natasha said, Hey Samantha, is this the place where you have organized the party? But this place is looking very strange. Samantha got angry and said, Shut up! This place is very close to me. You know nothing, Natasha. After saying that, she kind of started to act normal. Samantha said that her family was very unique and they always used to plan for some adventurous tasks. That's why she had decided to celebrate her father's birthday in this abandoned hostel. Natasha and I were skeptical about Samantha's behavior, but we ignored it. We didn't really want to spoil the celebration. So when we got there, Samantha took us inside the hostel. We all noticed a very weird and creepy environment there. We saw everything was lying here, there, everywhere, cracked walls and ruined old rooms. Suddenly, we heard a voice. Dum, dum. We turned back and saw the main door had been completely locked. Everyone started screaming for help. And while this happened, we noticed Samantha was not there. I said, Samantha, are you here? Somebody open this door. Stop playing with us. And suddenly, we all smelt a weird gas and all fainted at once. I knew someone let out that gas intentionally. When I woke up, I found myself in a dark room. Later, I came to know that I was trapped completely in that room. I was terrified and wondering what would happen next. I could literally have died from anxiety at that time. After a few seconds, I heard instructions from a microphone, and I came to know that someone was monitoring me the whole time. The man's voice on the mic said that the room is going to be filled with water in 10 minutes, and I had to accomplish a certain task in that given time. At first, I thought it was just a game, but I later realized this was all planned. That voice came again. You have only 10 minutes to get out of this room, or else you will drown here and die. There's a table on your left side. On the table there is a box. This box is made specially for you. Go and open it and get your door keys. Suddenly, the room started filling slowly with water. When I reached the box, I remembered what he had said to me. I was sure that the box though was not a normal box. That's why I carefully inserted my hand into the box. When I did, I got a very strong electric shock. I was terrified and didn't even have a second to decide anything that time. My feet were starting to sink. I forcefully entered my hand and suffered the painful electric shock for one whole minute. Zzz, zzz, zzz. Never have I felt anything like this. I was screaming in pain. Even thinking about it and remembering that horrible day, I still feel the pain. I was confused, but I only had a few minutes left. By the grace of God, I got the key and escaped from the room. When I got out, I found Tina in the next room. I was in for another shock. Oh my god! I saw that Tina's head was separated from her body. It seemed like someone had brutally slit her throat just a few minutes before. There was blood and sharp old blooded tools everywhere. I was very horrified and frightened. Just seeing that painful scene, I started vomiting and felt dizzy. I'd never seen anything like that in my life except in the movies. Next I started looking for Natasha and Jonas. Suddenly. I heard Natasha's screaming voice which was coming from another room. I slowly went into the room to help her. I saw a man who was wearing a weird pig face mask. He was about to put a hot rod in Natasha's eyes. I at once picked up a sharp knife from the table and stabbed him on the back. Ah, I'll cut you! The masked man screamed. Even though I stabbed him, the masked man didn't stop. He was trying to harm us even though he was injured. I struggled hard to snatch the rod, but he was very strong. I was lucky that day. As soon as I got the chance, I pushed him into the walls with great force. I inserted that iron rod in his stomach and pushed the rod several times until he died. We ran away from that room and started looking for Jonas. We couldn't find him anywhere. Wandering here and there for what seemed like a long time, both Natasha and I reached a room where we noticed a lot of newspaper cutting and magazines. Natasha saw her father's picture there. She was shocked. Who was that? Who had been collecting these articles? When we explored that room, we found more articles. We found a newspaper in which three people's pictures were printed. They were Natasha's dad, Tina's dad, and Jonas's dad. Somebody had crossed their faces with red marker in the printed picture. And the room wall was totally ruined with several marks and names. Everywhere, we could see the words written, 
revenge, and mom. Natasha noticed a hidden newspaper cutting below a table. When we read it, we were totally shocked. According to that article, those three people, Natasha's dad, Tina's dad, and Jonas's dad, were those persons who had revealed the secret of Mr. Garmin, Samantha's father. Obviously, Mr. Garmin was a very bad man. He used to sell the body of organs of kids. Natasha, Jonas, and Tina's father had revealed his face in front of the whole media. Samantha was only 12 years old at the time, and she loved her mother so much. But her mother hung herself with rope due to defamation and pure guilt. When all that happened, Samantha had decided that she would harm their family too. We heard someone's footsteps, and it was Jonas. He was badly injured. We at once informed the police. As we were moving out, we saw the pig-faced mask person came again, and he removed his mask. And then Samantha also came out from a door with a big knife in her hand. Both were looking psycho. They intended to kill us and were laughing evilly. That man was Mr. Garmin. Suddenly, Samantha threw the knife at Jonas, hitting his chest. He fell down and died. We both ran as fast as we could and locked in a room. Both daughter and father were banging on the door. Somehow they broke down the door. They were about to attack and kill us, but then the police showed up, and shots rang out. They arrested them for Tina and Jonas's murder. We left, thank God, and we will forever mourn the loss of our two friends. I wasted four years of my life in college getting a degree in art history. When I was done, I had nothing but a stupid piece of paper and a lot of bills to pay. I had been looking for a job for the past two years, but everything I tried to do just kept failing. I eventually got a job at the local supermarket, but with the measly pay, I was basically living from paycheck to paycheck. It didn't take long before I raked up a huge credit card debt, and I knew I had to do something fast to get myself out of the situation. I remembered my college days and I recalled a few of my friends who had dropped out because they had all found a very lucrative side hustle. They tried to hide it, but I knew they had all become cam girls. I frowned on it at the time, but being in my current situation, I was willing to consider anything. I began to do some research on how to get into it, but the deeper I dug, the more I realized why I was so against it at the time. I knew I wasn't comfortable bearing it all on the internet to some random strangers, and no matter how much I tried, I knew my body wouldn't let me do it. I was about to give up when I came across something. It was a strange mini ad that read, are you a cam girl looking for good pay? Then sign up to Dripping Red Fantasies, where you can make and decide your own rules. The goth girl that was displayed in the ad was more or less fully clothed. And that grabbed my attention, and I was looking for something where I wouldn't have to expose that much skin. I tried to click the link, but my browser popped up with a message that read, This browser is unable to access the link. Try the Tor browser instead. Seeing the words Tor browser instantly made me remember a conversation I had in college about the dark web. I knew that the browser gave you access to the dark web, and I also knew that nothing good came from it. The numerous horrific stories spoke for themselves, and everything in my body screamed at me not to do it. But my resolve was steeled, as I knew that if there was a chance that this link could be what I was looking for, I would stop at nothing to get it. So I installed the Tor browser and clicked on the link. I was taken to a website called Dripping Red Fantasies, and I was presented with a lot of odd videos. I played one of them, and I watched a girl who again was more or less fully clothed get out a needle, she pierced her skin, and I watched her blood trickle down her body. This repeated several times, and I noticed that she wasn't piercing any vital places. When the video was done, I tried to play the second one, but I was asked to pay $200 to view it. As I kept browsing through the website, I realized that the other videos were more or less similar as they all involved blood. I saw another one where a girl drenched herself in a gallon of fake blood while she talked in a flirtatious way to the audience. I became perplexed as I tried to wrap my head around what I had just seen. The supposed chem girls I saw in the videos weren't doing anything that sexual as they didn't reveal anything to their audience. It took me a while, but I eventually figured it out. I remembered a while back when I read something about a sexual fetish called hemotilinia, widely known as blood play. It was basically a blood fetish, as people who had it became aroused by the smell, sight, and texture of blood. Knowing this, I finally understood what I had seen 
and why the website was called Dripping Red Fantasies. I had a huge smile on my face as I realized that this was exactly what I was looking for. It was perfect because I didn't have to reveal everything, as the major thing the viewers needed to see was blood, and I wasn't scared of needles or drawing a little blood. I went to sleep that night with a smile on my face as I told myself I found the answer to my problems. The next day, I immediately signed up for the Dripping Red Fantasies website. It didn't take long before I grew a following, and the money I got from the videos was great. I eventually stopped coming to work, which led the manager of the local supermarket, an elderly man called Gabriel Owen, to check up on me. I ignored his constant calls and visits, as even though I knew he meant well, all that I wanted to do was to focus on making more videos and getting more money. Things went great with the website for a while, till one fateful afternoon. I decided to go live on the website to take requests, as my viewers paid instant money for me to do what they wanted. I would get requests like, pierce your finger and smear the blood on your lips, or cut your thighs and let the blood drip down your beautiful legs. I had been doing it for a while now, but seeing the requests still wasn't normal for me. But even then, I did it with no hesitation, as these men dropped $600 to $700 per request. While I kept on taking requests, I was calm because I knew they'd follow the guidelines I put on my bio as I outlined everything I was comfortable with doing and how far I was willing to go. I continued the live session for a while till I was tired, so I asked. Any last requests? No one responded, so I guessed they were all satisfied too. I was about to leave the live session when someone called Bloody Mark said, gut yourself. I was shocked at the request as it was extremely shady and very unlike my normal viewers. So I calmly said, I'm sorry, Bloody Mark, but I can't do that. That's going a bit too far. You can check another channel. It's very unlikely, but maybe you'd find a girl who'd do it for you. When Bloody Mark paid 15 grand for the request, before I could say anything, he continued with, Come on, baby. I just gave you the best payment of your life. I'm sure you haven't seen money like that before. So come on, gut yourself for me. It'll be fine, trust me. I just want to see you struggle as you wallow in your blood. I knew I had encountered a psychopath, as the man called Bloody Mark was clearly delusional. So I firmly told him, As I said, I can't do that. Get off my channel. His tone then instantly changed as he said, Okay, bitch. I didn't think you'd chicken out after all that money, but I guess you're just a dumb whore. Send me back my cash so I'd find a more competent woman to do it. He began to give me his details so that I could wire the funds back to him, but I knew what he said was true. I wasn't going to see money like that anytime soon, and I also didn't want to fulfill his sick fantasy. I found myself on a blocked road, and I still really didn't want to lose the money, so my body acted without thinking as I ended the live video before I could give him his cash. I had never done it before, but I assumed that he couldn't do anything to me as he didn't know anything about me or where I lived. I also thought to myself that with the huge amount of cash he gave me, I didn't have to keep being a cam girl on the dripping red fantasies. So I deleted my account and I went to bed that night thinking of the endless possibilities I could do with the money. I don't know why, but I didn't feel guilty that I stole 15 grand from that bloody mark as I told myself that he was a messed up person who deserved it. And if he could drop that amount of money on a random cam girl, he probably had a lot of it. A few days went by and nothing really happened. I had almost forgotten about the whole ordeal till one fateful day. It was on a Tuesday and I had just come back from grocery shopping. As I was putting things away in the fridge, I felt strong hands grip my neck and mouth. Within seconds, I was violently thrown to the floor. I looked over me in terror to see a huge man looming over me. He had a sick grin plastered on his face as he said, I finally found you, you stupid bitch. I froze in fear as I knew exactly who the voice belonged to. B bloody Mark? I stuttered. The man then said, Guess you are not as dumb as you look. I was paralyzed with fear as I wondered how he found me. I watched him take out a jagged knife from his pocket as he began to get closer. Out of fear for my life, I said the first thing that came to my mind as I stuttered the words, 
I'm sorry for what I did. I still have your money. I haven't used much of it, so please put the knife away and we could talk about this like adults. He laughed and responded with, Adults? You're nothing but a useless thief. You denied my request and then stole from me. I'm sure you thought you'd get away with it, but no one gets away from Bloody Mark. As my heart raced, I began to stutter. Please, please, I have your money. I'm sorry for stealing from you. I'd give it back. That's when he said, seeing as you took it by force, that money is yours now. I'm not here for that. I'm here to get my money's worth as my last request wasn't fulfilled. So, I decided to come and fulfill it by force. I then watched in horror as he drove the knife into me. I instantly felt the blade inside of me as immeasurable pain began to ripple through my body. As my blood spilled out, I watched him dip his hands into the small pool of blood like an ecstatic toddler and rub the blood over his face. The scene was morbid as I watched him get more and more excited. He began to touch himself while he watched me die. As I laid there bleeding out, I tried to scream, but I knew it was hopeless as no one was near enough to hear me. The world around me became dark as I thought this was it for me. Nothing but regret filled me as I told myself that if I had just kept my normal job and been content, none of this would have happened. I had become obsessed with the thrill of making that much money and it turned me into a thief and now I was paying the price for that. My eyes began to close when I heard a loud thunk sound. I saw Bloody Mark fall to the floor with a gash on his head as I heard a voice say, Sally, are you alright? But before I could make out the face, I blacked out. I woke up in the hospital surrounded by my family. The cops shortly entered my room and asked me questions and I told them everything that happened. When the questioning was over, I remember asking who saved my life, and I was told it was my former boss, Gabriel Owen, who had called the police. The police officer told me, he said he was going to check on you as he normally did, and upon seeing the scene, he reacted quickly as he struck your assailant and saved your life. After hearing that, I felt my eyes tear up as I began to cry my heart out. It's been two years since this incident. The man called Bloody Mark, whose real name was Mark Jones, was imprisoned for attempted murder. I was also charged with grand theft, as I did steal a large sum of money. The funds were seized, and my lawyer managed to keep the sentence to one year of community service by convincing the jury to take in consideration that I was attacked and almost killed. He also told them that I was completely willing to give back the stolen funds. When I was done with my service, I went back to my former job at the local supermarket to work with a man who saved my life. My parents began to support me so that I wouldn't have to do anything like that again. Even though I wasn't getting as much money as before, I was content because I realized that like everyone else, I was once obsessed with getting fast money and I let it consume me and ruin my life. But now I've learned to take things slow and cherish the better things in life as I experienced firsthand why many people say money is the root of all evil. If you're enjoying this content, make sure you like and subscribe.